When the night fell, we once again sat down in a circle to hear the wonderful stories being told by my grandmother. That night, my grandma told us a scary story of a sea monster that loved to eat children. Needless to say, all of us were terrified yet curious at the same time. We asked her about its appearance, what the monster looked like, was it long or short, or did it have many sharp teeth? Seeing us speaking chaotically, my grandmother told us to stay quiet and stop interrupting her mid-sentence, or else she would not tell us the story. We then told her that we would remain silent and not ask anything. Under the dim light, Grandma started narrating the story. It had happened 20 years ago, back in the day when misogyny was still a thing as people had strong prejudice towards women. Out of curiosity, I asked my grandmother what misogyny was. She explained that it was the hatred for women or girls, as people had a tendency to respect men while disdaining women. My grandma raised a needle to my face, saying that she would sew my mouth up if I continued to interrupt her, then moved on with her story. That day Mr. Kang's daughter-in-law had just given birth to a baby, however he wasn't happy with it as he looked worried. The man had been thinking a lot as his son and daughter-in-law were still struggling to have a baby after 10 years and the fact that it was a baby girl made him feel truly upset. Thinking about the neighbors laughing at this new family when they found out about his new grandchild, the man felt even more disappointed. But anyway, he had to go check on his newborn grandchild. Having mixed feelings, Mr. Kang blankly gazed at the baby lying neatly in the arms of his son Ken, but the look on his face started changing as he smiled cheerfully. Turned out it was the adorableness of the baby that put a smile on him. Even though she was crying, yet she still looked as beautiful as an angel. Ever since that moment, Mr. Kang had a sudden change in his thoughts. He was no longer bothered about his grandchild being a boy or a girl. As he carried the baby in his arms, his eyes were filled with happiness as he named her Tani. As time went by, the baby had now become a little girl who was able to run and sing. One afternoon, as Mr. Kang was taking a stroll with his granddaughter, he bumped into an old friend of his who was also being with his grandchild. The man instantly bragged about his grandson as soon as he saw Mr. Kang. He later made some rude remarks about Tani. Is this little girl your granddaughter? <laughs> she looks lovely, but such a shame that she's not a boy. <laughs> Mr. Kang was extremely annoyed by those ironic words from his friend. It wasn't the first time for Mr. Kang to deal with such unkind words as he constantly heard people in the village saying bad things about his family. As Mr. Kang took his grandchild to go fishing, they encountered a group of people who were terribly rude to them. If I were Mr. Kang, I would definitely strangle that little girl to death, right the moment she was born, since I couldn't stand being humiliated. <laughs> the guy then bursted out laughing. Everyone knew that he was just making a joke, yet it made one feel extremely uncomfortable to hear it. Of course, Mr. Kang didn't care about those nasty words as the two kept going to the fishing spot. However, as the night had already fallen yet the two hadn't returned, Mr. Kang's wife and son hurriedly went to the riverbank searching for them. But there was just a hook, an empty bucket and a fish spotted at the scene, while Mr. Kang and Tani were nowhere to be seen. The two called out their names loudly but received no reply. A while later the couple saw a figure appearing in the middle of the river. It seemed like Ken's mom had figured out who it was. She immediately panicked. Ken quickly ran to the spot as he got closer. He gradually understood what was happening. Turned out that the one in the river was Mr. Kang. Ken and his mother quickly asked him about Tani. But Mr. Kang just remained silent to their question as he lifelessly looked at them then slowly dived into the water. Feeling worried, Ken told his mom that he would jump into the river and save his dad or else Mr. Kang would die from exhaustion. Ken quickly swam to his father. 
as the two finally swam ashore, he asked his dad what had happened. Filled with horror, Mr. Kang breathed shallowly as he told his son that Tanya had been caught by a sea monster. Ken's face instantly changed color. Shortly after that, Mr. Kang's wife asked the villagers to help them find Tani, but their efforts were in vain. Many of the villagers believed that Mr. Kang had brutally killed Tani due to his strong dislike for her, but the family members refused to go with it. However, they still wanted to find out the truth. Mr. Kang stayed quiet for a while, then recounted the tragic incident to them. He and Tani were fishing at the riverbank. As Mr. Kang had been sitting for a long stretch of time, his legs were all numb and tingled. He got up, intending to walk around for a little. Of course, the man didn't forget to caution his granddaughter not to go into the water. Then he turned around and performed some exercises to relax his body. All of a sudden, a loud noise from behind startled him instantly. As he turned around, he saw the water surface slowly rose as it gradually formed the huge mouth in the middle. As Mr. Kang was still in bewilderment, he immediately got shocked to see his grandchild Tani being swallowed into the river. The man screamed loudly, but it was too late. Without hesitation, Mr. Kang quickly jumped into the water looking for his grandchild in panic. He desperately searched for her, but his efforts were in vain. The disappearance of Tani made him feel extremely guilty as he believed it was entirely his fault for not protecting her. The man also added that the sea monster had returned as it went to the river through an estuary. Being struck with grief, Mr. Kang's hair turned grey quickly. It's not to say that he had to come under bitter criticism from the villagers as they believed he was the one that killed the little girl. As time went by, one day, his eyes suddenly alighted a ray of hope. Unexpectedly, Mr. Kang got out of his house, something that he hadn't been doing for days. He even bought a coil of rope and some iron bars. As the man returned, he instantly went to the warehouse and locked the door tightly. From inside the warehouse, noises of materials clanging on the sound of hands sawing were audibly heard. His wife was really worried about him as she brought meals to her husband daily, yet the man didn't eat even just a bit. Every afternoon she stood by the warehouse door crying, yet Mr. Kang never came out to see her. It was until the fourth day that the door was finally opened. Mr. Kang slowly walked out of the warehouse. Shortly after that he assured everyone that he would go to the river and catch the sea monster at all costs. It turned out that for the last few days, the man had been making a big hook in order to take his revenge on the monster that killed his beloved granddaughter. His wife instantly stopped him as it was too dangerous. But no matter how hard she tried to do it, Mr. Kang still ignored her and stick to his plan as he had nothing to lose now. The man went to a pig pen. He caught the fattest pig in the pigsty, grabbed it by the head and held his knife near the animal's neck intending to kill it. He was acting like a madman. His wife collapsed on the ground as she saw blood spilling everywhere while witnessing the violent behavior of her husband. After Mr. Kang slaughtered the pig, he continued to go to the riverbank. Everyone was freaked out. Their faces turned pale as soon as they saw him. It must be the aggressive look on his face that terrified them. Also, the bloody pig head, which was pierced with a hook that he was holding, made them filled with horror. Out of curiosity, the villagers followed him to the river as they wanted to know what he was up to. They quickly gathered at the place, talking loudly. Mr. Kang planted a large pole deep into the ground. He wrapped it with a rope, then tossed a hook and the pig head away. The pig head being thrown into the river made the water splash as soon as it touched the surface. In the jostling crowds of inquisitive individuals, some said Mr. Kang had gone crazy as they didn't believe in the existence of a sea monster in the village. But the man wasn't discouraged by it as he grabbed the fishing line firmly, waiting for the monster to come out. One, two, and then three hours had passed yet nothing happened. People started leaving as they assured themselves Mr. Kang had gone insane. Mr. Kang still patiently waited for the monster. 
His eyes started to get heavy, then slowly drifted into sleep. But the man couldn't even sleep peacefully as he saw the face of his granddaughter in his dream. Tani was like a little angel with her plump angelic face. The little girl walked closer to her grandfather as she put her tiny hands on Mr. Kang's face, trying to awaken him just like she usually did when he fell asleep during fishing. Mr. Kang quickly got up as he heard Tani calling him. Right that moment the fishing line suddenly became tight as if something had been caught on the hook. In the river waves were seen slowly forming as the water flowed ceaselessly. Knowing the prey had been captured, the old man hurriedly retrieved the fishing line as he felt something moving strongly in the water. The string rubbed against his fingers causing them to bleed. He tried to lean backwards whilst using his weight to pull the thing out of the river. A painful expression was clearly shown on his face as he frowned and grinded his teeth, yet he still clung onto the string. Realizing how useless it would be if he only used his hands, the man tried to place the fishing line on his shoulder. The great force caused the string to get tightened and cut his shoulder as blood dripped out of his wound. The monster was indeed powerful as it floundered him with just a single movement. Mr. Kang quickly clung to the wooden pole he had prepared before. But the man himself couldn't fight back the monster on his own. He started trembling with pain as the cut on his shoulder became deeper. In the water the sea monster was moving its tail violently. But his sheer willpower didn't allow him to give up easily as he continued to fight the monster for the whole night and collapsed later in the morning. At that moment there were some people walking by. They were in utter shock to see Mr. Kang being badly injured. Both his hands and his shoulder were covered with blood, his face contorted with pain, yet he was still holding the string. Seeing something bizarre in the water, the two men tried pulling the fish line and instantly felt its tightness. They quickly called the other villagers for help. Indeed, there was something really heavy under the water. Unexpectedly, the thing that Mr. Kang was fighting all night long was a huge fish. The size of its head was even bigger than that of a car. It was at this moment the villagers firmly believed that a monster had taken shelter in their village. As they pulled the monster out of the river, the villagers removed its guts. How terrifying it was, inside the guts was a human skeleton which was believed to be of Tani. My grandma sighed deeply as it was the most haunting part of the story to her, which upset her every time she recounted it. My younger sister was also unhappy with the ending as Tani had died so pitifully. She asked my grandma if Tani was the same age as her. My grandma smiled as she heard the question from my sister. She nodded her head while saying that Tani was a wonderful little girl, yet had to die such a tragic death. My younger brother said the villagers were just evil, but my sister said it was also evil of the sea monster to kill the girl. I then told the two that the villagers were just as bad as the monster. The three of us had a quarrel over who was the most evil of them all. We kept arguing until our grandmother told us to go to bed as story time was over. We couldn't even close our eyes as we kept thinking about the tragic story. I asked grandma if there was any giant fish in the lake behind our house, but the reply to my questions was her loud snores. The Witch Reborn I remember one day last year I had a few drinks with a close friend of mine. Hey! As I was going through the menu, I saw a guy approaching me from afar. As we sat down drinking for merely five minutes, Iris had already drunken up a bottle of beer. It turned out that the guy had just broken up with his girlfriend. Iris didn't utter a single word as he kept drinking and drinking. I didn't know what to do but gently put my hand on his shoulder and comfort him. The guy had a distant look in his face. As he sighed deeply, he started telling me something that had confused him lately. 
Iris and his girlfriend shared the same interest for horror movies. After getting to know each other, the two decided to begin a relationship. The girlfriend, despite having a keen interest in scary films, always pretended to be scared as she screamed and fell into Iris' arms. The sweetness in her eyes completely hypnotized him. On the two's one-year dating anniversary, the girlfriend got a pair of tickets to a haunted house in a theme park. That day, despite being early for the hair-raising experience, they still had to wait in a long queue. Under the freezing weather, Iris felt a bit uncomfortable and discouraged. He told his girlfriend to come back later someday, but the girl insisted on staying as she wheedled Iris. The two continued to wait for their turn to get inside the haunted house in the cold weather. Their turn had finally come as they walked hand in hand into the scary place. Indeed, this haunted castle could easily make one's skin crawl the moment they stepped in. As the two walked upstairs, they saw a picture of a ghostly bride who had a bony skull, yet it didn't terrify Iris at all as he found it pretty hilarious. The first room they got in was filled with scary disfigured dolls. At times, there were chuckles of children to be heard in the room. The doll suddenly stuck out its long tongue, but for Iris and his girlfriend, that wasn't enough to make them scared. The two then turned their gaze at a glass display filled with creepy looking items inside, which amused the girl instantly. She expressed her amazement as she saw a doll with hollow eyes being hung from a tree which confused Iris as he wasn't amazed by it at all. At that moment, Iris suddenly wanted to play a prank on his girlfriend. He told her to gaze at the doll as it would show her something special. The girlfriend listened to him as she fixed her eyes on the freaky doll. Seeing his girlfriend fiercely concentrating on the object, Iris quietly came from behind and then scared her, which made the girl scream out in fear. As she trembled, she turned around and saw Iris behind her. Her eyes blazed with horror and anger as she knew she was being teased. The girl immediately hit Iris in the chest while upbraiding him. She chased after Iris as he ran away, laughing while thinking of pulling another prank on her. Iris ran to a room nearby. The guy quickly hid in a corner, preparing to scare his girlfriend again. But the girl was nowhere to be seen as he kept waiting for her. Now Iris started feeling worried. Iris went outside, gazing at the dark hallway in front of him. There wasn't anyone in sight. Iris started feeling panic. He hurriedly looked for his girlfriend. As the man was extremely anxious, he came across a room with a wooden door being slightly opened. Iris twisted the doorknob. He had a hunch that his girlfriend was hiding in the room. No sooner had Iris opened the door than he called out the girl's name. Strangely, there was no one there. There was merely a wooden coffin which was covered with a thin veil placed in the room. Burning candles were also seen on top of the coffin. Iris gently pulled the veil aside. He saw a wooden doll inside as it gave him a familiar feeling when he looked at it. All of a sudden, Iris felt like there was someone in the room watching him. As Iris looked away, the doll suddenly got up as it made some mechanically eerie sounds. The doll's action didn't startle him, but its voice was so familiar to him that it made him turn around immediately. Iris was horrified to see that the doll now was replaced by his girlfriend. The girl started saying something as the two sharp fangs slowly sticked out of the corners of her mouth. Iris was terrified. He rubbed his eyes constantly, but the horrifying scene didn't disappear as it became even more visible. Despite being scared, Iris still plucked up his courage and went to the girl, checking up on her. Unexpectedly, the girl opened her mouth wide, revealing many sharp teeth which looked creepy. Iris was startled to death. He panicked as he pushed the girl away. How bizarre it was before his eyes now it was just an inanimate wooden doll. Feeling fearful, the man leaned against the wall as he regained his composure. He reassured himself that perhaps it was just him having a hallucination. 
A few seconds later, as Iris finally became stable, he intended to get out of the place and ask for help. Irish rushed to the door, never in his life had he endured this much of fear and anxiety. Fortunately, there was an alarm bell next to the door. Iris pressed it to inform the staff to arrive. One of them quickly came to Iris as he reassured him to stay calm whilst waiting for the ancillary staff. As the bell stopped ringing, Iris sighed deeply, looking around as he saw a familiar figure slowly approaching him. It was his girlfriend. Needless to say, the man was thrilled as he called her name loudly. But the thing behind the glass door had changed. Iris's girlfriend had disappeared instead. There was only a scary female ghost with her long hair. The man rushed outside in fear as he shut the door firmly. The unmoving look on his face when he first came into the haunted house had faded away. Iris had his eyes closed tightly for a while, then he slowly opened them. In the next room, the girlfriend reappeared. A female voice called out from behind Iris. He turned around and saw his girlfriend standing next to the coffin. Even though Iris was filled with fear, he still ran to his girlfriend without hesitation. However, the girlfriend walked away while Iris was chasing after her down the hallway. Then they moved to another room. As Iris had just made it to the room, he was stopped by two creepy dolls. Hence losing track of his girlfriend, inside the room a cross was seen with a dress hanging from it. The fearful expression was clearly shown on his face. It was the dress of his girlfriend, one that she usually wore. How did it get here? At that moment, someone quietly put their hand on Iris's shoulder. Iris was startled, yet didn't dare to turn and look who that was. Shortly after, a voice of a young man was heard. Sir, are you the one that called the ancillary team for assistance? Iris breathed a sigh of relief. He turned to see the man and inform him about the disappearance of his girlfriend. The male staff told Iris that his girlfriend had left the place earlier. Afterwards, the guy accompanied Iris to the exit way. Indeed, as Iris got outside, he saw his girlfriend waiting for him at the gate. The man quickly ran to his girlfriend. He grabbed her hands and then apologized. Yet the girl didn't say a word. She withdrew her hands from his, then broke up with him to the man's amazement. Iris quickly hugged the girl as he begged her to listen to him explaining. But it didn't make her feel less angry as she pushed him away and told him to get away from her. The girl then turned around and walked away, leaving Iris behind. Of course, Iris wouldn't let his girlfriend stay mad at him like that. He chased after the girl and stopped her. But he was startled to see the face of his girlfriend now being replaced with that of a doll, which was covered with cracks, looking terrifying. Iris was frozen, his face turned pale. He speechlessly looked at the girl walk past him as if they were two strangers. As soon as he returned home, Iris made phone calls to her but it didn't help him at all. Knowing it was useless for him to talk to her on the phone, Iris went to the apartment at which the girl stayed, in the hope of changing her mind. That day the girl wore a lot of makeup which was quite out of character. As Iris went to see his ex-girlfriend, he saw her hand in hand with another man, looking happy. Not only that, the girl even gave the man a passionate kiss when they were at the alley, which left Iris heartbroken. In the dim light, Iris once again saw the creepy face of the doll he saw in the haunted castle. Iris had thought about it for a while. He wondered if it was the ghosts disguised as a doll. If they had taken control of his girlfriend's body and made her act like that. Later, Iris went to the girl's workplace, asking the workers about her, but they told him that she had resigned from her job and went somewhere else. Iris cried a lot as he recounted the story to me. I didn't know if it was the breakup or the awful experience he had at the haunted house that caused him to be like that. Only until later did we find out. 
that the haunted castle had disappeared as no one knew about its current location. Lately, Iris came across a picture of his ex-girlfriend on Facebook. The girl had begun a relationship with another man, yet he looked like a dead body. Iris wondered if he should send her a message, but eventually he chose to give up on her and move on with his life. The story happened with a small family living in a rural area consisting of Mr. Hasu and Miss Ruri and their seven-year-old daughter named Na. The whole family always wanted to have a son to show off their faces to people in the village. Fortunately, this year as Ruri already had an ultrasound of his son, she happily showed it off to her neighbors. Ruri satisfyingly touched her belly and told a neighbor that day by day she was even more excited and looking forward to the baby. Her neighbor offered a suggestion that she should be ready for anything, besides she had to consult a fortune teller too to wait for the good day and hold a ceremony to get her son's name. Ruri replied that only the family of her husband was superstitious but she absolutely did not put much faith in divination. The neighbors still had the opinion that they had to abstain from giving all kinds of things for this child because the couple was having a hard time having a son in the first place. At that time, Na was playing nearby, so when listening to her neighbor's opinion, Ruri dragged her away to make conversation. The neighbors were surprised and asked, Why did you do that? Ruri said sadly that she was afraid to talk about the importance of her brother and this made her feel somewhat sad about now. Finally, the day of delivery had arrived and Hasu's family eagerly awaited birth and eventually, finally, Hasu held the baby son in his arms. However, the warm atmosphere was immediately extinguished when Hasu shouted loudly at his daughter because she wanted to hold her brother. Arriving home, things started getting more difficult the newly born son was sick with a strange disease. He kept groaning without eating or drinking. The couple were very worried. Ruri was anxious, especially when she saw the child's face deteriorating. Hasu hurried looked at his son and told his wife, It is not good, my dear. If he continues to quit feeding like that, he will be malnourished. The couple hurriedly took their child to the hospital. Even though the doctor advised him that the family could be reassured and that the child had a common cold, Hasu argued that things were much more serious in his opinion. Since his son was sick, Hasu stayed awake for a few days and the son cost a fortune to him. He wouldn't let anything happen to his son. Hasu's mother was a feudal woman with strong feudal thoughts and discussed the possibility about asking a shaman to take a look at the child with her son. She wasn't sure what was happening and she might have some thoughts that this problem could be possibly related to demons. Hasu thought for a while and understood that what his mother said was correct. The mother went to find the famous magician and invited him to their home. She brought him in to meet Hasu. Hasu politely greeted him, politely explained the situation of the newborn child. Then he went back inside the house and called out loudly, Mother of children, hurry up and bring our son here. Ruri slowly brought out the baby. His health was very weak at that moment. The shaman asked if the father had done anything unusual before the birth of his son. Hasu assured that he was a very gentle person and had never done any bad things. The Magus looked at the child for a long time and then said that the child had a curse of death and it would be hard to save his life. The shaman went on to explain that the family had been cursed to have only one child so that when the couple tried to have more than one child the consequences would be dreadful. The grandmother gasped in surprise and believed in the shaman's words as she kept asking if there was a way to break the curse and save her unique grandson. The shaman sighed and said there was still a way, but they'd better forget it. 
The shaman glanced around and then said, just having one child in the family is enough. The words of the shaman were similar to the sound of lightning crashing on an eardrum. So in order to save the newly born, the only choice the family had was to throw away their first born. The mother was crying, hugging her daughter without letting go. She insisted that they should not believe the words of the magician. Hasu saw that his wife was rigid, so he got angry and shouted loudly, Will you stop crying? It's come to this. We can't lose that son. He's the future of our family. Hasu tried to explain to his wife that they could not raise both children at the same time, and a son was the most important thing at present, and it was not easy for him either, as he was very anxious to choose. Then Hasu hugged his daughter and dragged her outside while the mother and daughter screamed, reaching for each other. The desperate mother shed tears for her daughter. The poor girl was sobbing in fear. She didn't know where fate would take her when she had to leave her mother's arms. However, Hasu still insisted on taking his daughter away. He gave her to a man from the next village who wanted to adopt her. That night, the small family was completely absent from laughter and talking. The atmosphere was strangely gloomy. The Hasu family and their young son slept very early. Until late at night there was suddenly a groan coming from nowhere through the window into Ruri's ears. The occasional morning startled her to wake up. It was clearly a child's voice Ruri thought to herself. Then she slowly pulled back the curtains as dim light from outside flooded into the room. Suddenly in front of the window, there was a familiar figure of her eldest daughter, who was standing silently staring into her mother's eyes. Ruri was shaken. She rolled her eyes when she saw her daughter coming home at this moment. Moreover, before her eyes was a tragic appearance. Her whole body was wet, her skin was pale and her eyes were as white as those of the underworld. The water ran down the leg of her pants into a pool on the ground, looking as if she had just been soaked in water. Her face was devoid of emotion. Her mouth began to sputter a few trembling words calling out to her mother. Ruri rushed over to see what was wrong with the child. She panicked and asked her daughter why this mess happened. However, the answer to her mother's questions was just cold silence from the poor little girl. After a while, she stammered a few words, saying that it was true that her parents wanted her to leave. Hearing all of this, Ruri bursted into tears, hugging her daughter and apologizing with all her strength. The little girl continued to say strange words. She said that it was too late and they could never go back to the way things were. Ruri rubbed her face and told her everything would be fine. It broke her heart as she stroked the hair of her daughter. But she knew that this was no longer her daughter. The little girl looked up at her mother and told her that she had to go now. She just wanted to come here to see her mother for the last time. The mother had not yet reacted when the little girl vanished like an illusion right before her eyes. When she looked back, only her shaking hands could be seen. The mother was so bewildered and couldn't understand what was going on. She lowered her head and looked to the ground. There was still a large pool of water on the ground, which might mean that the girl's soul really returned to it and that she probably met a bad fate. When the mother looked at the gate, she found it had been open. She rushed outside. She ran while screaming her daughter's name in madness. She was running across the village road that was dark without a person in sight. She screamed and cried even louder, knowing that something bad had definitely happened to her daughter. But all she saw was a dream. Hasu woke up holding his crying son. He tried to calm Ruri down. When Ruri woke up, Hasu asked a lot about what she dreamt about. She sadly recounted what she saw and her dead daughter with her soul appearing in the dream. Hasu didn't seem to believe it, but Ruri's attitude showed that what she said was completely uncensored. Hasu advised his wife to go to bed early. 
This time their family had many difficulties to face, so they had to try to overcome it all. The next morning, when Ruri was going to visit her daughter with her belongings, there was a loud scream in the yard, as a man in the next village who adopted Na came running in asking to meet the couple. Hasu greeted and asked him about what was going on as the man stammered and said, Your, your daughter left my home last night and I didn't see her in the morning. Ruri panicked when she heard the news. Hasu was now sweating profusely. His face was showing real concern. The man added that at the back of his house was a forest and a dangerous river, so they needed to find the girl immediately. When the mother heard it all, her eyes went wild with fear. She remembered what happened last night when she met the little girl. Could it be that this was an omen? The three of them went together to search for her and hoped that she had just gotten lost somewhere. But a tragic thing happened. Hasu eventually found the body of his daughter lying face down in cold water as he dragged his heavy steps with long tears. Holding the body of a child in her arms, Ruri cried for many hours on that day and Hasu knelt on the ground with guilt and regret. Her mother mourned and tormented her heart for not being able to protect her daughter. Several months after the horrible event, the tragedy of the Hasu family didn't end there. The son also couldn't survive as he passed away in the autumn of that year. The poor mother went mad with grief. She kept holding the pillow in her lap and calling for her children. And Hasu? He fell to alcohol addiction as his fortune also disappeared with it. Now he had truly lost everything. characters in today's story are Kiba and his family. After considering his circumstances, Kiba decided that his whole family would move to a large house so that his wife, children and old mother could have a more comfortable life. The new house that Kiba bought was close to the old one, so moving was quite convenient. Kiba had also bought new furniture to redecorate the house and make it more spacious and comfortable. Kiba's mother was 70 years old this year. Although she was weak, she was eager to help her son. Kiba's wife was also very excited, wanting to help clean the new house. Kiba told his mother to just relax and go for a walk around the house, leaving everything to him and his wife. Kiba's son was also extremely interested and intrigued by this new space, so he kept running around. By night time, the whole family had finally finished cleaning up this new house. Kiba was a very loyal son, so he prepared his mother's room thoughtfully, and before going to bed, he asked her if everything was good enough, and if she needed anything, she must just ask him. Kiba knew she had been cleaning and helping all day, so she should have an early night. He then advised his mother to sleep early and exited her room. Tomorrow morning, he would go to the market to buy some personal things for her. Then Kiba also returned to his room. His wife was putting things together in the room and his son was already sleeping. Kiba's wife asked him if his mom was asleep. She thought that she had looked a bit sad that day. Kiba said that maybe it was because she had to leave her old house where she created so many memories, but that she would be fine with time. Both Kiba and his wife slept until dawn, since they were so tired from the previous day. Since he didn't see his mother waking up early as usual, Kiba came knocking on her door. He kept calling her, but she didn't answer. Seeing that, his wife's face couldn't hide her concern. She suddenly recalled that his mom woke up early every day. Why would she get up so late today? A feeling inside her told her that something bad had happened. So Kiba quickly pushed the door down and entered, calling his mother's name. Once inside, 
Heba saw his old mother still lying on the bed, carefully covered with the blanket. However, she still didn't respond to their words, not even a flinch. This made both of them extremely concerned. They both walked to the side of her bed and noticed she was okay. The daughter-in-law sighed in relief. She was sleeping so deeply that neither the husband nor his wife could wake her up. Then the couple decided to go out and let the mom rest. The mother kept sleeping all day until the night fell. It wasn't until dinner that Kiba's mother woke up and opened the door to enter the dining room. However, her face today looked strange. Kiba and his wife asked if she had a good night's sleep, but she said nothing. Just like that, the mother sat down on the chair, picked up a bowl of rice and devoured it. She ate it as if she hadn't eaten in days. Observing this, Kiba's face started to look surprised. She looked strange today. Something was off. Suddenly, Kiba's son screamed. His mouth stuttered and his whole body trembled. The boy looked at his grandma with horror, as if he had seen something terrible. He suddenly started growling. Kiba's wife asked him what had happened, but he only kept looking back and forth between his grandma and his mother while crying. He cried even louder, then pointed his finger at her and said it was not his grandmother. Kiba and his wife were both extremely confused as to what was going on. Kiba turned to tell his mother that she should eat slowly, otherwise she would choke. However, at that moment, the mother suddenly froze. Only an annoyed growl came out of her mouth. Kiba looked terrified. Why had his mother suddenly changed? Kiba's wife was so scared that she turned pale and thought, why had her mother-in-law become so scary today? Their son kept on crying louder and louder. After finishing all the food on the table, the mother stood up and walked straight back into her room. Kiba's wife knew something was wrong. Ever since they moved into this house, she seemed to be different. Scared and worried, Kiba followed his mother into the room to see if she had any health problems. He gently knocked on the door, called out to his mother and carefully stepped inside. But just like before, not even a single word came from her mouth. Only a terrifying growl. When Kiba approached her, she turned around and with a horrifying face, she shouted for him to get out of the room. She then started rushing towards Kiba, still shouting. By then, Kiba was truly terrified by his mother, but afraid of what might happen, he decided to look from the outside of the room. The wife thought her mother-in-law was dissatisfied with the change of houses, and that's why she was acting so oddly. But Kiba disagreed and reassured his wife that when they moved in there, she was happy and that it was unlike her to get this angry. Then Kiba thought that maybe it was because she was unfamiliar with the place, but she would be fine after resting. After that, the couple also went to their bedroom, but they were both unable to sleep that night because of the strange events that happened that day. The next day, at the crack of dawn, Kiba woke up from his wife's screams. The wife was now holding her head down with her hands on her face. Kiba thought his wife had fallen or bumped her head against the wall. So he hurried to her. It turned out that wasn't the case. He could see that his wife's hair had been cut off by someone else. His wife just sat there in pain and panic. It was in that moment that Kiba started to really panic, realizing his mother was maybe the culprit. Despite how unlikely that might have been, he began to doubt the house. The wife kept crying and Kiba tried to comfort her, but it didn't calm her down at all. One shocking event was not over yet, when another came. They realized their son was nowhere to be found. Kiba and his wife started to worry, so they both rushed out to find their child. Although they searched everywhere, they could not find him. They were both truly afraid. Kiba even ran into the neighbor's house looking for his son. But no luck. 
the wife was at home, calling out for her son, but no response could be heard. They both felt helpless. They clasped their hands and prayed for their son's well-being. Then, they suddenly saw the son run out of his grandma's room, holding a carefully framed photo. Kiba and his wife were surprised that their son ran into her room to play. Without saying anything, the boy held the photo frame that his grandmother gave him in front of them. Both of them looked at the photo and suddenly felt as if something cold ran through their spines. Their faces were still in shock. In the photo was a family of four, including an old woman, a couple and a son, exactly like Kiba's family. The only discernible difference was that the woman's hair in the photo was shorter. Even more frightening, just a second later, the image of the mother in the photo suddenly turned into an image of Kiba's mother, but with a terrifying look. What is this all about? Kiba's wife exclaimed. Why is your mother in this picture? She showed extreme fear and concern. Surely this house was haunted. Why else would her hair be cut short when she woke up? And just like in the picture. Suddenly, at that moment, inside of Kiba's mother's room, a burst of flames came out. Kiba was so scared, so he asked his wife to watch over their son. He needed to run inside to save his mom. Inside the room was so smoky. Kiba tried to break in, hoping his mother would be okay. Once inside, Kiba stood and looked bewildered. The flames were so big. The person who caused the fire was none other than his mother, who was fanning the fire vigorously while shouting. Despite Kiba's best efforts to stop and bring her outside, she screamed and told him to get out of this house. Then she shouted that Kiba was a disloyal son and that he needed to give her life back. Ignoring her delusion, Kiba tried to stop his mother's odd behavior, then pulled her out the fire. As he did so, a large wooden bar fell straight down from the burning ceiling. The whole house was now engulfed in flames. His mother had passed out by now. Kiba tried his best to bring her towards the door. Kiba used all his strength to carry his mother and rushed out of the flames. Seeing him and his mother come out, his wife let out a small sigh of relief. Soon, the house was burned down. The fire spread too quickly and was too fierce and fast. The couple could only helplessly watch all their possessions dissipate in the rage of fire. A few hours later, the fire had gone out, but the house was left with nothing. Kiba and his wife quickly carried their mother into an ambulance. They don't know why it happened, but thought that perhaps this was the result of angry souls in the house. Through research, Kiba learned about the terrifying event that happened to the previous house's owners. The son and daughter-in-law tricked the mother into signing the rights to the house, to them, and kicked the mother out of it. But that same night, out of rage and revenge, the mother came back with a can of gas and burned down the house. The whole family of four died together in the sea of fire. The house was then rebuilt and sold to Heber's family, who unexpectedly moved to the house filled with spirits. Kiba had no choice but to sell the land and move to another city. That day, as the police department received an important report from an archaeological institute, they quickly arrived at the place. Mr. King, the head of the research team, together with his subordinates, were there to welcome them. Mr. King expressed his gratitude towards the investigation team led by Officer Chow. Thank you for your arrival here, Mr. Chow. Officer Chow asked Mr. King about the mysterious disappearance of the dead body as he demanded him to tell everything he knew about it. Mr. King said the ancient mummy they had previously found suddenly disappeared last night, three days before his excavation team had found an ancient tomb in the mountain. 
The tomb was located deep in the forest and was discovered by some hunters who immediately reported about it. To avoid damaging the objects which were buried with the tomb, Mr. King asked his subordinates to carefully remove them. As the coffin was finally carried out of the grave, Mr. King stared at it in amazement. The coffin was covered with an extremely fine paint. According to Mr. King, the paint was created way back to the Qing dynasty. Having years of experience in this field, Mr. King carefully inspected the outside of the coffin before removing its lid, as he wanted to make sure there was no toxic gases bottled up inside it. Wow. Everyone was in utter shock to see what was inside the coffin. It was a dead body that was still intact, dressed in a Qing dynasty costume. But the horrifying thing here was that the body had a wooden beam in the middle of its chest. One of the workers blurted out that the body was that of a living dead. While another guy claimed the corpse was of an older religious group that created the living dead. Both theories of the workers made sense to Mr. King as he believed the coffin had something unusual in it. One of the workers also added that there must be something sinister going on with the corpse since it was pierced with a wooden beam. Mr. King felt worried as he gazed at the corpse. Part of it was because he had looked up lots of information about ancient graves before. The worker told Mr. King about the story he'd heard before that the dead would awake if one removed the wooden beam out of it. Mr. King pointed at the corpse, telling others to look at its teeth. How terrifying. There were sprouted fangs inside its mouth which meant that it had gone to the final stage of transforming into a demon. It would be an absolute horror if the corpse awoke from the dead. It would definitely bring calamity to humanity as those who got bitten by it would become zombies instantly. The director of the archaeological institute slowly approached from behind, laughing loudly as he said their theories were utter nonsense. The man didn't believe in the existence of zombies in real life. He held at the workers, then walked closer to the corpse. The director then pulled out the wooden beam out of the dead body, then told the workers to bring it back to the institute so he could get it to the museum for display a week later. The excavation team brought the coffin and the corpse back to the institute afterwards. But last night, someone had broken into the place and stole the body. Mr. King accompanied Officer Chow to the room where he kept the dead body. The other officers started investigating the scene carefully. The only evidence they could find was an odd-looking handprint left on the door. Officer Chow asked Officer Ping to give him an investigation report. Officer Ping then pointed out something bizarre about the incident as based on what they had found at the scene. It looked like the corpse had left the place on its own. Chao was surprised to hear it as he found it too unbelievable. Indeed, there were no signs indicating an intruder breaking into the room. As they were heading back to the police station, Chao quickly went to see his boss Lu to report to him about the incident. What did you just tell me? That the corpse had awakened from the death and left on its own? Mr. Lu said. Lu asked Chao if he had fully investigated the scene. But Chao reaffirmed his belief to his boss that the dead body had indeed maneuvered. Later that afternoon, while Chao was analyzing the details he had about the incident, suddenly an officer came in, informing about a murder taking place and Chao was required to arrive at the scene. Chao asked the officer what had happened. The officer told him the murder took place early this afternoon at a market located in the suburb. A woman was approached by a strange man as she turned to see him. She was terrified by the look on his face. The man looked like a psycho. His eyes were bloodshot. Mouth was wide open, revealing the fangs as he unexpectedly attacked her. The man rushed to her with a tremendous force. He bit the woman by her neck as he slowly sucked blood out of it which looked just like a bloodthirsty monster. After killing the woman, the man continued to chase after others, causing them to frantically run away. 
Now, as the police had arrived on the scene, the man was seen completely transformed into a zombie. As the cops fired shots at him, he let out an aggressive growl, then collapsed on the ground. Now, everyone could clearly see the sharp fangs bearing out and his red eyes. Officer Chow realized this place was near to the Archaeological Institute, which aroused his suspicions about the mysterious disappearance of the corpse inside the ancient coffin. Chow was in panic to see the scene appearing before his eyes. There were around five dead bodies laying on the ground. Chow ordered his subordinates to conduct an extensive investigation into the murder case while performing an autopsy on the dead bodies. The following day at the police station, a tense atmosphere prevailed in the room. Mr. Liu was furious as the situation seemingly got out of control. God damn it! These journalists are a bunch of fools for spreading the news of zombies killing people! The article stirred up rumors that the corpse had killed countless people, which struck terror into the people as no one dared to go outside. Mr. Liu lit a cigarette to calm himself down, then asked about the investigative process. Officer Chao told him that they were waiting for the results of the autopsy. Mr. Liu ordered Chao to go to the forensic laboratory to hurry them up as this murder case needed to be solved as soon as possible. If the process took any longer, social chaos would be sure to break out. Officer Chao followed his boss's order. He hurriedly went to the laboratory as the results of the autopsy had also come out. Inside the lab, the forensic pathologists were working tirelessly to speed up the investigative process, thus avoiding the situation from getting worse. As soon as Officer Chow asked him about the examination results, one of the doctors said that he would be amazed by what they found. The doctor showed him documents of the autopsy results. Chow expressed sheer amazement as he inspected the files. The pathologist also added they had discovered a fact that all the dead bodies carried rabies virus in their blood cells. But the odd thing was the virus had mutated and become much more complex, hence taking more time for the doctors to examine it thoroughly. One thing about the corpses that terrified them was that they all had bite marks left on their necks, which totally confused them. Officer Chow thanked the doctor then said farewell to him as he brought the documents back to his superiors. A month later as the investigation seemingly reached a dead end with no new information to be found, more victims claimed by the mysterious murderer had spread panic in the police station. Mr. Liu expressed his anger as he ordered everyone to put all efforts into solving the murder case. Meanwhile, people were advised to wear masks in order to protect themselves from the strange virus as the press had made the situation become more serious. That afternoon, at the police station, as everyone was having a meal talking about the murder case, Officer Ping said that he had just received a report from a civilian on the sudden appearance of rabid dogs in town. Many people were bitten, the situation worsened as the dogs lived in the area with those that had rabies all ended up being infected. Chow underestimated the situation as dogs carrying rabies wasn't something too abnormal to him. But Ping told him that the serious problem here was lots of people having been bitten by the rabid animals, which came as a surprise to Chow. Normally dogs with rabies would die after they bit someone. But these ones were different as they still survived while becoming stronger and ferocious. Zhao got up, told everyone to move to the area immediately as no delay could be tolerated. Zhao and Ping skipped their lunch. They hurriedly set out to the area that was invaded with rabid dogs. The car stopped in a suburban town. There was no one spotted at the scene which meant that they must have evacuated. Ping felt a bit of insecurity as the place was filled with utter silence. Sensing something dangerous, Chao told his teammates to be careful. No sooner had Chao gotten out of the car than he heard strange noises. Suddenly out of nowhere, a dog came into his sight. Chao was stunned to see the thing appearing before his eyes. The dog with the bloody mouth and bloodshot eyes was growling aggressively. It was infected. By the look of the dog, Chao could tell that it wasn't carrying normal rabies. In just a blink of an eye, the dog rushed to Chao. Chao reflexively rose his arms to defend himself from the attack, 
blood was splashed as the dog bit him. As Ping witnessed Chow struggling with the ferocious dog, he immediately got out of the car to assist his friend. The man pulled out his gun, intending to take down the dog if necessary. Chow quickly hit the dog with a hammer, which made it jump backwards. However, shortly after that, the dog got up. It seemed like the hammer hit didn't do any harm to it. The bloodshot eyes of the dog, together with its aggressive look, gave Ping a firm impression that it had been infected. The dog was almost like an immortal, as a hammer hit it on the head would make one faint easily, let alone get up and attack. Ping asked Chow if he should shoot at the dog. Since the situation going in this town was more dangerous than Chow thought, he suggested returning for more reinforcements. However, as soon as Ping went back into the car to start the engine, he was shocked by what he saw. Officer Chow, you need to see this! Ping held loudly. Behind them now, many other dogs slowly came out. The officers were surrounded by the scary aggressive dogs. Now it was impossible for them to return. Chow suggested to climbing on the roof as it was the best thing they could do under the circumstances. He pointed at a high wall and then told Ping to run towards it as soon as he gave a signal. The two of them ran headlong to the wall. From behind them the ferocious dogs were growling angrily, chasing after them. Chow and Ping made a high jump for the wall. However, both of them froze as they witnessed the horrific scene behind the wall. There were dead bodies on the ground while some people were seen standing in a bizarre manner. All of a sudden they turned around looking creepy as their mouths were covered with blood and their eyes were lifeless. The creepy looking people suddenly rushed towards the two policemen. Chow and Ping was frightened. These people were just as crazy as those rabid dogs. It seemed like the whole town had been infected with the virus. In a moment of carelessness Ping almost slipped down but thankfully Chow was able to grab him in time. The officers were temporarily safe as they stood on the high wall. However, it was a serious dilemma for the two as they were surrounded by a pack of aggressive dogs and a group of crazy people who wanted to eat them alive. Walking along the wall, the two managed to get to the roof. Now as they were standing on a higher spot, they realized the situation had become worse than they thought. There was nowhere else for them to escape. The whole place was filled with infected people. They were moving like dead people but somehow behaved threateningly. Realizing the extreme danger of the strange virus, as it had caused everyone in town to turn. Officer Chow suggested finding a way to escape and call for reinforcements. Unexpectedly at that moment the two heard someone calling them. There was a woman and a little girl waving for help. It looked like they hadn't been infected. Chow told Ping to cover him from above as he came down to save the woman and child. Without a bit of hesitation, Chow climbed down and went to save the two. The woman burst into tears as she told the officer that everyone in town had gone crazy. She and her daughter had been trapped here for two days. Then Chow helped the woman and her daughter climb onto the roof. The situation became extremely dangerous as noises of doors banging were growing louder. It seemed like the aggressive monsters were about to get inside. The door bar seemingly couldn't hold any longer as the monsters kept screaming and banging, which attracted more of them to the place. Officer Chow hurriedly pushed the woman upwards to the roof. All of a sudden, Ping yelled loudly. He told Chow to climb up quickly as the monsters were about to enter. Chow gazed at the door. He instantly got frightened as the door bar was about to break. In just a moment, the door was bursting open as the infected rushed towards Chow. The monsters were fast and agile. They also had long canines which made them look extremely ferocious. Realizing it was too late to keep climbing, Chow felt a surge of panic. The group of crazy people frantically attacked him. Chow instantly knocked down a guy from behind with his elbow. As he was surrounded by these ferocious madmen, he kept throwing punches at them. However, these people no longer felt pain as they stood up immediately and continued to attack Chow. Chow needed to get out of his mess quickly. As the right moment had come, he quickly jumped onto the wall. He tried his best to climb while the crazy people were underneath him, aggressively rushing towards him. One of them grabbed Chow's leg. From above, Ping was grabbing Chow as he tried his best to pull the man up. As the monster clung onto Chow's leg, he was injured as blood spilled out the moment he pulled up his leg. 
Chao breathed shallowly. What a narrow escape it was. These people were so strong and ferocious. Chao suggested that they needed to leave this place before it was overrun with zombies. The two policemen led the woman and her daughter to a safer shelter. They stopped at the terrace as it looked quite safe to them. Chao told everyone to stay quiet as noises could lead the zombies to them. Since it was too dangerous to get back to the car and call for help, Chao said that he had come up with his own plan. The man turned his gaze at a haystack, saying that he could use it to make a signal for help. The group waited until the sun went down, then burned the haystack in the hope that the burning object would send out signals to the police. The little girl asked her mom if the zombies would break into and find their whereabouts. Officer Chao quickly reassured her, saying the police would arrive and save the four of them. Chao then asked the woman what had happened to the civilians. The woman said a few days ago everyone in town suddenly acted bizarre after they ate a pig. That day the dog of the village chief had bitten a pig to death. The pig owner demanded the village chief to pay for it as he wanted to settle the argument peacefully. The village chief agreed to the man's demand. Thinking that the pig was only bitten to death by a dog and would be a waste if he dumped it, the chief decided to cook it as he gathered everyone for a feast. The people in the village were all invited to his house as they feasted on the pork. All of a sudden they behaved oddly as they fought and killed each other. It was fortunate for the woman and her family to avoid the horrific incident as they didn't come to the gathering. Bing abruptly held out as he saw the rescue team arrived. They finally saw the signal for help and brought the whole team to save the survivors. Many police cars had arrived at the scene. The soldiers were all equipped with antivirus equipment. They used tranquilizer guns to shoot at the infected. The zombies, after being hit with the bullets, somehow returned to normal as their eyes were no longer red. The two policemen, the woman and the little girl were all safely rescued. Later, the police imposed a blockade around the whole town for decontamination and disinfection. Now, at the military hospital, Officer Chow had fully recovered after two days of treatment. All the wounds on his arms and legs had been antiseptic and bandaged. Chow expressed his gratitude as the research center had developed a cure, or else he would be infected with a strange virus. But the examiner said it was not over yet. He told Chao to follow him to the morgue as he wanted to show him something. The man removed the veil of a corpse, then told Chao to look at the bite and then the dead body. He was aghast to see the wound on it. This was the man that was first infected with the virus. However, the bite on his neck had a strange looking shape. Chao asked the doctor if the bite mark was from the missing mummy. The doctor looked at Chao, saying it was a warning sign that must not be ignored. This man had indeed been bitten by the mummy, which meant that the virus was originating from that. Inside the mouth, the canines have grown long, which served as proof that he had transformed into a vampire after being bitten. Chao told the doctor that if the process for cure development was delayed, there would be a lot of people, including him, being turned into bloodthirsty monsters. The doctor agreed with his statements. It was fortunate that they had stopped in time, or else it would be a doom to humanity. The next day at the police station, Mr. Liu once again became angry as the press still reported news about the missing of the ancient mummy. Later, he ordered the police officers to find out the mummy at all costs and burned it as it was the only way to make things right. As Officer Chao walked out of the room, he had a feeling of worry. There must have been someone behind the mysterious disappearance of the ancient corpse. And for that reason, he couldn't make certainty of anything until he found the mummy.
I was told this very scary story which took place 20 years ago by a nurse who also happened to be one of my colleagues. Back when she was young, she volunteered for the local medical team and had encounters with many spooky things. Since I didn't have much work to do on that day, I told her to recount the story. Back in the days, besides doctors, there were also Taoists who claimed that they could cure people. One of the female nurses said that it was just superstition as it sounded too good to be true for a Taoist to cure someone. I then told her that there were mysterious things happening long ago yet hadn't been scientifically explained yet. We started listening to the woman's story. That year, her medical team was sent to a mountainous area for conducting a survey as a medical center was soon to be opened there. The village head was a man named Shin. He told the team to stay at the infirmary as he would assist them if they needed any help. The team leader asked Mr. Shin where he kept the herbs, then assigned the tasks to his teammates. Suddenly, there were noises of people arguing outside. Everyone curiously went out to check. Turned out that the wife of the village chief was having a quarrel with another woman who desperately appealed for her husband to be freed. Seeing the doctors, the woman instantly rushed to them. She went to the leader of the group, knelt down and cried terribly. The woman then begged them to save her husband from death. The village chief and his wife quickly rushed to stop the woman, saying she was being emotionally unstable. But the doctor requested the two to let go of her as she wanted to check on her husband's condition. Mr. Shen couldn't hide the anger on his face. He told the doctor that the man had been possessed and was under treatment, thus he shouldn't interfere in the process. Now the doctor was even more concerned as he heard the village had said something about possession. He insisted on seeing the sick man. As they were on their way to the place where the man was being treated, the woman introduced herself as Lan, while Zon was her husband, then recounted the story to the doctors. Her husband Zon and the village chief were close friends as the term of office was about to expire. Shin had to cede the position for village chief to Zon. However, the head's wife was displeased as she didn't like her and Zon at all. That day, after Zon returned home from the jungle, the woman saw a red wound on her husband's forehead, yet Zon reassured her that it was just him clumsily tripping. However, Zon suddenly had a change in his personality as he constantly chased and hit other people without any reason. It was rumored that Zon had been possessed by a ghost hence not being capable of becoming the next village chief. What was even scarier, the man acted more outrageously as he grabbed his head and screamed loudly, saying there were hundreds of insects wriggling in his head. Having no other choice, Lan had to tie her husband to his bed, leaving him shouting in pain. But one day the man untied the rope and rushed outside which was completely unexpected to Lun. He aggressively attacked everyone he encountered. Later the villagers had to tie him up and carry him to the house of the village chief. One tower said that Zon had been possessed, thus he needed to have the ghost removed at once. Zon was locked in a warehouse afterwards looking miserable. Later the man was being soaked in a big jar whilst having his body being tied firmly. Every day Lan went to take care of her husband but the strange illness just tormented Zon as it had no sign of remission. Even on days when it was freezing cold and snow was falling outside, Zon was still trapped in the jar. Fearing that her husband would die if he continued to deal with this extreme situation, Lan begged the Taoist to release him, but the man immediately rejected it. Being furious, Lan rushed to her husband, intending to set him free, yet instantly got stopped by the villagers. 
The village chief's wife closed the door tightly, sarcastically told Lan that her husband was unworthy of governing the village, then kicked her out. Lan was heartbroken to recount the story. She neither believed her husband was possessed nor could be cured by that Taoist. As they finally arrived at the place, the scene appeared before their eyes freaked them out the moment they opened the door. Zon looked extremely fatigued. He was trembling from the freezing cold while his body was tied firmly. The water surface had also frozen. How could it be tolerable for a human being to endure all of this? The doctors quickly carried him out to the jar. Everyone was stunned. They wondered how the man was being treated in such a wrongfully strange way. The Taoist was also there. He looked worried as if he was in fear of something. Meanwhile, the villager's head's wife was saying something under her breath as she disdainfully gazed at the doctors. Zon was rushed to the hospital afterwards. His whole body was covered with sores. However, the man didn't make it as the sores became larger. He foamed at the mouth and died tragically. But the moment before he died, the man had held the chief's name and pointed his finger at him. Alan felt an immense pain in her heart as she witnessed the death of her husband. The female nurse had a suspicion that this incident had something to do with the village head and his wife. Lan returned home with great sadness while the villagers were still gossiping. They said Zon had done many bad things before, hence not being saved. Later that afternoon, the group of doctors had a discussion as the main doctor believed that the man had been killed by an abnormal parasite. The rest of the group was assigned to go out and inform the villagers that the man had died from a parasitic disease, not demonic possession. After telling the villagers to be cautious about the virus, the female nurse gazed at Lan's house. As she headed to the house, she saw two children running past her while yelling loudly. The female nurse kept walking. As she gazed inside, she saw Lan was comforting her son. Lan told her that her son was teased by some other kids. Thus, she chased them away. A while later at the riverbank, the two kids that the female nurse had previously encountered were found dead drowning. What was more horrifying, there were sores appearing on the two corpses, which similarly happened to Zon. The villagers believed it was the ghost of Zon that seeked revenge on them. One of the two children who died at the scene was that of the village chief. Hearing people say Lan had chased the two kids moments earlier, the wife became furious as she claimed it was Lan's fault that caused the death of her child. The wife aggressively rushed to Lan's house. She slammed the door, intending to hurt her. Unfortunately, as she kicked on the door, the roof tiles dropped from above and landed on her head. She screamed painfully as blood slowly dripped down. Lun and the female nurse were stunned to witness the scene. The nurse quickly checked on her, but it seemed like the severe injuries had made her lose consciousness. After the woman was taken to the infirmary, she suddenly acted crazy as soon as she awoke. The woman was tied to the bed right away. What terrified those present at the scene was the woman started having sores all over her body. The woman quickly got frightened as she didn't expect herself to endure this horrific disease. The female nurse quickly informed the village head on his wife's condition. The main doctor expressed his disappointment as he told Shin that his wife had been infected with a parasite that had killed Zon. Since the symptoms developed too quickly, there was just a slim chance for her to make it out alive. Shin refused to believe the doctor as he called some of the villagers to help him bring his wife to the Taoist, asking him to remove the ghost from her. The villagers quickly gathered in front of the Taoist's house. They seemingly didn't believe the doctors either. The main doctor told the nurse that he still hadn't figured out how the parasitic virus was transmitted as some got infected by it while others didn't. All of a sudden from inside the house there were piercing screams which aroused the amazement of those who gathered outside. Shortly after that they frantically ran away which created absolute chaos. 
The female nurse rushed inside the house to check. The scary scene in front of her eyes instantly made her skin crawl. The village head's wife had died as she laid in a pool of blood with foam in her mouth and sores spreading on her body just like Zon. However, it was another thing that caused her death. Laying next to the woman was the Taoist. Turned out that Mr. Shin had beaten his wife to death with a bar as he claimed the two had gone crazy and Zon was there to take revenge on them. Later that evening, Mr. Shin had ended up being killed the same way as he foamed at the mouth while having sores and parasitic worms all over his body. Lun was in utter confusion as she couldn't figure out why she and her child weren't infected. According to the doctor, it was the wounds and injuries that allowed this parasitic virus to be transmitted. They only survived for a short period of time in natural environments but could extend their lifespan if they stuck to open wounds. After the incident, a team of researchers on parasitic viruses was sent to the village. They quickly disinfected the whole area and no one had contracted the strange disease ever since. After the female nurse finished her story, she still had no idea if there was actually a deadly virus in the village or was it just the ghost of Zun that caused the horrific incident. There's this young student at my company who just started his internship there. His name is Tatsu. He and I like to chat to each other. One uneventful morning, Tatsu unceremoniously mentioned that he had met a ghost once. He then proceeded to tell me how it happened. This story started at Tatsu's old apartment, place he used to stay at before hired by the company. He told me about one of his neighbors, a successful doctor, living with his mother and wife. It is obvious that his wife was quite young. She often wore bold makeup and sexy clothes. The age difference, along with their different styles and clothing, aroused a feeling of distrust and unease to others. One day, while getting ready for work, Tatsu came across his neighbor, the doctor. He was struggling to carry some heavy luggage while eagerly looking at his watch as if he was waiting for someone. My colleague, curious, went over to ask him if he needed help. The man looked up and smiling said that he was going on a two-month business trip. Tatsu was no stranger to the doctor's family. In fact, the doctor's aunt often shared her homemade dumplings with him. It had been a long time since he saw her so he was actually quite curious to know about her. After a few tense moments, the man broke down and revealed the pain that was tormenting him. His mother, he said, had terminal cancer and was receiving treatment at home. Tatsu was shocked to hear the news. He would never have expected such a kind and joyful woman to catch such a terrible disease. Surely the poor doctor must have felt powerless and impotent if he was unable to help her, he said. Tatsu then mentioned he had to rush because he was late for his shift, so the two said their goodbyes and went on their way. Tatsu couldn't stop to look back at the man on his way out. He noted how his expression seemed to change as he walked away. Time went on and the doctor's absence in the house was eventually dismissed. And so it was until one day my colleague was taking out the garbage when he saw something strange. Tatsu had just opened the door when he noticed, down the stairs, to his right, a couple walking up towards him. As soon as the woman noticed him, her expression changed. Tatsu was quick to realize this was the doctor's wife. Tatsu couldn't mutter a word before the woman started introducing the young man to him. She said he was her younger brother from the countryside. Tatsu, being an honest and trusting person, thought nothing of this encounter. But the young brother lost his balance and tripped down the stairs. Fortunately, but unconvincingly, her sister saved him. 
The young man looked at Tatsu with distrust. Tatsu left right after, not feeling quite at ease around those two. On a different occasion, Tatsu heard the doorbell ring at his neighbor's apartment, and in curiosity, took a peek to see who it was. For a brief moment, he saw the so-called siblings being extremely intimate with each other. A sister would never do that with her brother, and a brother will definitely not do that to his sister, he thought. A few days passed and Tatsu forgot about what he had seen. One morning, on his way out, Tatsu felt the smell of incense and could sense a feeling of mourning nearby. And just as he was thinking this, his neighbor opened the door his face lacked life. All it reflected was sadness. He was wearing a traditional white garment that is worn for funerals. I had to ask Tatsu if he really dared to ask him if his mother was dead. After hearing this, he nodded his head to confirm, while wiping the tears from the corner of his eyes. When Tatsu heard this, he was shocked. He couldn't believe she was gone so soon. He offered his condolences to the family and asked for permission to come in and burn incense in her honor. As soon as he walked into his apartment, he saw the doctor's wife sitting on the sofa, eyes glued to her phone and with an indifferent expression on her face. When she saw him, her face was startled and her discomfort became apparent. After seeing her, he suddenly recalled what he saw days before but he knew that wasn't the time or place to bring it up now. He had to quietly pray for his aunt and burn some incense for her. After lighting the incense on the fire, he noticed a strange silhouette forming above him. Just above the shrine where her picture rested, Tatsu in horror saw blood running down the wall and coming from the aunt's face in the picture. He was so scared that he even tripped back. He was screaming trying to get away from this horrible display. His scream called the attention of everyone, especially the doctor, who rushed back to see what happened. He helped Tatsu off the sofa in the living room and asked him about what happened. Tatsu was trembling and scared, trying to tell the doctor about what he had seen in the auntie's photo. But when the couple looked around, they saw nothing out of place. Tatsu was shocked unsure if what he had seen was the result of an hallucination or something else. Then, behind him, he saw the doctor's wife, looking suspicious. Before he left, he said his goodbyes to the man and tried to comfort him as much as he could. Tatsu thought that was the end of it, but not even a day after, his life turned upside down. The next night, Tatsu left for work late. He was doing overtime and left for home at 11 p.m. Tatsu just entered the house when a cold, gloomy air rushed over him. But since he had had a long day of work and was tired, he just disregarded it, ate some noodles and went to bed. That night, Tatsu couldn't sleep. He suddenly woke up startled in the middle of the night, and for as much as he tried, he could not go back to sleep. As he struggled to fall asleep, he heard a strange sound coming from the living room. It sounded like someone munching on bread. He went out to check out the strange sound, but as soon as he opened the door, he saw a dreadful scene in front of him. Standing there in the living room was the old lady who had just passed away, devouring a loaf of bread. Her face was indiscernible. All he could see was a white, glowy face that almost made him faint. Tatsu ran back into his room, jumped on his bed, and went under the blankets. He was shaking and trembling like never before. His whole body was wrapped up in blankets. He could barely control the shaking as he tried to pray for help. After a moment of silence, the lady's soul slowly opened his door and walked in. She walked right to his side. Her face was as bloody as in the picture he had seen at the funeral. Tatsu was shaking, begging for his life. But the woman just stood there and with a calm voice told him about her demise. She said that her daughter-in-law refused to feed her until she starved to death. She only spent her time with another man while her son was away. Hearing this made Tatsu feel unsettled. He wanted to ask her why she was not haunting her daughter-in-law instead of him. 
that he was too scared, but eventually did so. The lady with the croaky voice told him that she could not enter the house for there was something stopping her. This is why she came to ask him for help. Hearing that, Tatsu suddenly remembered the promise he had made to his neighbor's family in front of the aunt's picture. He promised to help if they ever needed him. He then also remembered the times the cheating woman had deceived her husband. Tatsu changed his expression. He looked angry and determined now. He sat up and threw the blankets away. He then told the spirit that he would help her. But when he saw her clearly, his nose started bleeding. Hearing Tatsu's offering made the spirit tear up. Tatsu told her that he would go the next morning to their house to clarify this whole situation. Hearing this, the old woman laughed and smiled. She thanked him deeply. She said that fulfilling her wish would help her be in peace. She then faded away through the door until she disappeared. It seemed like the wicked daughter-in-law is going to get her comeuppance and will deal with immeasurable consequences. The next morning, as soon as Tatsu saw the doctor's wife leave, he went over to his house. The doctor was surprised to see him there at such an early time in the morning. With quick wit, Tatsu told him that his toilet was clogged and wanted to ask to use theirs. The doctor, being a neighborly man, immediately agreed. Once inside his home, Tatsu sneakily went to the aunt's shrine. He looked around, searching for the thing the spirit mentioned the night before. He kept on searching, looking for any unusual objects. When he reached the front of the wife's room, he saw a bowl with a bunch of mirrors hanging from the door. Tatsu did not know what it was, but it was surely unusual, so he decided to take it down to bring it to the spirit. If I do this, the spirit won't hang around my place anymore, he thought. Tatsu said that not long after that, he started his internship at my company. And shortly after, Tatsu accidentally stumbled upon his neighbor on the street. This time around though, he looked even more devastated, like he had just been through more pain and sorrow. He tried greeting him, but the doctor did not answer. Tatsu was curious so he asked people close to him about his family. A person told him that his wife had suddenly gone crazy. One day, she just lost it. She grabbed a knife, cut her face and gouged her own eyes before finally slicing her throat open. Everything was finally revealed and she confessed. Experimented Spider-Man One day at the police office, an urgent call was received, prompting the response team to prepare quickly and arrive at the scene as soon as possible. The heavy rain did not demotivate the hard-working Captain Chow. At the scene, the examination team was present earlier than the rest. But there was something puzzling them as bright as daylight on their faces. The chief of the autopsy team named Shen reported to Captain Chow that this was an extremely bizarre case. The wound on the victim and even around the scene showed that ordinary humans did not cause it. And as soon as he saw the dead body, Captain Chow could not contain his surprise. The victim died in a highly gruesome way, and the expression left on the face of the deceased seemed to be intensely frightened. There were countless fatal wounds on the victim's body, and all of them looked horrific. According to the examination team, the wounds were not caused by a normal weapon. Captain Chow was also anxious to know what was left on the scene so that he could judge the cause of the victim's death himself. And according to Captain Shen, there were no witnesses present at the scene except for the victim's wife. But she has lost her mind and is being treated at the hospital. According to the remains at the scene, it seemed that the killer jumped out from an alley to attack the victim. Now, they can only wait for the testimony from the victim's wife. Captain Chow decided to go to the hospital to see how the victim's wife was doing. After arriving, the doctor at the hospital informed Captain Chow that the victim's condition was critical. 
but before reaching the hospital room, both of them heard the insanely terrified screams of the victim's wife. According to the doctor, the patient kept saying strange things that didn't make any sense. Even though they gave the woman a sedative, every time she woke up, she couldn't help but lose control and become manic. She kept screaming and kept talking about a monster that killed her husband. But apparently, according to the traces left at the scene, there were human footprints and skid marks that led them to believe that a scuffle of some kind unfolded. The captain came over to question her, in hopes of finding some clarity on the matter. As soon as she saw the police, she hastily got off the bed and ran over to embrace and hold on to Captain Chow. Seeing that she had stabilized a bit, Captain Chow asked about what had happened and if she could recall anything. The woman was now able to calm down and slowly recount everything with a frightened expression on her face. According to the girl, this morning she and her husband were walking down the street. Then suddenly raindrops started pouring down. Herself and her husband ran into a nearby alley, and from a distance, they seemed to see someone hiding behind a trash can. Before they could figure out what the other person was doing, they were shocked when the man suddenly turned around with his white eyes and bloody mouth biting down on a mouse. It was frightening to see his face covered with dark patches while he didn't appear to be entirely human. Suddenly the creature leaped out of the trash with tremendous speed. It rushed towards him like a hungry tiger, its mouth wide open with sharp teeth, looking extremely ferocious. Her husband pulled her away as they quickly ran out of the alley, but the hideous creature did not let them go. It had many arms like a spider and was very fast. Its fingernails were as sharp as a wild animal's claws. It scratched her husband's back, making him scream painfully. And because he wanted her to escape, the husband stayed behind to keep the disgusting creature busy as she made her getaway. It had six arms, was extremely fast and dangerous, she explained. It was sad to know she witnessed the brutal murder of her husband. Seeing Captain Charles' skeptical expression, she cried and continued that she was talking the truth. She was sure of what she had seen. At that time, Captain Chow had thoughts in his mind. He asked the doctors to care for her and comfort her. Hearing an announcement on the 703 forensic team frequency, Captain Chow quickly responded. The forensic detective asserted that the case was very strange indeed and asked Captain Chow if he had any clues. He claimed that this case was really bizarre and asked if Captain Chow had any leads. The captain told Mr. Yang everything about the strange creature. Mr. Yang also informed the captain that he had found some traces on the victim's wound that could help with the investigation. Chow impatiently listed all the remaining evidence and hoped the case would soon be resolved. First of all, the victim's wound was deep and messy. It seemed unlike an attack by a human, more like a wild animal grabbing prey. After analyzing the wound for a while, Mr. Yang showed Captain Chow a piece of critical evidence. It was a fingernail stuck to the wound. These wounds had cuts on the skin made by fingernails, which seemed to have come from human hands. The case was becoming more complicated by the minute. As he was saying goodbye to Mr. Yang, Captain Chow immediately returned to the general department. It was getting dark when he went to the head office to urgently consult Boss Lu. He reported everything to his superior from what was found on the victim's body including the wife's testimony. Mr. Lu Feng realized that this case could not be ignored. All details showed that this creature or whatever it was was extremely dangerous so they had to hurry up and solve the issue fast. After the conversation, Captain Chow walked out of the room when some subordinates rushed over. They informed the captain that they caught a suspicious man around the area of the crime scene who also had a criminal record of multiple robberies. Based on the testimony, the things he saw were very similar to what the wife was talking about. The subordinate impatiently wanted the convict to tell Captain Chow everything he saw. As long as he made a sincere declaration, his charges would be alleviated. But he seemed to be afraid of something, so his reply came out crooked. 
Captain Cha was not patient enough, so he raised his voice to intimidate him. Finally, he gradually recounted everything he witnessed at the time of the murder. That same time, he planned to enter an abandoned military area to steal equipment. As he climbed over the barbed wire wall, he landed safely, thanks to his experience of stealing. Nothing was really difficult for him. Behind the fence was an old warehouse, which was formerly the old military medical room. There definitely was a lot of useful equipment inside, but the door was tightly sealed. The lock looked sturdy and solid, not to mention complicated. With practical experience, he found a way to unlock it. His years of experience paid off, and his unlocking kit was always carried with him. In but a moment, the lock was open. He slowly opened the door and surveyed the inside. A stench annoyed him. The room was empty, and in the distance was a curtain. It seemed to have something behind it. As he approached, the stench got worse. Dragging the curtain aside, there were many hospital beds and medical equipment. He looked around and found a very bizarre surgical sketch on the wall that portrayed a human, but with six limbs, like an insect. After seeing the sketch, he panicked when he saw that there appeared to be a person lying down on a bed nearby covered by a blanket. The blanket seemed to be trembling slightly. Despite the terrible stench, he intended to uncover it to see what was lying below. With all his courage, he placed his hand on the blanket. He pulled the blanket away vigorously. His face turned pale and stressed after seeing what was underneath the blanket. A man with four arms. The surgery looked fresh and the bleeding was causing all the stench. He was so scared he passed out. With trembling legs, unable to stand up, he crawled on the floor. While frightened and crawling little by little to get out of the room, he bravely decided to get up and run. As he was trying to make his escape, he ran into a man who had appeared behind him all of a sudden. The man looked at him with a fierce face as if he knew exactly what had occurred. Without much talk, he held up a small knife, his face full of murderer's intent. And he did not hesitate rushing to stab the thief. The thief frantically reached out to try to block the knife. This left his hand with a deep cut and blood stains all over his arms. He desperately pushed the other man away and rushed out. Luckily he was able to climb over the fence and escape. He panicked and ran for his life. The terrifying man didn't seem to have the intention of chasing after him. He stood from afar and watched him, his cruel face still holding the knife. He told all of this with an expression of great panic since he was just a thief after all, and not a violent man. After being able to drag himself home, he was still in shock over what he had just witnessed. In his room, he bandaged his wounds from the knife cut. What he had just witnessed this early in the morning made him unable to rest. He was scared, so he kept the knife by his hand to feel more secure. Suddenly, the terrifying man appeared and raised the knife above him. Even though it was a small surgical knife, it was extremely sharp. He was stabbed with blood gushing out like a stream of water that he could not hold back. Shaking awake, he screamed while sweat poured down his face. Touching his body, he realized it was all just a dream. He was haunted by the terrifying man. Now sitting upright for too long, he caught a glimpse of something outside the window. Outside, something that looked like a giant spider appeared, clinging to a window. He trembled with his knife in his hand and stood hiding by the side of the wall. Regaining his composure, he reached out to lift the curtain in order to get a better view of what was going on outside. Days later, no matter where he went, he imagined the other man watching him. So when he heard that there was a strange murder and the culprit was a disgusting creature, he went to the scene to investigate the situation. With his testimony, Captain Chow decided to go there for an inspection. He hurriedly left the room. 
With a few more comrades, he went to the abandoned military zone that the thief had told them about. The teammate announced that the door was firmly locked. Captain Char looked around, then decided to climb over the fence to get inside. The two could quickly and safely come right where the thief had told them about. With their guns firmly in hand, the two entered the house and also saw the curtains that the thief reported. Captain Chow and his teammates were very careful with what's behind the curtain. After a moment of investigation, the two charged straight in. Captain Chow provided support for his comrades, and on the bed was still something lying and covered by a blanket. The teammate reached out and tugged on the blanket to examine the contents. Then an extremely fast knife passed across his neck, making him unable to turn his head. The non-stop blood flow made him tremble. Under the blanket was the man the thief told them about he had apparently been hiding there for a while. Captain Chow just turned around to shoot at the guy, but he quickly launched a scalpel at the captain. Thanks to his luck and quick reflexes, Captain Chow was able to dodge easily. The captain rushed to catch the man, but he was incredibly agile. They writhed on the floor, Captain Chow could not avoid being injured. Taking that opportunity, the man ran to the door. Watching his teammate collapsing on the ground, Captain Chow was extremely angry. He rushed to the door to chase after the man. Meanwhile, the man was trying to climb over the fence. The captain held up his gun with real combat experience. A shot was fired. As gunfire rang out, the man could not escape and fell from the wall. After that, Captain Chow helped his injured teammate to the emergency room. The teammate was taken to the hospital in time, so his life was saved. The captain reported everything to his superiors. Boss Lu also investigated the man's identity. He was a doctor in the old army, always dreaming of creating a cold-blooded warrior. Captain Chow was extremely angry because of the man's inhumanity. He captured living people to research and deliberately created a monster. At the same time, hearing the announcement that the man had regained consciousness, Captain Chow and Boss Lu decided to go to the man's hospital room. The man was still very stubborn, lying on the hospital bed, even though his hands were handcuffed and surrounded by the police. Boss Lu Feng angrily asked him about the research. But instead, the man just showed a contemptuous face, smirked, and said that he would leave here soon. Captain Chow and Chief Lu Feng both knew what he meant. Leaving the hospital room, they were both worried that perhaps the other monster would come. Boss Lu Feng told Captain Chow not to let him have a chance to escape. Captain Chow was also very determined. He said he would be the one to watch out for the man. They also knew that the monster would be coming soon and they didn't know how terrible the guy was in the end, but they had to be extra careful anyway. That night, Captain Chow sent strict guards to stand outside the room, and Captain Chow was also there to observe the situation. Seeing that his subordinate teammate was tired, the captain did not hesitate to replace him to guard the hospital room door. The teammate announced that he would wash his face to stay awake and then return to his position. Having said that, he walked towards the toilet area. But as soon as he disappeared at the end of the hall, there was a sudden noise. After that, his body was knocked away by something powerful. From a distance, a man in a black robe with a tall belt approached. With sharp teeth and white eyes, it looked like a monster not an ordinary person. Captain Chow quickly ordered everyone to get in position and pull out guns to defend themselves. Immediately, Captain Chow and his teammates surrounded the monster, but in an instant from within his black cloak, many arms were exposed at lightning speed and forcefully attacked the policeman. During the struggle, the policeman pulled his cloak off, revealing the inside of a tall, toned body, along with six flexible, extremely scary arms. Captain Chow proved extremely confused. This guy was a monster, not a human anymore. The monster burst out like a wild beast, fast and robust, and no one could stop him. 
Captain Chow held the gun towards it, firing repeatedly, but it almost only scratched the outside. Captain Chow was stunned. It was too fast and could dodge his bullets. Suddenly, it hung from the ceiling fast, looking like a spider. Then it plunged from the ceiling downwards towards Chow at lightning speed. Captain Chow held up his gun and repeatedly fired at it, but it only injured its skin at this distance. Upon landing, it also injured Chow's arm. Right after, it rushed into the room where the monstrous man was locked. Despite the painful smearing wound, Chow was determined to chase after it. But at that time, the monster had freed the sick doctor. It carried the man in his hand and prepared to jump out of the window to escape. That monstrous doctor turned to look at Chow, still showing a smile of contempt and pride. Then the monster jumped out of the hospital room window with the doctor in its arms, even though they were on the fifth floor. Captain Chow chased after them but couldn't keep up. He aimed his gun straight at the two criminals. At this point, the monster had already launched straight ahead and clung to the building next to it. Captain Chow fired multiple shots repeatedly to stop them. However, all the bullets only hit the hand and body of the creature, which was unfortunately not enough to defeat it. Suddenly, the gun ran out of ammo in the most critical moment. Captain Chow was worried because the criminals were right in front of him. They would escape but the captain didn't take any further action. While the oil was boiling, a gunshot was heard from behind Captain Chow. The bullet flew straight at the head of the hideous monster. The fatal shot made the monster and the man fall from above together. Captain Chow turned to look back. It turned out that Chief Lu Feng arrived in time. As expected, the oldest spicy ginger, the boss Lu, who was a fine marksman. The sound of the two perpetrators falling from above attracted many onlookers. When they looked closely at the monster created by the doctor, both Chao and Boss Lu Feng felt unnerved. Two corpses fell from above, so a lot of blood was spilled on the ground, and Boss Lu ordered that the scene be handled quickly to avoid people's curiosity. The next day at the police station, Captain Chow reported the entire incident of the case. Captain Chow and Boss Lu were still in shock. After all, this was a crazy monstrous case and crazy research project. Captain Chow offered to destroy the creature's corpse, along with the research reports of the monstrous doctor. Boss Lu Feng also agreed with this suggestion because this research was too barbaric. It was impossible for another madman to find it and do it again. In the end, Boss Lu Feng decided to put a red seal on it to finally close the case. This was a monstrous case that would probably haunt the investigation team for a long time. It was a story about a guy named Kama, whose eyes could see ghosts. He made a living as a shaman and earned an income with his special ability. Today it was the weekend, but someone unexpectedly appeared outside. The door was opened by Kama's friend Ken, who was living in the same house. A man with an emaciated and tired face appeared in front of Ken. He inquired where the Kama was at home but Ken did not respond directly. Instead, he invited the visitor to come in first. Seeing the young man's awkwardness, Ken pointed to the room ahead and said that Kama was in the room. The young man entered Kama's room with a slight smile to express his gratitude to Ken. After exchanging greetings, Kama knew that the guy was working for a nightclub he came to see him because he had a very strange dream. Due to time constraints, 
the young man went straight to the point and told Kama about his dream. In his dreams, he always saw a woman crying bitterly in the corner of the room. He felt sorry for the girl and planned to visit her to console her and ask her questions. But as he got closer, the woman became agitated and would come over to strangle him. The girl's expression frightened him even more. A white face with no eyes. Flesh that has rotted and peeled into patches as if it was decomposing. After listening to Karma, he felt that the woman certainly had many twists and turns. To find out more information, Karma asked the guy if she said anything. The man immediately waved his hand indicating that he knew nothing about her. Because the man didn't dare to approach when he saw the terrifying face, he couldn't dare to ask her anything. At the time, the man came to meet Kama solely to request that he take care of the ghost as soon as possible. He didn't get a good night's sleep as a result of the nightmare. After hearing what he had to say, Kama laughed lightly and imagined that the woman had been killed unjustly and had come to see him in his dream to ask for his assistance. After hearing what had happened, the man became concerned because he had never had the courage to approach the woman and thus would not be able to assist her in resolving any injustice. Finally, Kama stood up and agreed to assist the man. Only he had the ability to communicate with the girl in the situation. The two of them immediately went out. When they were walking across the living room, Kama had the sudden desire to ask Ken to solve the problem. Ken had always been fascinated by ghosts, so when Kama asked him, he had no reason to refuse. The three of them quickly arrived at the man's bar. The bar was on the fourth floor of the building with a nightclub beneath it. Previously, the building was a hotel with a nightclub beneath it. Later, for the sake of convenience, some rooms on the fourth floor were converted into rooms for staff. After opening the door, Kama went around to assess the situation inside the room. With his special abilities, he could sense that the room was haunted. He immediately squatted in the middle of the room and scribbled some strange characters on the floor with a pen. After finishing the letters, Kama reached into his pocket and pulled out a bag of red liquid, a pair of chopsticks and a candle. These were all tools he had learned to use in order to perform mystical rituals. When the man brought the requested bowl, Kama immediately took the bag containing the red liquid and poured it into the bowl, which he placed in the center of the pre-written letters. Then he folded the two chopsticks into a cross and placed them on top of the bowl before placing the candle on the chopsticks. As he prepared to finish the seance ritual, Kama stood up and smiled wickedly at the two confused people behind him, informing them that the woman would appear. When Kama said this, the other men's heartbeats quickened in fear. Ken, on the other hand, had complete faith in Kama knowing that no matter how terrifying a woman's ghost was, he could handle it. The owner, on the other hand, was desperate to get rid of the girl, so even though the situation was tense, he gritted his teeth and persevered. When Kama shut all the doors and turned off the lights, the atmosphere in the room became quiet and gloomy. There was only one candle left lit in the room at the time. The light from the candle illuminated the room slightly. At the time, Kama took out a cloth puppet and tied a rope around its head. One of his hands grasped the other end of the rope, which was holding a puppet to the candle's head. The puppet's shadow was reflected on the wall by candlelight. It began as the shadow of a puppet, but after a few minutes, the shadow grew larger and moved to form an adult on its own. Ken who witnessed the scene was too terrified to say anything. A face began to emerge from the blank shadow. It slowly emerged from the surface of the wall, looking as alive as if it was real. The face came first, followed by the rest of the body. The young man and Ken were terrified and felt like fleeing. 
The sight of a woman stepping out from behind the wall was unbelievable. As for the man, his face was still stunned, unable to say anything, and he was only able to stare at the woman. Because she was the woman who appeared frequently in his dreams, the woman's expression, however, did not match the man's description. She appeared gentler and stood still staring at Karma until he spoke first. Hearing Karma's promise to assist in restoring justice, the woman began to cry and shared her story. The woman's name was Aiku. Because of her poor family circumstances, she dropped out of school early to work in order to earn money. At the time, her mother was seriously ill and needed a sum of money to get medical treatment urgently. She went with an introduction to meet a wealthy individual who could lend her a large sum of money without charging interest. Seeing Aiku's beauty and pleading, the boss quickly agreed to loan Aiku the money and asked her to pay it back within two years. After that, Aiku began working around the clock in the hopes of paying off all her debts, but an incident occurred not long ago. The boss summoned Aiku to a private room one night because he needed to speak with her about something. Aiku noticed her boss blushing and knew right away that he had been drinking heavily. At the point, he motioned for her to take a seat beside him. Because Aiku couldn't refuse, she sat next to him while hearing about the debt she had from the boss. His statement caused Aiku to panic and she did not dare to look at him. According to the agreement, she would pay the full amount after two years, but there was no deadline to repay the debt at the time. The boss immediately laughed and pointed to the wine bottle on the table telling her that if she drank the bottle of wine, all her debts would be forgiven. When Aiku heard his statements, she felt both happy and worried. After that, Aiku decided to pick up the bottle, tilt her head backwards and take a few drinks until the bottle ran out. Aiku's stomach became tense and uncomfortable after consuming a full bottle of wine. Nonetheless, she tried to calmly place the bottle of wine on the table and politely asked the boss to keep his promise because she had met the conditions he set. When her boss saw what was going on, he was taken aback because he had previously underestimated her. The boss believed that the money could make I could do whatever he wanted. He tried to seduce her into selling her body to him. Even though Aiku was inebriated and irritated by alcohol, she was fully aware. She realized her boss's intentions and became embarrassed and enraged. Because she was a kind person, she refused to sell herself for money. So she did not hesitate to slap the boss to express her displeasure. The boss's face was expressionless as he was brutally beaten. But his attitude quickly shifted and he became enraged as a result of Aiku's actions. He couldn't keep his rage in check and immediately raised his foot, kicking Aiku to the ground. He even summoned his people to come in and beat Aiku mercilessly. After a while, the poor girl was eventually beaten to death. Despite knowing that the junior's actions went beyond their original intentions, he decided to handle her until the end. At the time, there was an empty room upstairs that was rarely used. So the boss hid Aiku's body there and converted it into a staff room. Karma couldn't help but sigh and lament the unfortunate girl. However, the fact that she knew who the enemy was without seeking vengeance in order for her to be freed made him wonder. It was not that Aiku didn't want to leave, but something in the room was keeping her from doing so. Kama did not respond. Instead, he went to the door to look around and look for the main doorframe. Kama eventually found a pair of scissors on the doorframe. The boss managed to seal Aiku's spirit inside the room due to his fear of retaliation from her soul. Kama turned to face Aiku, held up the scissors in his hand and told her that now there was nothing to stop her. She could do whatever she wanted. When Aiku finished listening, Aiku smiled contently. 
the ghost of Aiku slowly exited the room and vanished. In the next day, the young man rushed to inform Karma of the shocking news. The boss had a freak accident and went insane after being avenged by a so-called ghost girl. It was exactly what he deserved in retaliation for his crimes. The scary story happened to a guy named Tengu. Every late afternoon, some of the old people gathered in groups of five or seven under the village's top banyan tree to play chess. Tengu was also at the chess game at that time, as he observed and commented. Tengu was the type of person that no one wanted to meet. He wandered around the village all day, and he teased everyone he met. He made many people feel uncomfortable. Originally, in a village, he was a thug. He did not research anything, hence before everyone's reaction, he immediately rolled his eyes and did not respect anyone. The village leader was furious, and he ordered that Tengu be punished for offending others. As a result, he simply left. He still tried to turn his head and sneered a few more phrases with a tone that everyone suggested he had spent playing chess for a long time. In his free time, he had nothing to do. Tengu asked people to join in playing cards. He must be a gambling addict. Because everyone knew Tengu didn't have money in his pocket, no one would allow him to play. Even among them, some individuals looked down their noses at Tengu and just gave him a fleeting glance before walking away. While they played cards, they talked about an ancient tomb the tomb located in the western forest. In the tomb, there was a big fox. The fur of the fox was worth thousands of gold. Whoever found this fox would be rich. Tengu immediately showed great interest when he heard the story. However, the western forest was a dangerous place. Tengu seemed unconcerned about the threat. He eventually located the tomb that the others had indicated after more than 30 minutes of trekking. The tomb appeared to have been there for a long time. Even the inscription on the stele had faded and couldn't be read. Because he thought the tomb must have a big fox in it, Tengu patiently hid at the foot of a tree and waited from afternoon until nightfall. Suddenly, Tengu looked surprised, as if he couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was exactly as they said. A red fox had appeared from underneath the tomb. Tengu couldn't hide his joy when he saw the size and fur of the fox. Tengu had never seen any red fox before. If he caught it, he would have a great treasure to sell. The fox appeared to notice that it was being followed. With the ghostly eyes, it returned the stare. Tengu couldn't sleep at night because he couldn't get his mind off the fox. He spent all night to prepare the necessary supplies to trap the fox. Early in the next morning, Tengu went into the forest and carried his handmade trap prepared from last night. After setting a trap, he hid behind a tree. He held a large stick and waited. Tengu fell asleep due to the rapid passage of time. Tengu was finally awakened by groaning after a lengthy sleep. He cheerfully looked and anxiously awaited the results of his rope trap. Indeed, the fox was trapped. The fox's one leg was tangled in the rope. No matter how hard the fox struggled, the fox couldn't get out. Tengu immediately had the opportunity to carry the stick and rushed out as quickly as he could. He intended to kill the fox with one blow of his stick. 
He swung down his stick and shot right at the fox without hesitation. The powerful blow struck the fox's hind leg. It caused the fox to splatter blood, but it also broke the rope. The fox seized the opportunity and dashed towards the lair beneath the tomb with the last of her remaining strength. Dengu tried to keep up, but he couldn't. It was deep and dark inside, and the cave's entrance was narrow, so there was no way to catch her. Outside, Tengu can only be irritated because there was nothing he could do. He slammed his hand against his thigh, his face flushed with regret because he was only few steps away from possessing a great treasure. He walked away with a stick, but his ambition remained. He was well aware that the fox had been seriously injured and would be unable to move. He'll be back the next day. Tingu couldn't sleep that night because he didn't eat anything all day and came home to find no rice left. He felt hungry. On the other hand, he was worried that the fox would be taken away by others, so he kept tossing and turning. Then, before dawn, Tengu carried his stick into the forest in order to hunt down the fox with a beautiful fur. However, on the way to the grave, Tengu happened to notice a small house in the middle of the murky forest. He'd never heard of people living in the forest before. Furthermore, every time he passed by, he didn't see such a house. The house emitted a bright light, and the longer he looked at it, the more he felt an invisible attraction. As a result, the young man approached with curiosity and excitement. Tengu peered through the window to see if anyone was inside. Then his eyes glowed with surprise and lust. At that moment, inside the house, there was a beautiful young woman who was bathing in a tub full of water. Furthermore, the girl, after discovering Tengu, turned her back to perform some seductive actions in order to invite him in. He couldn't say no to this invitation, obviously. Without a doubt, he opened the door and walked into the house. The delinquent rushed over and extended his hand to the young woman, who stood up and covered her body with a towel. His mouth was drooling and his eyes were shining as if he was contemplating a treasure. Tengu was now unable to control his actions. He took off his shirt and embraced the girl. But then, the main door was opened and a group of strange young men who were wielding weapons stormed in. Tengu was quickly subdued by the young boys who tied his hands and feet so tightly that even if he grew wings, he would be unable to flee. After that, they dragged Tengu out into the forest and tied him to a large tree without giving any knowledge of why. It was almost as if everything was pre-planned. Tengu couldn't think much at that point. He could only cry and plead for his life, but to no avail. One of them, who appeared to be enraged, walked over with a large wooden stick, placed it on the criminal's head and growled with wide eyes. He didn't say anything. He raised his stick to gain momentum before slamming Tengu in the shin with a powerful blow. There was a cracking sound as his leg was broken. Tengu's eyes were wide and the sound from his mouth rang out in the forest. He was engulfed in excruciating pain. Tengu had already passed out and by morning, he collapsed as he was still tied to a large tree. Fortunately, a hunter came across him and brought him to the village for treatment. Tengu could no longer walk normally after the night, and he might have to rely on crutches for the rest of his life. Tengu had a feeling his broken leg was related to the red fox. A week later, Tengu decided to return to the forest, to the location where he had seen the strange house to discover the truth. Indeed, when he arrived, the house was nowhere to be found. 
only a group of wild foxes were running around. It seemed that it was possibly the revenge of the fox elf herself. This is a scary story that happened to a doctor named Coco. During her internship at a hospital, she repeatedly encountered horrors. The first time was when Coco and the female head of the department were on duty together during the night shift. It was almost 12 o'clock at night, so the head of the department was feeling hungry. She asked Coco if she wanted something to eat. Coco, also feeling hungry since she only had eaten a bowl of noodles earlier that afternoon. Coco immediately got out of her seat, happily asked the chief doctor what she wanted to eat and decided to go to the convenience store which was opposite to the hospital to buy something. At the first time when she was placed to work at this hospital, Coco did not dare to walk the corridors alone at night because it was very long and dark. The surrounding space was silent. Only the sound of footsteps echoed. It would make people feel frizzy at first, but after time they would get used to it. Coco stepped out of the hospital and slowly crossed the street to see the convenience store right in front of her. Halfway across the street the light from oncoming traffic lights made her feel dizzy. Coco turned her back to look back and realized it was a large bus. The appearance of the bus made Coco feel very strange, because buses like this didn't usually run late at night. Although she was not far away, she could not see the bus properly. The inside was blurry and looked very dim behind the lights. Coco did not care much about it as she quickly walked into the convenience store nearby. After choosing some items to buy, Coco brought them to the checkout counter to pay. The payment was quick and less than 10 minutes. Coco walked out of the store. Standing right opposite the hospital, Coco suddenly saw the blurry bus parking in front of the hospital gate, as if it was waiting for guests. Two minutes later, Coco saw two people walking out from the hospital gate. One was an old man who dressed in a black fabric shirt, the other a young girl who was wearing a crimson red dress. After the two of them got into the vehicle, the bus turned around and drove away. Coco returned to the office. She did not know that there was a bus stop in front of the hospital gate, so she immediately asked the head of the department to confirm this new information. The head of the department also said that there was indeed a bus stop in front of the hospital gate, but it usually finished at 9 o'clock at night. At this point, Coco blurted out what she just witnessed. The head of the department did not believe her. She assumed that Coco was mistaken, because there could not be any buses running at 12 o'clock at night. Coco once again firmly asserted that what she saw was a bus, and that there's no way she could be mistaken in its appearance. When she finished listening to Coco, the head of the department seemed to remember something, and looked like she had a bit of a shock on her face. Coco became aware of this, which sparked more intrigue in her mind as the head doctor's strange expression made her feel subconsciously scared for what's to come. The head doctor didn't explain anything. She suddenly got up and walked out. At the same time, she said that what Coco saw reminded her of something. Seeing the head doctor's strange appearance, Coco could not help but follow her curiously. In the hallway, the head of the department was walking and recalling a month ago. There was a nurse on night duty and she also saw a bus stop in front of the hospital to pick up passengers. The head doctor was suspicious of something. She immediately led Coco to find the nurse who was on night duty and asked if there were any patients who died tonight. The nurse on duty immediately replied that two patients had just passed away. She also felt strange, for some reason as the head doctor took care of the deceased patient. After getting the answer, the head of the department continued to ask for more information about the two dead people. The nurse on duty was surprised and said that the two had just passed away were an old man and a young girl. Due to their critical illness, the hospital was unable to treat them in time. 
Coco was surprised to hear this and immediately confirmed whether the two deceased were a person dressed in black and the other wearing a red dress. Suddenly the nurse next to her was astonished. She wondered how Coco was able to tell what the two deceased patients looked like. The nurse went on to confirm that the two died just as Coco described it. The old man died first. He was dressed in a robe by the family earlier in the hospital. The young girl had suffered a stroke and died two hours later in the red dress she wore before coming to the hospital. Coco was stunned and in dismay for a few minutes when she realized that the two people she saw must have been ghosts. Seeing Coco's unstable expression, the two nurses expressed concern and couldn't help but wonder what happened to her. At this point, the head of the department told the two nurses what Coco had seen. The story shocked the two nurses. They became more and more worried because something similar had happened before. Last month, a night shift nurse accidentally saw a lot of people picked up by a bus at the hospital gate. Later, she found out that they were all dead patients from the hospital. Since then, everyone assumed that it was a bus coming from the underworld to pick up the souls of the dead. The second thing that Coco witnessed happened in the hospital's pediatric department. That night, Coco was on shift duty. In her spare time, she went online to read the news for entertainment. At this moment, Coco suddenly heard a lot of loud footsteps children and laughter in the hallway outside the door. Children were active. They joked and ran loudly in front of Coco's office, which made her feel very strange. It was almost 12 o'clock at night. Usually the kids should have gone to bed already. Out of curiosity, Coco decided to go outside and take a look. She opened the door, leaned forward and looked out. The lights in the corridor were switched on alternate. There were dark and light spaces. Coco looked into the direction where there were footsteps and children's sounds but could not see anyone. Coco turned her head to the opposite direction, still unable to see anyone. She thought she must have misheard something, so she intended to go back into the room and then close the door slowly. However, when Coco was about to close the door shut, from the end of the hall, there suddenly came a burst of children's giggles. Coco immediately stepped out and suddenly saw a figure of a boy running across the corner of the dark corridor. Coco did not think much and quickly chased after the child to see what he was up to. She ran to the end of the hallway and then turned into a dark corner of the hospital. Finally, Coco saw a boy standing by the window. Coco walked over and gently told the boy to go back to the resting room. At the same time, she asked why the boy was not sleeping since it was late. Hearing Coco's question, the boy slowly turned around. It turned out that this was the patient's room 402. The boy suddenly laughed happily, saying that he was playing chase chase with a little girl, so he didn't want to go to bed early. Coco looked back, but did not see a little girl he was talking about and urged him to go back to his room to sleep. Having to go back to the room, the boy expressed regret. Although Coco said that there were no girls here, the boy insisted that the girl next door asked him to go out. Coco wondered and asked him which room he was referring to. The boy immediately responded to information regarding the little girl he had met. There was apparently a child in room 401 with a very cute ponytail. Hearing the boy's description, Coco realized who it was because she had recognized a similar description about this patient earlier. Coco led the boy back to the hospital room and at the same time told him not to go out at night even if someone called. Coco was very worried at this time. She turned her gaze towards the empty hallway as if she was afraid of something. After that, she hurried back to her office. Here, in this place, her chest gradually relaxed the tension and anxiety. The boy's words made her head numb for a moment. Her hands and feet were also covered with goosebumps. Because the little girl in room 401 that the boy described accurately just passed away more than two days ago.
This story happened to a young man named Jusu. After graduating 12th grade, he passed the entrance exam to a university in the city. Living in an unfamiliar place was extremely difficult, but it only took Jusu a few days to settle in. He even made friends with two boys in his dorm and was about to have his first college trip. The trip's location was not far away. In fact, it was just a hill next to the school. As planned, they would camp overnight on the hill. The air on the hill was really fresh. Although the hike up the hill was a bit rough, no one felt tired. However, things were not going smoothly. After walking for a while, they started to get lost. Eventually, they found a small path covered with trees. It looked very murky and mysterious. At the end of the small path lay a cold and lonely grave in the woods. Jusu was basically a child without fear. Seeing that, he invited two of his friends to come for a closer look. At first glance, it definitely looked like a tomb. But the shape of the tomb was really strange. The other two boys only stood there for a few minutes, then left. But Jusu still lingered, standing there, staring at the tomb. But strangely enough, the more he looked, the more he felt some kind of magical energy. This energy completely engrossed him. Then his friend came over, shook his shoulder and called his name loudly. Jusu suddenly woke up, but Jusu's face was still pale and his limbs soft. He was sweating like a waterfall. Not only Jusu's face, but also his friend's faces had deteriorated, as if they had just seen something terrifying. The picnic must stop. But from that day on, strange things kept happening to dorm room 310. The first thing that happened was with Jusu's slippers. He has a habit of neatly arranging his slippers under the bed when he sleeps. But since that night, he was waking up to his slippers dispersed all around his room. Days later, the slippers were still being rearranged all over his dorm. So Jusu decided to talk to his roommates. But their expressions were very strange. One afternoon, Jusu suddenly saw all his roommates packing up, as if they wanted to leave. He thought they must be angry about the trivial matter a few days before and that they decided to move. But looking at their facial expressions, Jusu could tell it was for other reasons. Then, someone new moved in and his old roommates left overnight. But Jusu stayed because he really didn't believe in ghost stories. Until one night. On a normal evening, while reading a book, Jusu fell asleep and was woken up by the dorm's bell. But he just closed his eyes, ignoring it. Five hours passed and it was dinner time. At dinner, the dorm manager didn't see him come down. She was afraid that something was wrong. She ran upstairs to call him. Not believing his eyes, he looked at his watch again. But it was still five o'clock. His watch had stopped working. Even though he panicked a little, Jusu tried to reassure himself that he had just fallen asleep while reading the book. After dinner, Jusu decided to finish reading the book before going to bed. But with only a few lines, he could barely hold his eyes open. His body really couldn't resist sleep. Then he put the book aside turned off the light and went to bed. Suddenly, he woke up at 4 a.m. in a panic as if he had just had a nightmare. Not only that, he had also found himself wearing proper clothes. But from what he remembers, he wore an old t-shirt to bed yesterday. His feet even wore oh. shoes and the shoes were covered with dirt and mud as if he had been walking around for a long time. 
The shoes made his bed muddy. But Jusu really couldn't remember where he went yesterday. He just remembered turning off the lights and going to bed. On the sole of his muddy shoes, there was still fresh grass. So he could tell that he definitely went outside. In order to clarify what happened to him, Jusu decided to find his best friend Ken, who lived in the same dorm before. After school, Jusu secretly followed Ken to the garage. Looking around, seeing no one, Jusu immediately approached his best friend. Then, he suddenly grabbed his neck and pulled him into a hidden corner in the garage. As soon as he saw Jusu, Ken panicked, as if seeing a ghost. Blood drained from his face. After being released by Jusu and knowing the reason for his actions, Ken was able to calm down, but his hands and feet were still shaking. Of course, Ken firmly refused to answer Jusu's questions, only asking him to let go. Seeing that, Jusu began to soften his voice, saying that he really wanted to know what happened after they returned from their picnic. Seeing Jusu's facial expression, Ken started to feel pity. He lowered his face and thought for a long time. Observing Ken's body language, Jusu could tell that something bad had happened to him. Ever since coming to the city, he considered Ken his best friend. But now, when he was in trouble, the only thing Ken was doing was avoiding him. Immediately, his anger erupted. Jusu could no longer keep calm. He grabbed Ken by the collar. Facing Jusu's anger, Ken gave in and finally accepted to speak the truth. It turned out that the strange things started happening after Jusu stood in front of the grave on the school trip. Ken told Jusu that he looked like he was possessed by a ghost. His eyes rolled back and his whole face was pale and mouth grinning wide. He told him that he also started waving his hands and feet and was singing like a crazy man. Ken went on to say that after that day, when the clock hit 12 o'clock, he got out of bed and would sleepwalk around the dorm. Ken said that every night was like that and that Jusu kept pacing back and forth in the bathroom. He said that he kept banging his head against the wall and his mouth muttering something terrifying. Seeing Jusu's unusual behavior, Ken said that all the friends in the dorm were sure he was haunted and then everyone chose to leave for peace. Hearing this, Jusu couldn't control his emotions, giving Ken a strong fist to the face. After that, he left Ken sitting on the ground. Jusu then called his father to tell him everything and got scolded by him. It seemed he knew how scary the tomb was. His face blacked out and with a cold voice, he began to talk about the unknown tomb. Two days later, after receiving the call, the father immediately set off and went to the dormitory where his son was staying. As soon as he arrived, Jusu's father asked to take him to the unknown tomb. Jusu also didn't say anything more. He immediately led his father to the hill next to the school. Jusu's father looked at the anonymous tomb for a long time. His face looked very serious. Then, he sat on the ground and opened the wooden chest he had brought along. It turned out that inside was copper brass. Then, he used this copper brass to burn pieces of votive paper. Soon after, Jusu's father stood up. His mouth began to murmur as if he was reciting a spell. Strangely, as soon as his words ended, the copper brass trembled in a frightening way. Then, the fire in the brass was burning louder and louder, like someone added oil to it. At that same time, the father's face became more serious. It seemed that their request made the soul angry. In that moment, Jusu was clearly terrified thinking that he could be haunted for the rest of his life. The father was also a bit panicked, but still tried to stay calm to reassure him. He put his hand on Juicy's shoulder, 
saying that he would try to ask again. This time, Juicy's father prayed more sincerely. He bent down, clasped his hands respectfully. When the father finished his plead, the fire in the brass immediately shrank. It seemed that the spirit had accepted his appeal. No hurry to leave, after finishing everything, Jusu and his father still lingered to burn the remaining holy paper. Then, they tidied up the ashes, cleaned the tomb, and left. Perhaps Jusu would never forget the horror that happened to him on this strange grave. Afterwards, he also realized how much his father worried about him. Although his face was always calm, his shirt was already drenched in sweat on his back. He also realized that his father's profession was not as bad as he always thought it to be. Although he did not show it much, he really loved his son so much. A few days later, Jusu's life began to settle down again. Perhaps this is why our grandparents often told us not to stay at the grave of the deceased. This horrific story happened 10 years ago, which was in regards to the deathly graveyard where numerous people met their fate. Kata, whom I met in secondary school that year, was a close friend of mine. After school, we decided to explore the graveyard where Kata often heard rumors about it. We both turned a deaf ear to all the rumors about so-called graves and danger in the woods. We played freely, we even took soil from the graves, rounded it up and threw it at each other for fun. It was not until late night that Keita suddenly caught a bad fever. His whole body was aching in cold sweat. Keita's grandma was extremely worried about him. Me and my grandma immediately came to visit him as we heard about his illness. Seeing Keita suffering from a terrible cold, my grandma recalled a story of a boy who was once in his shoes a couple of years ago after he played at that cemetery. She told me that because Keita was a panicky type, he would probably lose his soul, and only his relatives or ancestors could bring it back. Keita's grandma instantly asked my granny how to do it, and she then told us she should be the one to call Keita's soul back. Just for in case, my grandma told my dad to go with Keita's grandma. I sneaked after them to satisfy my curiosity. With a small torch, my dad and Keita's grandma slowly headed off to the abandoned graveyard. Although I had cold feet at first, I still followed them to see what was going to happen. The wood had a freezing wind and a dreary atmosphere that could make any nervous type of person faint. My dad was lighting the path while Kata's grandma consecutively knocked the brass on her hand to awake ravenous souls. Kata's grandma knocked it harder over time and shouted out Kata's name while she was walking towards the churchyard center. Then suddenly, the wind became stronger with a blare hiss. My grandmother assumed that if we called out to the lost soul loud enough, it could hear the relative's voice and follow them back home. I observed this in silence, even though it was terrifying to see Keita's grandma keep hitting the brass in order to entice his soul to follow them back. Surprisingly, Keita was able to get up and was eating away at food as we arrived back home. He ate the dumplings like a horse while consisting of a weird complexion and dribbling sweat. Keita's grandma was on cloud nine to see a beloved grandson regain his self-conscious. She quickly embraced him. Nevertheless, Keita ignored his grandma and insisted on consuming the dumplings. The day after, seeing him in class, I instantly ran to his seat and asked whether he was feeling better. In response, Kata didn't even notice me as he consumed his meal. Regardless of my questions, Kata seemed not to acknowledge me and expressed unpleasantness on his face. During school lunch, Kata finished his meal and then surreptitiously stared at everybody taking out their lunch. Kata sat next to a boy in class. When he saw the boy's cake, his mouth started watering while gazing at the piece of cake. He could not contain his ravenous appetite. 
Keta rushed forwards, attempting to steal the cake. In response, his friend also tried to pull it back. He could not hold in his anger. The boy simultaneously cursed and hit Keita. But it was nonsense. Keita was not only unaffected by this, but also devoured the cake unapologetically. Despite being thrashed, Keita still minded his own business. Keita's strange behavior amazed his friends. When Keita almost finished eating, he was totally out of steam lied down on the ground, gasped for breath, with eyes splashed in that of a red blood color. After a while he continued to crawl on the floor to eat scattered pieces of cake in the presence of everyone. Non-stop. To everyone's amazement he went to every table in class and collected all the lunch boxes around. It was like Keita had been starving for years. He ate relentlessly. In order to address the problem, the principal called Keita's grandma to take him back home. Keita's grandma was extremely freaked out. She took him to the hospital right after. However, the doctor claimed Keita was in a perfectly healthy condition. Not within a day, the rumors had it that a hungry ghost in the wasteland had been mistakenly called instead of Keita's soul. Even right next door, two women gossiped about Keita's story and decided to ostracize him for good. Keita's grandma lost her temper and scolded them for backbiting her beloved grandson in order to protect him. All of them contentiously isolated Keita's grandma, thus pushing her to stranded misery. She tried to stay strong and persistently took care of Keita. She also suspected that she had called the wrong soul. As yet, she hadn't known what to do next. Undoubtedly, Keita gradually became monstrous. He ate unprocessed foods. What's worse, he even stole a live chicken to drink its blood and eat it raw. At this point she knew for sure that she had mistakenly called the hungry demonic spirit at that graveyard, so she had to unwillingly lock him up as the last resort. In the known of Keita's situation, I bring him food every day. Inside the locker Keita huddled pitifully in the corner of a dark room where a little light crept in. All the questions kept popping up in my head. Was that miserable entity possessing Keita? I assured myself that perhaps he was just sick and he would be on the mend soon. But the gore in my sight as Keita turned around frightened the life out of me. He was feasting on a live rat. He glanced at me with bloodshot eyes. I was haunted with a sense of horror. A couple of days later, my grandma told me to visit Keita. She wanted to test holy water in order to expel the demon from his body. Thinking of the recent horrors, I didn't want to stay, but couldn't help but do anything else but go to Keita's home with my grandma as she wished it. As soon as we walked through Keita's door, we suddenly smelled a strong stench which was stinking from inside. Promptly we continued to see what was going on. We navigated the house from top to bottom. It was covered with bloodstains, tracked into a blood red path that led to a corner. I had a bad feeling as we followed the stains. The deeper we went into the house, the more unsavory the smell got. I could not stand the stinky stench of blood, plus the disgusting smell of a decomposing corpse. My head kept spinning around with an overwhelming feeling of throwing up. Next, the terrifying scene was beyond all my imagination. Keita was bent over devouring something. He was tearing his grandma apart while devouring her. Her eyes were still open but blinded white which gave me goosebumps. Keita ignored our presence. He chewed on his grandmother's arm, ripped every piece of meat into his mouth with eyes full of barbarism. He was devouring his own grandma. That's when I realized that the creature over there was no longer Keita. It turned out to be a starving demon. I shouted out in panic. I couldn't stand the gore as my grandma fainted. All the food in the basket was scattered everywhere on the ground. Too afraid, I quickly rushed out calling for help. The villagers quickly came to restrain Keita and locked him up in a closed room tightly tying him up to a chair. Later on, 
that terrible day, Keita was said to have passed away. Yet the information was still unclear. The rumors had it that Keita turned insane as he killed his own grandma. Others said that was because Keita's grandma had mistakenly called out a starving devil from the graveyard. The story has not met its conclusion and left me obsessing over it for the rest of my life. In 2017, one month after graduating from university, I found a job in the right industry in an industrial park. To facilitate work and save money, I chose to rent a place not far from the company. The host took me to see the room. At that time this apartment was occupied by four people and I was the fifth. Although crowded, it still ensured enough comfortable living space. One advantage of renting a single room in an apartment was that I only paid a small amount for the room I lived in but enjoyed ample communal space. The first person I met was Chan. He worked as a security guard in a shopping mall. After the landlord handed over the room, I started to get to know my housemates. Chan was a friendly and cheerful person, so we quickly became friends. Then I asked Chan about the rest. I should say hello to them as well. However, Chan told me not to pay attention to them because they were not very friendly. Then, after a few greetings, I also went into my room. When I stayed for a week, the second person I saw was Kalim. He lived with his girlfriend and was not very friendly with people around. The third person in the house was Ten, a young man three years older than me. He was rather aggressive looking guy, so I didn't dare to interact much. My room was in the middle. On the left, was Chan's room. On the right was Kalim's room. A thin wall separated the rooms, so the sound insulation was poor. So every night I could hear Kalim's loud voice. Every time I couldn't stand it, I hit the wall with my hand to let him know. It was not until late at night that his voice ceased. One time I couldn't sleep. I went to the balcony to smoke and talk with Chan about Kalim's problem. Because Kalim lived with his girlfriend, it was understandable that Kalim was a little noisy. Talking about this, Chan expressed jealousy because Kalim was a lousy person, poor, but had a girlfriend. Despite living in the same house, the strange thing was, but more than half a month had passed, Chan had never seen Kalim's girlfriend. I feel a bit bored because my housemates lived unfriendly with each other. Every day I used to face him whenever I left the room to go to work, but strangely, I never saw his girlfriend at all. However, one time by chance, I saw his girlfriend for the first time. Strictly speaking, I could only see her back through the gap in the door. Discovered by Kalim, he suddenly slammed the door with a furious expression, and he looked at me with a fierce look as if he wanted to eat me alive. His look made me feel a little embarrassed. I immediately avoided his gaze and hurried out the door. That night, something terrible happened to me. I was lying on the phone playing when I suddenly heard Ten shouting in the living room. It seemed that there was a terrible smell outside that made him so angry. I opened the door to the room a little to see what was going on. Ten was still annoyed by the strange foul smell outside. Later, Chan also went out to meet him and asked what was wrong. Ten said that he couldn't stand the stench any longer. Chan also smelled his stench from yesterday, but he thought that maybe someone was repairing the sewers, so the whole building smelled like that. That night, because I felt the need to urinate, I got up to go to the bathroom. I intended not to turn on the lights to avoid disturbing others. Unexpectedly, I saw a girl standing motionless in the toilet. I guessed it was probably Kalim's girlfriend. When I saw the toilet was occupied, I intended to go to my room first and return later. 
But when I took a few steps, I felt something was wrong. I wondered why she didn't turn on the bathroom lights. After that, I heard the sound of water dripping in there. I was curious to see what the girl looked like. The girl was standing in front of the mirror, looking downright strange. My eyes followed the girl's body until I saw a lot of blood flowing in large puddles when I looked down at her feet. I was stunned for a moment and guessed that something scary was happening to her. I was shocked and didn't know what to do when suddenly a voice that called my name startled me. It was Chan. I quickly pointed at the toilet and stammered to him that Kalim's girlfriend was there, her whole body covered in blood. Chan also glanced in surprise at the toilet, but he didn't see anything. After he said that I glanced at the toilet again, it was true that there was no one inside. So how could the girl I just saw disappear so quickly? I was stunned and didn't know what to say, and Chan still purposefully went inside to see if anyone was there. I went in too, but there was no trace inside. Chan said, Maybe because it was dark, you were looking at it wrong. Why was there anyone in here? I got confused and looked at the place where Kalim's girlfriend was standing earlier. It couldn't be an illusion because I was mentally alert. There wasn't a drop of blood on the floor. I had to wonder if I was dazzled. When I was bewildered, Chan suddenly pushed me outside because he also wanted to go to the bathroom. I knew I was not dazzled, but I couldn't find a reasonable explanation for what just happened. After going to the bathroom, I went back to my room and thought for a while before going to sleep. But the following day, I was awakened by 10 screams. He seemed to be very angry with Kalim. I didn't know what happened, so I got dressed and went out to have a look. Outside, Ten angrily banged on the door and called Kalim several times. Even the others were there. I walked over to Chan's back and asked him what had happened. Seeing me, Chan immediately pointed to the ground and showed me the reason. Through the gap in the door, maggots crawled everywhere. Not only that, there was a liquid that looked and smelled extremely bad flowing on the ground. The maggots and the stench made me want to vomit on the spot. The stench was coming from Kalim's room. Ten banged on the door for a while. Kalim finally opened the door and asked what we were up to. Ten put his hand over his nose and angrily rushed in and pushed Kalim down. As soon as the door opened, we immediately saw Kalim's girlfriend sleeping on the bed. The strange thing was that her sleeping position was precisely the same as the one I saw a few days ago. Kalim didn't want us to invade his room, so he loudly kicked us out. Ten didn't care about his attitude. He thought Kalim was dirty and refused to dump garbage, but piled them up somewhere, causing the smelly situation. Chan was trying to search under the bed when he screamed in terror again. At that time, Kalim rushed to shield his girlfriend the purpose of which was not for us to see. I and the others also went to Chan to see what the girl's face was like. It turns out that this Kalim guy was a pervert. He didn't have a girlfriend. It was just a sex doll. Kalim screamed and kicked everyone out for daring to invade his privacy. Then, because he couldn't find anything, Ten led us outside with a slightly mocking expression on Kalim's face. Just as I stepped closer to the wardrobe, the closed door suddenly popped open. Suddenly something fell towards me, startling me. No one would have thought that what had just fallen out of the closet was the corpse of a girl. How horrible! Because I didn't take precautions, I was knocked to the ground by the girl's heavy body. The girl's body was on top of me. Maggots, dirty water from her body splashed all over me. Her body was in the process of rotting and smelling. Her eyes were still wide open, it felt like she was staring at me. I was so scared that my soul flew away. I cried and screamed and pushed her body aside. Seeing me like this, Mr. Ten and Chan quickly pulled me up. At that time, Kalim wanted to run away but was caught by Ten. Knowing that he had killed someone, we immediately called the police. Kalim killed his girlfriend when he heard that she wanted a breakup. 
He purposely used a dummy to pretend to be his girlfriend to cover this up. After that, that story still haunted me, so I had to move to a new place. To this day, I still wondered, was the person I saw in the bathroom the ghost of Kalim's girlfriend? This scary story took place in a rural area where there was a frightening place for the villagers, the shooting range. Every time seeing the children rushing to the edge of the forest, people would immediately guess that another criminal was about to be executed. Children and even adults also pulled together to the edge of the forest to see the wicked being punished. It could be said that the children in this village came here for the primary purpose not to see the execution of criminals, but to pick up shiny bullet casings to bring them back. Among them was a boy named Sun. For some reason, as soon as people looked into his face, his face changed. It turned out that the person who was about to be shot was Sun's neighbor. That girl had grown up with him and was the one who treated him very well. But what he couldn't imagine was, why would such a kind, gentle person be a criminal accused of death? But even if Sun didn't believe it, he had to believe it because in front of him were two policemen, guns in hand and ready to shoot. Moreover, on the wooden plaque worn on the chest of prisoners with their names engraved, how could it be confused? The other sinner was worried, holding her breath, waiting for death as much as Sun was so nervous, his face was blank. He couldn't say a word. And whatever came would come. The gunfire resounded throughout the forest. The birds panicked and flew away, breaking the quiet atmosphere. While Sun stood still thinking, other children, after the gunshots rang out, hurriedly searched for precious bullet casings. One of them, just a few minutes later, was holding a bullet shell in his hand with a happy face loudly boasting to his friends. While the other child happily laughed, Sun, at that time in another corner, did not know what he saw, but his face was extremely strange. It turned out that in front of Sun's eyes was a pink hairpin, but there was no girl here who was brave enough to come and watch the execution. So whose hairpin was this? Out of curiosity, he bent down and carefully brought the clip up to eye level to observe. It looked quite old, like it had been used many times. Thinking for a long time, suddenly Sun's face darkened. If he remembered correctly, it must be the hairpin of the girl who was shot earlier. At that moment, the boy who had just picked up the bullet just now thought that Sun had obtained the bullet and ran to ask. As soon as he saw his friend coming, Sun quickly brought the hairpin to hide behind his back stammering and saying that he still hadn't picked up anything. Seeing Sun's strange appearance, the other child felt a little weird, but didn't care much and followed him back. When the two children got home, the sun had already gone down behind the mountain. After returning home, Sun didn't say anything and went straight to the bedroom. At this time, lying on the bed, Sun immediately brought out the hairpin he had picked up earlier. His eyes filled with tears, thinking about his neighbor. Thinking of this, he immediately put the hairpin under his pillow in memory of the gentle neighbor who used to treat him very well. But it seemed that his hairpin could not bring some beautiful dreams, but instead, strange things. At midnight, Sun's face suddenly turned pale. His breath was panting as if someone was pressing him. Immediately after that were the strange sounds. The more he listened, the more they sounded like a scary moaning, crying sound. Sun's face was getting worse every day. His eyebrows were frowning, he couldn't breathe. Sweat had been dripping all over his shirt ever since. In the distance appeared a figure of a woman approaching. She became more and more visible with a horrifying face, two sunken black eye sockets. Not only that, 
but she stood in front of Sun's bed constantly moaning. Her hand with sharp claws was frequently directed at him. Then the woman rolled her eyes, opened her mouth wide and rushed straight to where Sun was lying. Soon the scary girl's face was close to Sun's, making it harder and harder for him to breathe, his heart racing. Sun tried to struggle with all his strength, shouted loudly and opened his eyes. Hearing the screams of his parents in the next room, they rushed past. As soon as he saw them, Sun hugged his mother and cried. While crying, he kept repeating the words, Ghost! Ghost! With tears in his eyes, Sun told his mother that he had dreamt of their neighbor. Not only that, but she also attacked him. When Sun's mother heard about this, she was very worried, but Sun's father was different. He was extremely angry because he thought that he was talking nonsense. But seeing Sun's face more and more scared every time, the mother thought that maybe there was something hidden behind it. Then the mother leaned down, graciously reassuring Sun and asking about her. Hearing his mother asking about it, Sun did not hide anything, quietly putting his hand under the pillow. Then he took out the hairpin and said that he picked it up at the execution site, and this was what the neighbor had been wearing before she died. After hearing this, Sun's parents' faces darkened, both panicked and were terrified. Sun also said that the ghost kept asking for the hairpin. Knowing that this item belonged to the dead person, if he was not careful, the spirit of the dead would follow him forever. So the mother was extremely angry, yelling at him. Why did he go to pick these things up and take them home? The mother turned to her husband, told him to keep the hairpin and would handle it first thing in the morning. After saying that, Sun's father immediately took the hairpin to go out and his mother gently hugged him and comforted him. Because Sun's mother was uneasy, she sat beside his bed for several hours until he fell asleep. She quietly went out. But unexpectedly, right after she left, Sun had a nightmare. He continued to dream about the neighbor with a horrific face. All that night, Sun's family could not sleep, and every once in a while they heard his panicky screams. One night of terror finally passed. The next morning, as soon as the sun came out, Sun's parents invited the village elder to come help. After hearing the story of a man who had dealt with many demonic affairs like him, he was also amazed. A ghost possesses your son? If this was not resolved soon, he would be taken away by the ghost sooner or later. Because everyone knew that picking up things from the dead is taboo, many people had to die for bringing items home with their soul. Although serious, it was not without a solution, especially for someone as experienced as the village elder. Following the village elder's instructions, Sun's father immediately went to buy some votive paper and took him to the place where the girl was executed yesterday. At that time, the father and son stopped at the place where Sun had picked up the hairpin. As soon as they arrived, they immediately felt a weighty, gloomy atmosphere. Immediately after that, Sun's father took out an old hairpin from his pocket and placed it on the grass in the correct place where it was yesterday. Then they used fire to burn some of the gold coins, muttering incessantly as if begging the ghost to spare Sun. Sun only dared to stand behind his father to observe, but his limbs were also trembling in fear. At that time they could only rely on the heart of the deceased neighbor. They just hoped she could forgive Sun. The father and son had just turned their backs when suddenly Sun felt like a cold wind passed by. Perhaps the ghost of that girl had let go of Sun. The father and son did what the village elder said. Indeed, it worked. From then on, the girl's soul no longer came to disturb Sun.
The story happened with a young couple. After years of hard work, they were finally able to buy a small flat. Teju and Nami wondered why their apartment was very cheap, although it was such a spacious place. Sometimes they had a bit of a weird feeling, but both of them didn't think too much about it. Maybe it's just luck, they said to themselves. When entering their new home, both Teju and Nami had an indescribable feeling. They had never felt so delightful. They hugged each other, talked about their sweet memories and outlined their plans for the future. Teju and Nami sat side by side on the sofa and talked with a lot of passion during the whole afternoon. They forgot to arrange the furniture until it had gotten dark. Then they began to clean the flat and put clothes in the closet. When Teju was checking his suitcase, he heard Nami's call from behind. He turned his head and saw his wife trying on a quality red dress. The dress was found in Nami's wardrobe. Perhaps the previous owner of the apartment had forgotten it. Because the dress looked expensive, they decided to keep the dress instead of throwing it away. What a coincidence. The dress fitted Nami very well, like it was designed for her. That night, after dinner, they went to bed early. It took only five or seven minutes for them to fall asleep because they were tired. At midnight, because of thirst, Teju got out of bed and went to the kitchen. But when he turned to Nami, he couldn't see her. He thought maybe his wife was in the toilet. Approaching the living room, he felt a little strange. There was no light bulb lit. At first, Teju went to the bathroom nearby, but he couldn't find his wife. So he thought that maybe Nami was in the kitchen to drink water because both of them had eaten dry food that night. However, when passing by the mirror, Teju was startled a little bit. He saw a shadow of someone. Maybe it was just a hallucination. He stepped back. Then his heart beat so fast in his chest because he realized the hallucination was a woman in a red dress. Quickly looking at the door, Teju took a relaxed breath when he realized it was his wife, Nami. But her expression at that moment looked very strange. Seeing Nami, Teju moved to her and asked his wife, Why are you still wearing this red dress? It's midnight already. But Nami did not care at all. Her eyes were vague as one who has lost a soul. Therefore, Teju nervously approached his wife and asked her many times what was wrong. Despite what he was saying, Nami didn't open her mouth to say a word. Teju gripped his wife in panic while she suddenly started yelling crazily. After a few minutes, Nami returned to normal. However, her face was a bit bewildered. She didn't know what happened. She wasn't able to remember why she was there, how she did any of it. Even Nami didn't know when she put the red dress on. Teju could not answer Nami's questions either. He assumed that she had been sleepwalking. Hearing that, Nami became even more worried and scared than before. She had never experienced anything like this before. Teju moved closer to comfort his wife. He tried to be calm, but inside he thought there might be something wrong with the house. Because of believing the forgotten red dress was a piece of bad luck, Teju immediately told his wife to take it off and put it aside. Although being worried about the weird dress, they fell asleep very quickly because their bodies were exhausted after a hard day's work. An hour later, Teju woke up again because of a strange feeling in his spine. Teju turned around to embrace his wife to feel more secure, but suddenly his face immediately darkened. For some reason in the dim lit room, Nami's face looked scary. 
Her eyes were wide open to the extreme that her husband could clearly see the blood vessels inside. Looking down at her body, he really panicked when he saw Nami wearing a red dress again. As he couldn't keep calm any longer, he stood up and shouted angrily, but Nami still didn't react at all. In a fit of anger, he lost his temper. He had called out to her many times and she didn't answer, so he patted Nami's head very hard. The pain immediately caused Nami to wake up from her daze. She covered her face with her hands and shouted loudly. At this time, Tejo had calmed down. He softly asked his wife why she put the devil dress on again. But Nami herself could not answer his question. Her face could not hide the fear. Because thinking that all of the trouble was somehow caused by the red dress, the husband rushed to help his wife take it off. Then, Teiji took the dress in silence and got out of their bed with the astonishment of Nami. He was intending to throw it away. If he did that, everything would hopefully go back to normal. In the dark of night, Teju walked alone to the recycle bin near their apartment and dumped the beautiful red dress inside. But Teju was wrong. After he threw away the item that brought bad luck, everything became even worse. After returning to their apartment, both Teju and his wife could not sleep. He sat up and smoked a few cigarettes. Although Teju didn't stop thinking about what had happened, he still tried to be calm to reassure his wife. Hearing the comforting words of her husband, Nami gradually felt more secure. She tried to close her eyes to calm her panic. After Nami fell asleep, Teju smoked a few more cigarettes. Although thinking carefully about what they had experienced, Teju still couldn't understand it. At the time Teju decided to take a rest, his wife suddenly jumped up from the bed. He turned to his wife and asked, Why don't you sleep? Is something wrong again? Unlike the previous time, Nami immediately replied to his question, but it was a completely unfamiliar voice. His whole body was frozen, his heart beat fast and his mouth stammered a few harsh words. He was both scared and worried about his wife. Before Teju finished the sentence, the woman turned to him again. She growled and shouted angrily at him. Why did you throw my dress away? Taiju thought this time might be the same as the previous times, so he shouted loudly to wake his wife up. But Nami didn't care at all. She paced about the bedroom and rummaged around to find the dress like a mad woman. After watching everything, Teju sneaked up to her and hugged her in his arms tightly. But without him doing anything fierce, she slapped him across the face very hard. Because of the unexpected blow, Teju couldn't dodge it. As a result, he lost a tooth for what he had done. While he was still struggling to get up, Nami opened the door and rushed out. From that moment, Teju could confirm that she was not his wife at all. A few seconds after she left, Teju also tried to get up and chase after her as he feared that something bad would happen. She was gliding across the floor like a water puppet, which was different from a human being. After walking about 10 meters, the woman suddenly stopped and looked up at the sky. She then fell to the ground. Her body seemed to lose all strength. Teju hurriedly ran to Nami, lifting her head up and held loudly. No matter how hard he tried, she still didn't wake up. Later that night, he called an ambulance for his wife. Nami was unconscious for the whole of the next day until that night when she finally woke up. After Teju's wife overcame the critical condition, he could not hide his happiness. He totally forgot about the incident on the previous day. But when Nami woke up, she seemed lost in a daydream in which she couldn't remember what had happened. Nami's memories were like a broken tape. 
she didn't remember anything about her sleepwalking and the actions the day before. The more she listened to Teju's story, the more she felt tormented. She feared that she would hurt her husband again. Not only Nami, but also Teju felt very troubled because the doctor said that she did not have the symptoms of sleepwalking or any other problems. Then he decided to go in to meet the previous owner of the apartment. Teju couldn't keep calm when he told his story and what he had experienced in the haunted flat. But the previous owner still insisted that his apartment had no problems whatsoever. The previous owner's explanation could not convince Teju, so the next day he decided to move them to another place. Until now, although living in a better apartment, Teju still had trouble sleeping every night because of the incident haunting him. Whenever he couldn't sleep, he would go online to find out more about his old apartment as well as the red dress. The truth was that a long time ago, a woman was betrayed by her husband. So she hanged herself in that very apartment. Since then, everyone who was living in the apartment would see the red dress. However, no one could stay for more than a total of three days. It began in a small northeastern mountainous village where old marriage practices were still in existence. Sumi was a beautiful girl who was blessed with great talents. Needless to say, the girl always got involved with the village men flirting with her. But they all shook their heads in boredom and quit as soon as they heard about the bride token. Those who wanted to marry the girl must be born from a wealthy and noble family. Only that way could they get the nod of approval. The bride token was up to 20 ounces of gold. Jiro, a young man who came from a deprived background, was told he'd never have the chance to marry the girl. In the village, there was also a young man named Kento, who was head over heels in love with Sumi. This man was not poor at all. But since the bride price was so expensive, everybody told him to give up. Despite being advised by his friends, the man still became agitated and walked away as they didn't support him marrying Sumi. In order to have Sumi, Kento made a promise to himself that he would get rich. He did everything to build relationships and make friends in high places. Now, as Kento had made a fortune for himself, he utilized his relationships to blind the ones in power as he contracted the wild mountainous area which was located 30 kilometers away from his village. Ever since that day, large trucks were seen consecutively commuting to the area on a daily basis as they exploited the soil, stone and wood to depletion. After three years of being involved in illegal activities, the man eventually became affluent Kento couldn't be more confident upon the day he returned home. He quickly went to see his friends, asking about Sumi. Kento told them that he had become a billionaire. Since money was no longer an issue, he returned to propose to Sumi. His friends immediately said the bride token had been five times bigger compared to that three years ago. But the calm expression was still on his face as he showed them a thick cowhide bag while letting out a smirk. About Jiro, the poor guy, after a long period of time of hard work, the man ended up saving a great amount of money to marry Sumi. However, Sumi's mother bluntly refused, saying that it was the story of three years ago, and now as her daughter was in the age of getting married, considering how many families wanted to have her as their daughter-in-law, this amount of money Jiro had was inadequate. The woman didn't even let him finish his third sentence as she kicked him out of the house and threw his money onto the ground. 
Not knowing what to do, Jiro picked up each and every precious coin then left. He couldn't hide the sorrow on his face. At that time, Jiro was still hoping that he would marry Sumi, but the thought instantly faded away when he saw Kento approaching Sumi's house. The man couldn't do anything under the circumstances, neither did he have any money nor power to get in Kento's way. And what goes around comes around. Kento paid the bride wealth to the family and finally had Sumi as his wife. A couple of days later fireworks went off as a grand wedding took place. The whole village was prevailed with an uproarious atmosphere. Cars were placed bumper to bumper while everyone was eager to witness the wedding of the rich. According to traditional conceptions, children must be completely obedient to their parents, thus Sumi had to obey them. She reluctantly married Kento. After the grand wedding to Sumi, marriage life was truly a hell on earth. Kento unexpectedly turned out to be a brute. Since Sumi was always in a gloomy mood, she often got beaten by Kento, but the woman couldn't do anything but held her tears and suffered. One day as Sumi returned home from the market, she encountered Jiro. At that moment she could only greet him from afar, then continued to go home. Unfortunately her actions were seen by her husband, Kento. Being filled up with jealousy, the man intended to harm Jiro. That afternoon Kento went to see Jiro and offered him a job at his quarry. Jiro immediately agreed and rejoiced as he was in need of earning money to pay his way. Two days into Jiro's work at the quarry, many police cars were seen passing through the village. According to the two workers who worked at the quarry, they coincidentally found out a corpse after their shift. The two were frightened as occupational accidents often happened at this mine. The dead man was believed to fall from a mountain slope and had his body pierced with a sharp rock. One side of the face was completely deformed, but one could still recognize it and knew that it was Jiro. Having no relatives, Jiro had his funeral conducted poorly while his body was buried in the forest. That day after Jiro's funeral, Kento quickly returned home. The man panicked as soon as he opened the door. There was a figure of a man appearing before his eyes as it slowly walked into his house. The shadow also looked identical to that of Jiro. It suddenly vanished after Kento rubbed his eyes. He took a deep breath then carefully walked into the house. Kento asked his wife if she saw anyone coming in, but she merely shook her head and said no. The man stayed up through the whole night as he was filled with great fear. As the night progressed he could not sleep as he felt guilty with the horrific crimes he had done. The next morning Kento brought a lot of money to a shaman in the village, asking for help. The shaman didn't care about anything but money. He told Kento to use dog blood and spill it on Jiro's grave. Only after using it would the calamity be over. Dog blood would trap Jiro's soul, making it unable to escape from the grave. Kento immediately went to a dog slaughterhouse to buy blood. The owner brought out a bucket that was filled with dog blood to Kento. After getting what he needed, the brutal murderer went into the forest searching for the spot where Jiro was buried. Without hesitation, he poured the bucket of blood over Jiro's grave, causing it to be covered in red. Kento didn't even have a twitch of guilt as he put on a sadistic smile. The blood spread it all over the grave and then absorbed into the sand. In no time the grave was completely covered with blood. Afterwards the man calmly returned home. Despite having committed another crime, Kento felt no remorse as he acted like nothing had happened. That night the man could finally sleep well. As it struck midnight, Kento suddenly felt like there was something like a hand touching his face. All of a sudden the room was filled with a stench which awoken him instantly. But as soon as he got up, he was scared to death by the thing he saw as he screamed in panic. The man gasped in horror seeing the horrific scene right next to him. It was not Sumi who was lying next to him. 
Instead, it was Jiro with a creepy looking face that was badly deformed. Jiro's face was covered with blood. He looked at Kento whilst putting on a ghostly smile. <laughs> Kento tried to regain his composure. He rubbed his eyes constantly and then saw Sumi's face again. Seeing the scared and anxious look on Kento's face, Sumi wondered what had happened to him. Kento recounted the scary incident to Sumi, but she seemingly didn't believe it as she thought it was probably him having nightmares, hence ignoring him and continuing with her sleep. Kento really wanted to have an explanation, but was soon afraid that Sumi would find out he was the one that killed Jiro. Unable to share with anyone, Kento went out for a walk to reassure himself. However, as the man was still in bewilderment, a series of bizarre things continued to happen in the restroom. As Kento was smoking cigarettes, he suddenly noticed a shadow passing by the wall, which instantly caught his attention. As the man looked up, he was startled by the thing in front of him, as he let out a fierce scream. Out of nowhere, a demon covered in blood appeared on the stone wall. It rushed towards Kento while reaching his hands to him. Having no time to think, Kento pulled up his pants and ran for his life. The blood-covered demon turned its gaze at Kento. It seemed like it was Jiro who had transformed into a devil to take revenge on him. Hearing the scream outside, Sumi got out of bed and rushed outside to check, only to find out that Kento was gripped by fear. Kento told his wife that there was a demon chasing him, but when Sumi looked around, there was no one in sight. Sumi had a premonition that her husband was trying to hide something. She asked Kento if he had committed any wrongdoing. The utter silence took over the place. Kento didn't burst a single word then stumbled into the house. Ever since that night there wasn't a day gone by without Kento feeling insecure and anxious. The man had an impression that the demon was still there, watching his every move. Feeling scared, Kento locked himself in the room not eating anything and soon became emaciated. Being haunted with his sins, Kento was always in a state of fear, which gradually drove him crazy. Being unable to put up with misery, Sumi made an escape, eventually freeing herself from a brutal husband. It was not until a year later that Kento appeared at the police station. The man gave himself up to the police as he admitted all the crimes he had committed and confessed it was him who pushed Jiro off the cliff. About Sumi, she moved to the city a few years later and got engaged with a man whose face was identical with that of Jiro. As I remember, this story began when I was only 7 or 8 years old. Back in my village, I used to play with Ben and Leo because not only were their houses next to mine, but we also got along very well. We often played by a pond, which was at the far end of the village, near the edge of the forest. One day, as soon as we got to the pond, we heard strange sounds coming from it and we saw a lot of frogs, so we walked closer. Since we were young, we decided to throw stones at them. Watching the frightened frogs jump away, we laughed excitedly. Meanwhile, Ben was looking at something below the water. Maybe because he didn't want to play our boring game. When I tried to throw a stone again, Ben told me to stop. He thought he saw a big fish underneath the water. When we looked down into the pond, we saw a fish swimming around, a big strange rock. It was the first time we saw this fish, 
or any fish for that matter. So we decided to get into the pond to take a closer look. But while we were about to jump into the pond, it suddenly started to rain, heavily. We were all surprised, because the day had quickly turned from a nice sunny day into a dark stormy one. So we decided to run straight back home. That whole day, the rain kept falling. We stayed inside, for we couldn't do anything else in that weather. After the rain had passed, the air became cleaner. So, we started our day as usual. Strangely, we felt uneasy, which seldom happened to us. The first person to get that feeling was Leo. He mentioned that he had a nightmare the previous night. Bin was next to comment about last night's dream. He made a serious and then awkward face. He'd also had a nightmare that night. Leo believed that these bad dreams were because of the rain soaking us by the pond. But Bin disagreed. He stared into space with a blank expression. Then he said, I dreamt of ghosts. It felt very real. I turned to look at Bin to ask him more about his nightmare. He quickly narrated what he had experienced in his dream the previous night. While trying to sleep, he got the urge to go to the bathroom. Half asleep, he got out of bed and went straight into the bathroom. Suddenly, as he reached for the toilet door, he felt a cold wind rush through his body. Ben was astonished when he saw what appeared to be a person coming out of the toilet. The person appeared gradually and became more visible. Ben panicked and shouted in horror. It was himself or someone that looked like him. He froze in shock and was sure this would be the day he died. As he continued to observe the surreal event, the shadow walked past him. And, as it did, he felt clearly the eeriness and coldness coming from that weird entity. Then, slowly, the shadow moved into Ben's bedroom. He panicked and his face turned pale from the fright. Composing himself, he decided to use the toilet first. Maybe it was just an hallucination, he thought. The next morning, before going to school, he wondered whether he should tell his parents what he had witnessed the night before. After thinking for a while, he decided to tell his parents about this figure that appeared in his bedroom last night. When his mother heard the story, she looked annoyed. She said, Ben, you have watched too many horror movies. You are obsessed with them. Discouraged and unconvinced, he then said goodbye to his mother and went to school. After Ben had finished telling his story to us, I wondered why I didn't see anything strange like that. We were so caught up in our conversation that we didn't realize we had arrived at school already. That day at school was a tough one. I couldn't stop thinking about Ben's story. It was just so weird. During class, he kept yawning and falling asleep. He showed signs of sleep deprivation. In the late afternoon, the three of us were on our way back home after school. On the way home, we met a woman who was holding a little boy in her arms. As soon as the boy saw us, he pointed at Bin and cried out loud. Startled, we looked at the little boy, then quickly looked at Bin, in confusion. I wondered why the child had looked at my friend and screamed. But Leo chuckled and patted Bin's shoulder. He said that maybe Bin's face was too fierce, and this had probably scared the child to tears. On the way home that day, we had to cross an alley 
It was quite empty. Suddenly, a dog jumped out and barked at us. He stared at Ben and growled. His eyes turned red and looked very ferocious. We became frightened. Our faces turned pale. We didn't know what to do. At that moment, I shouted, run. So we immediately ran as fast as possible. After that day, Leo and I came back to check the dog out again. It was clear that the strange dog was only barking at Ben and he didn't behave the same way when we went back. I knew Ben seemed to realize that too. His face expressed obvious concern. The next day, we ran straight to the pond which we had visited the day before. The place looked different after the rain. The air was cooler and clearer this time. When I looked at the bank of the pond, I was surprised. It seemed like something had changed. I pointed to the water and told my friends about it. Under the water, the rocks, which we had seen the day before, were gone. Instead, large pieces of wood, which had probably come from the bottom of the pond, were floating. Maybe yesterday's rain caused the water in the pond to rise up. Suddenly, Ben called us and pointed towards something which was drifting in the water. I turned back to see what it was. It was an old, damp piece of wood. There were two frogs sitting on it. They reminded us about the frogs that had been on the rocks the day before. Then Ben asked Leo to help him explore the piece of wood with him. Why had it appeared near this pond? They jumped on it. Then they imagined they were on a boat and started using a long branch as a paddle to row. Ben asked me to join them. He looked very enthusiastic. They immediately took the other branch to push their boat away from the bank. Suddenly, the boat turned and leaned to one side, which caused Ben to fall into the water. Leo was also startled and couldn't keep his balance, so fell too. While watching, I panicked. I saw Leo swim up from the water. His body was all wet. He tried to cling onto a piece of wood in front of him and gasped for breath. It was very hard for me to pull Leo out of the pond, but at last I did. Normally, this pond was quite shallow. Why did it seem so deep that day? Leo choked on water but managed to tell me that he couldn't see Ben anywhere. I ran towards the pond and called for Ben in panic, but the water was very calm, as if nothing had happened just moments before. Everyone in the village went to this pond together to look for Ben after hearing the commotion. This pond was very shallow now, and strangely, not a trace of Ben could be found. The big piece of wood was also brought out of the pond, some soil was still stuck to it. The log was mouldy and slippery, and it seemed that was why they slipped. The villagers decided to bring pumps. They plugged the pipe to suck up all the water in the pond. There were about three or four pumps which worked at full capacity until the job was done. It took more than half a day for all the pumps to drain the water. Once drained, at the bottom of the pond, people found a large wooden coffin. All the villagers were instantly terrified. The coffin was upside down, but people realized immediately that the piece of wood was the lid of the coffin. Some strong young men stepped forward and used their strength to turn the coffin up. However, because of the dirt stuck to it on the bottom, it was extremely difficult to lift. After a while, they managed to overturn the coffin to its side. Everyone panicked because there was a body inside that resembled one of a child. I saw then that it was my friend, Bin. 
Everyone looked at each other with tearful eyes. It turned out that the reason why Bin's body did not emerge was because it was stuck in this coffin. No one knows how it happened, but many can imagine that it must have been something terrible and supernatural that held him down. After Ben's demise, everyone immediately spread the word and no one dared to come to this pond ever again. It later turned into a large trash hole. This story happened 10 years ago when I was just a kid and lived with my parents in the countryside. At that time my village had an old two-story house. If it hadn't been abandoned, it would have been the biggest house there. Every time I was passing by that house, it always strangely motivated me, like someone inside was inviting me to enter. This house was always locked up with a big chain. The windows were covered fully with plywood boards. That summer, I had a long vacation. The other kids and I had the opportunity to cause all kinds of mischief. After doing some odd chores in the house, at noon I asked my paternal grandmother if I could go out to the field to play with my friends. At first it seemed that she didn't want to let me go, so I persuaded her for a while. In the end, she agreed. But I had to go home before sunset, and she also carefully told me that I must stay away from that abandoned two-story house. At the center of the village, Chin and Sue were waiting for me. Seeing me, the two of them happily invited me to play hide and seek. As we played under the blazing sun, the three of us were full of sweat and smelled quite bad. Sue suggested going home to shower and then meet again at night. But Chin still wanted to play. At that moment the three of us were passing by the abandoned house. The two of them dared each other to go inside the house to explore because they so rarely had the opportunity to hide from the adults and their control over us visiting places like this. At first I was a bit hesitant because I remembered my grandma's commands but I didn't want to be left alone, so I rushed in after them. They slowly approached the abandoned house, then peered through the gaps between the wooden boards. They were acting like actual professional spies, despite the weather and the hot summer heat. From the outside, they saw a dark interior full of cobwebs and dust. Surrounded by the smell of wood mixed with the smell of mildew, which was extremely unpleasant. Then the two of them disapproved the house disappointedly because they couldn't find anything interesting. At that moment the chain lock on the door for some reason suddenly broke off and fell to the ground. Sue reacted extremely excited and quickly approached the door grabbing the chain and shouting God help us guys! After that Sue softly opened the door and slowly entered. I too slowly followed but my body couldn't stop trembling from fear and anticipation. The air in the house was quite cold and smelly. A stench, like a heavy smell of animal fat, made us all feel nauseous. In the middle of the room a slimy patch of black water appeared. It was like animal fat mixed with kerosene or something. We tried to get our feet up high, step by step slowly and carefully avoiding the liquid clinging to us. Unexpectedly a cold wind blew back from the inside of the house causing the main door to slam shut. Sue and I dreadfully rushed to the wooden door using strong force but unable to open it. Now, when we looked back down on the ground, the two of us were really shocked to see that the chain which was broken now was somehow whole again. Meanwhile, inside the house, a burning smell came from somewhere. I involuntarily turned around and saw a fire burning into what seemed like animal fat. We watched the fire grow larger and gradually we started feeling scared. 
Su and Chin shouted and then banged on the door loudly, but the door did not move a bit. Then we tried to pry open the plywood at the door, but we did not get any good results until finally, at this point, Chin desperately suggested that we all run upstairs and find a place to escape. Although I didn't want to, this was the only way. We all tried to squeeze away from the hot sparks, hurrying up the stairs to reach the upper floor. Upstairs, the smoke was already dense. The higher we went, the stronger the stench was. Black animal fat covered the whole wall. The indoor air was getting less and less. Despite the difficulty to breathe and tired bodies, we still had to force ourselves to climb. But when we started climbing, a horrific thing appeared. Perhaps this was also the mystery that the adults in the village had been hiding from everyone for a long time. There was a monster whose body was covered with black animal fat that was stuck to a wall. When it heard our screams, knowing about our presence, the monster immediately used all its strength to tear itself free, bringing along splashes of dark blood. We panicked and ran downstairs. However, another monster appeared downstairs, which was crawling upwards towards us. This monster lay flat on the ground, raising its long black arms as if trying to grab us. We stood blankly in the middle of the stairs. From behind us, the fat monster was quickly rushing to grab Chin's neck. The monster waiting in ambush below then reached out to grab Sue's right ankle. Only I was lucky and safe at that moment. However, before we got our fighting spirits up, two or three other monsters appeared below. So I took up the courage to launch a pulse upwards past Chin and the monster which was hugging his neck tightly. The whole hallway was now engulfed by darkness and white smoke. Concerned about the two of my friends, I paused slightly, turned around and examined it. Then I saw both Sue and Chin at this time turning into monsters and no longer mastering their actions anymore. I had no choice, so I quickly turned around and rushed forwards, running while panicking and crying loudly. At that moment, another monster appeared right in front of me, blocking the way. But strangely, this monster just stood there. Then it screamed a few sounds that made the bricks on the ceiling fall down in pieces. I was scared, rushing into a nearby room to escape. In the room, there was a large window which was covered by plywood panels, but a patch was broken enough to reveal light rays from outside. Now the monster was standing right at the door. With no other choice left, I jumped and slipped through the tiny opening. As soon as I peeked out, I encountered a new obstacle. I suddenly realized that I was on the second floor of the house. But looking inside, the greasy monster was already getting closer to me. Somehow the black grease on the monster's body dripped down, revealing a man's gentle face. I was so scared that I lost momentum and fell from the second floor of the building onto the ground. Luckily there was a large heap of straw below me. I fell with my back hitting the straw and then passed out in fear. After that I did not remember anything. When I woke up I found that I was in the hospital, surrounded by parents and my grandma. Nobody said anything but I knew how worried they were. At that time, hearing the loud noises, people ran over and found me lying unconscious on the straw with Sue and Chin lying on the stairs full of animal fat. I told my mother and grandma everything. My grandma willingly took the opportunity to also tell me about the legend of this abandoned house. In the past, there was a man who came here from the city to open a factory producing animal fat. Employees were locked in the house by their bosses to focus on their work. Unexpectedly, one day a fire broke out. The fire was so swift because it was fueled by the animal fat and quickly burned down the entire building with the workers inside. After that, the owner also left to another place and the house was abandoned until now. Because no one wanted to disturb the unfortunate dead, the house has never been removed and existed until now.
This horror story took place in a dormitory. Our story begins with a student named Akio. Moving into her new dormitory, a place she would be living with three other students for the duration of her four years of college. Aiko was quick to notice that one of the girls was quite unlike the others. Whereas the others seemed joyful and friendly, this girl seemed cold and distant, and she never looked away from the book she was reading. Aiko soon learned she had moved into room 1304, a room known for its troubled and disturbing past. Aiko spent the rest of the day unaware of the events that would unfold. And so, on her first night, something strange occurred. Aiko was taking a bath when suddenly she heard a loud knocking on the bathroom door. She stood there for a second and remembered that the two girls had gone out, so it couldn't have been either of them. As she continued to think, the knocking began again. At this point, she froze. Then it hit her. It must be Tani, that cold, weird girl, she thought. She cracked the door open and yelled at her to stop. But Tani did not respond. Not that Aiko cared much, as the knocking had stopped. Although, it wasn't long until the knocking started again. As annoyed as she could be, she put on her shirt, wrapped her half-washed hair in a towel, and went out to put an end to it. To Aiko's surprise, there was no one in the room. All she could feel was a dim, cold breeze. Aiko tried hard to reassure herself that this was nothing but a weird occurrence, but the fear could not stop creeping in on her. She gathered up the courage and went out to the hallway, but just like her dorm, it was empty and dark. She rushed back in and quickly closed the door. She was starting to shake. The thought of the supernatural never occurred to her. She only worried about being stalked by a pervert and wanted to stay safe. A few moments passed and Akio started to calm down, but not enough. The knocking started again. Aiko took a deep breath and slowly opened the door. This time, there was a woman standing in front of her, soaking wet. Akio screamed in shock, and then she realized it was Tani, her quiet roommate. Akio, relieved, asked Tani when she went out and why she was wet, but Tani did not say a word. Regardless, she felt sorry for her roommate, and after all, she was standing there dirty, wet, her face as pale as the moon, and with an expression that lacked confidence. She put aside the annoyance of her silence and decided to care for Tani. She had Tani sit on the bed and went to get a towel to help her dry herself. She patiently waited until Tani had calmed down and with a soft and delicate tone asked her what had happened, but Tani did not speak. Frustrated, Akio told her that if she did not want to talk that she would have to go get the dorm manager. This seemed to have worked. Tani finally spoke up. Her voice was trembling as she said that something had happened to her mother. As soon as she finished speaking, Tani, as if remembering something, stood up and walked towards her desk. Then she looked through the drawer. She was looking for something. Tani was looking for her phone. She was starting to look desperate, searching. Tani rummaged for a while, but couldn't find it. She turned to Akio and asked to borrow her phone. She then proceeded to tell her story. She had come this morning with her mother from the countryside to enroll at the school. That morning, they had to hastily leave their home as there weren't any other trains leaving that day. Her mother wanted to stay with Tani for a few days to help her get settled, but she had to leave that same day as she had two younger children that needed to be taken care of at home. She kept on going about her family's story. She lost her father at a young age, which brought a big burden to her mother. She wanted to help her, get a job and support the family, but her mother refused. Aiko just stood there, tense and uncomfortable, and she did not understand what was going on. Tani then continued, she had gone out to buy groceries when she saw on the news that a train had derailed and sank into the river. She immediately thought of her mother. As soon as she said that, Akio pulled out her phone. Throughout all of this, Akio was confused and shocked that she knew she needed to help Tani make a call. So, she called the number that Tani gave her. 
but no one answered. Thinking that maybe Tani had read the wrong number, Akio gave the phone to her and asked her to try again. Tani was obviously in distress. She was shaking and her eyes were welling up. But once again, no one answered. The worry and fear could no longer be held. Tani cried loudly. Tears kept flowing down from her cheeks as she kept on crying for her mom. Akio tried hard to keep herself together, even though she was panicking inside. She tried to calm her roommate down. Keeping her posture and thinking quickly, Akio suggested they should go and check at her home for themselves. Tani was quick to reject the offer. She wanted to go alone. Before Akio could react, Tani stood up and left, but not before looking at her in the eyes and saying thank you. Akio refused to let her go on her own in such a state, but it was pointless. She was gone. Tani was so fast that by the time Akio went out to the door, Tani was already at the end of the hallway. She just stood there as her figure disappeared into the distance. Akio stood at the door for a moment, which felt like an eternity, observing everything, trying to make sense of things. She was shocked to the point of losing control of her limbs. She could barely stand in place. She was panicking and trying to tell herself that this must be a mistake or a bad dream. The next morning, Akio went rushing to see the manager. She wanted to ask about Tani's contact information. Once there, she asked for her, but the manager looked confused. He told her that she must have gone to the wrong dorm because there wasn't a Tani registered there. As soon as she heard that, her face went dark. The possibility of having met a ghost crossed her mind. As she was walking down the hall, lost in thought, she met one of her roommates. Akio wanted to leave no trace of doubt, so she asked her about Tani. The question, in turn, made her roommate almost faint. As it turns out, Tani had been a student living in room 1304 until she died in a train accident five years ago. She told Akio that ever since that day, people have seen strange shadows in that dorm, and more than one had suggested it was Tani. By now, Akio could just not hold it together anymore. The pain, stress, and fear were just too much. She broke in tears. She was putting together all the pieces of the events from the last 24 hours. Everything pointed towards one explanation. Could it be that she had met a ghost the night before? The thoughts were too much. She broke down, shaking and crying, until she passed out of exhaustion. A few days passed, Akio had managed to assimilate what had happened and decided to take the train to Tani's home. She arrived at what was now an abandoned house. Inside of it, there was a photo of Tani's mom. As it turns out, Tani's mother had also passed away just a day after her daughter. She couldn't bear the pain and sorrow of losing a child. On her way out, she stumbled upon a tomb, engraved in it were the names of Tani and her mother. She thought how strange it was to have them both buried in the same tomb. Tani's two other siblings ended up being adopted by the uncle. On her way home, Akio could not stop thinking about the mother and the daughter. She felt an incredible sorrow for these two. Who knows, maybe your roommate will turn out to be a ghost as well. And if that's the case, make sure you tell us the story. I was only 16 years old back then. The mad old man and his strange stories are what I missed the most about the small village. He used to obstruct our path and claim that on the forbidden mountain lurked a cannibal fox, hungry for our flesh. He was just so annoying to me. Although I was curious about the mountain and the story of the crazy man, I thought it was nonsense at that time, but then something happened that completely altered my perspective. I was unlucky enough to be caught by the supervisor while fighting with Kento that time. We were fined for composing a hundred page self-critique statement. Of course, a few sheets of paper are insufficient to resolve the inconsistencies between two children. 
I recall Kentu throwing a note to me at 10pm on the Forbidden Mountain for a battle while I was writing the review. So as I promised to Kento, I snuck out after my parents were fast asleep to go to the rendezvous location. Because I was afraid of being seen, I chose a smaller, quieter path to take, and the only thing I had with me was a flashlight. Despite the fact that the night was dark and there was no light and the forest was deserted, I walked inside without hesitation. After walking for a while, I noticed a ray of light shining directly at me. Then there were the terrifying growls. My heart was racing and cold sweat was dripping from my brow. However, such a brave child as myself was able to regain his composure very quickly. After calming down, I began looking around with my flashlight. Then I discovered that ahead of me was a deep abyss that could not be traversed any further. At that moment, the growling resounded once more. I quickly flashed the light at the source of the noise, but my heart was racing with fear. That ray of light reappeared beneath the dense forest with a strange attraction. I had no idea why, but I was curious as to what it was. With that in mind, I stretched my muscles and prepared to chase the light. While I was distracted, that ray of light that had somehow gotten closer. Fearlessly, I pointed my finger in that direction and exclaimed, You! Step back for me! However, after my yell, that light not only didn't stop, but also fled. Of course, I immediately pursued with ferocious zeal. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure why I did it. I ran as fast as I could, sweat pouring down my sleeve, but I couldn't keep up. When I came to a halt, I found myself in a strange location with no one around. Not only that, the surrounding air was also strangely murky and cold. Fortunately, after walking for a while, I discovered a lot of lights. Thinking it was the light from the village, I dashed over without a second's hesitation. But as I got closer, I noticed a lovely scene with lanterns and cherry blossom petals blowing in the wind. Despite the fact that it was a strange world, I couldn't figure out why this place felt so familiar to me. Instead of returning to the same road, I continued forward and came across a large steely blocking in the middle of the road. There were strange words written on the stele, and even though I tried to read them, I couldn't figure out what they meant. I then walked around the stele, taking few more steps. I became enthralled by the scenery ahead. What was in front of me was like a peach blossom party from one of my grandmother's fairy tales, with fairies and elders dressed in traditional attire. Curiosity compelled me to go inside once more, but unexpectedly, the small sound of my footsteps drew the attention of everyone at the party. Everyone was staring at me with a pale face and strangely frightening soulless eyes. That made me a bit nervous. Sweat began to form on my brow, and my heart pounded with anxiety. At that precise moment, a warm voice rang out. The person speaking to me was a man with a striking appearance and eyes that seemed to contain a strangely appealing light. I didn't have time wow. to react when I found myself sitting at the banquet table with such a feast in front of me. Even though I hadn't fully recovered consciousness, the man sitting next to me put his arm around my shoulders and invited me to join him for a drink. I've never had an alcoholic beverage before. Right now, the situation was awkward. I couldn't drink, but couldn't refuse either. While I was hesitating, unsure what to do, the woman in front of me spoke up. She provoked me to drink. The woman's provocation instantly piqued the pride of a fearless adolescent like me, so I drained the entire glass of wine in my hand. However, the taste of this wine was strange, not as tasty as my father used to say. It had a particularly unpleasant odor. Everyone burst out laughing when they saw my reaction. I stood up and left the table, embarrassed and angry. 
Despite the fact that the woman made me lose face, I had the impression she was very familiar. Instead of leaving, I returned to borrow the phone from that group in order to call my family. When I turned around, I noticed a woman sitting in her seat, happily chatting with the young man next to her. But it was the trekking backpack beside them that drew my attention, not the two of them. There were bloodstain-like red marks on the backpack. They must have encountered some difficulties along the way. As I stared at those red marks, a thought occurred to me. That's right. Her. Exactly that face. That woman was featured in the news a few days ago. According to the station's information, she died while climbing the mountain with a group of friends. So what's the deal? As I witnessed a terrifying scene in front of me, my face darkened and my lips burst tightly, trying not to scream. The food on the table had turned to stone, insects and even maggots, and it was disgusting. And the two normal people had now transformed into two dry skeletons dressed in rags. I started vomiting after seeing the scene in front of me and recalling the glass of wine I had earlier. A hand with a towel and a warm voice appeared again at that moment. Are you alright boy? Because I saw a human hand, I accepted the towel with ease. But when I looked up, I was so terrified that my face turned pale. There was now no delicate face in front of me with lovely eyes, but a fox in human form. Terrified, I pushed him aside immediately and ran away with all my strength. There also disappeared the beautiful scenery of the lamps and cherry blossoms, replaced by an odd and gloomy cold. I was afraid. My legs didn't stop running. I closed my eyes while running and prayed quietly. Unfortunately, I trickled over a big tree root because it was night and in the dense forest. <gasps> I rushed forward disorientated and crashed my head into a nearby tree. I couldn't remember anything after that. I was lying in my own room when I opened my eyes. And next to me was my mother with a glass of warm milk. According to my mother, Kento found me unconscious under a tree in the forest. I hadn't woken up yet. No matter how he shaked or called, seeing that, he had no alternative but to carry me home. I breathed a sigh of relief when I heard this. It was a nightmare to think about everything that happened yesterday. It made me feel better that I didn't get scolded by my mum because I had snuck out that night and took a day off from school. But just when I was leaning over, I felt like I had something in my pocket. When my hand reached out and I found a handkerchief, my face again darkened. Thinking about it, I jumped out of bed and ran into the village to find the madman. Perhaps about this nine-tailed fox, he would know something. But different from his usual appearance, when he saw the handkerchief, his whole body trembled full of fear. He only murmured in his mouth extremely strange words instead of answering my question. Demon, he's back! Then he told me to take the towel back to the mountain or a demon would come to the village. A thick black smoke came out of the prohibited mountain after I threw the towel back. After that, Kento always baited me because when I walked into that forbidden mountain, I was scared to death. However, I didn't care because I knew that there was a fox elf in that forest, that fearsome cannibal. Today, Mr. San went to pick up his nephew from the countryside. He just got a job at a horror comic company. Knowing that, San immediately wants to tell him a ghost story that happened 10 years ago 
with his two colleagues. Masa and Kosha were a young couple. Currently, they were both teachers at a high school. That day, they finished work later than usual because they had to attend an important school meeting. It was already dark when they left the office. Most of the people decided to stay in the school dormitory. Masa also asked her husband to stay. However, Kosho immediately disagreed. He said that they must go home to take care of their old mother. Masa really did not want to go home at night, but she had to follow her husband to the parking lot. There was a reason why Masa felt so wary about driving at night. Their home was not far away, but they also had to pass through a massive grave. This was the burial place for homeless people, so that was a terrifying thought. And there were also many mysterious rumors about this place. Riding through the streets in the suburbs, a cold feeling immediately came over them. Masa sat on the back of the bicycle, and the cold wind made her restless. Her heart started to beat faster and faster. The closer they got to the tombs, the more scared she felt. She thought about the rumors about the white shadows with bleeding eyes. Thinking about it, Masa suddenly shivered. She hugged Kosho unconsciously, and this gave him a fright. Kosho did not pay much attention to evil things. He thought she was just being silly, so he teased her. Kosho's teasing still didn't help. In order to ease her fear, she then closed her eyes and prayed. But when she closed her eyes, the feeling of fear grew even stronger. Masa felt like someone was watching her. Unable to take it anymore, Masa quickly opened her eyes. Then, she saw a white shadow flickering behind the bushes. Masa panicked. She closed her eyes again, and then opened them again. But still, she saw this white figure standing there. Then, the figure started running after them. But Masa stayed quiet, with no reaction. Still, staring in disbelief, the bike suddenly leaned to the side and crashed. They had hit something. Luckily, Masa quickly put both hands on the ground, so there was no serious injury. Then, Masa turned to look at her husband. But just from the shadow on his back, she could tell something was not right. Kosho lay motionless on the ground, as if nothing had happened. His face was dark. Worried for her husband, Masa stood up with both hands and went closer to observe, even more panicked. She had never seen Kosho look so silly. He was even drooling down the corner of his mouth. Her heart suddenly started to beat faster. She remembered the white shadow that she saw earlier. Maybe Kosho was possessed. Although her heart was filled with fear, she could not leave her husband behind. Then, Masa helped Kosho stand up and took him home. Masa didn't know why she felt so insecure when Kosho cycled in front, so she asked her husband to sit behind her. Unlike his usual personality, when Kosho heard that, he happily agreed and even urged his wife to quickly return home. More than anyone, Kosho knew that Masa was not good at cycling. But today, he agreed to let her drive. It was weird. As soon as they got home, Masa saw her mother-in-law waiting at the door. It seemed she had a feeling that something was not right. Seeing her mother-in-law and feeling overwhelmed the entire way, Masa cried loudly and told her what happened. After telling her she saw the white shadow and all about her husband's strange behavior, the mother's face immediately changed to a shade of pure white. As if she had just understood something, she did not say anything. She quietly just went inside to the altar to burn some incense. After she finished burning the incense, she approached her son. Her face and voice also changed. She was shouting at a stranger to get out of his body. Kosho immediately folded his arms admitting he was a lost spirit. So he entered Kosho's body to find something to eat. It seemed as if the mother had encountered something like this before. After talking to him, she immediately turned her head 
to tell her daughter-in-law to go prepare some food. Masa didn't understand what she was going on about, but quickly went to the kitchen to cook up a bowl of noodles. Just a few minutes later, the bowl of noodles was empty. It seemed that the soul had been starving for a long time. After eating one bowl, he asked for one more, promising after eating he would immediately leave. Seeing this, the old woman did not deny him another bowl of noodles and immediately sent her daughter-in-law to cook more. Just a few minutes later, the second bowl of noodles was brought out. The spirit quickly accepted it with a hungry face. Just like that, one, two, three, and six bowls of noodles were put away, but still couldn't fill his hungry stomach. Unable to take it any longer, the old woman shouted loudly. After she finished speaking, the spirit immediately sobbed, saying that he also wanted to go, but he could not. Seeing this, Masa approached and pleaded softly. The spirit did not want to hide anything and told the truth about his case. It turned out that the white shadow that Massa saw was another spirit, and because he was threatened by it, he tried to enter a human. In order to save her son, the old woman had to say that she would help him, but with the request that after being done, he must immediately set her son free. As the woman spoke those words, he had no reason to refuse. He immediately nodded and accepted the mother's request. Then. He said nothing. He silently turned his gaze towards the main gate as if to signal something. Seeing the actions of the soul, the mother immediately understood. She hurried to tell the daughter-in-law to watch the house and went out. A moment later, she saw her coming back inside with an old man. This man, Zen, had an extraordinary ability to defeat demons. After listening to everything, he looked very serious, holding out an incense burner in the middle of the yard. Then he burned a large bunch of incense and clasped his hands together. Once done with that, he turned back and told the mother and daughter to follow behind him and not say anything. Although they didn't know what he was planning to do, they were worried about Kosho. They then kept quiet and followed. After a while, Masa suddenly stopped and stared at the wall next to the entrance. She shouted, calling for her mother-in-law and Mr. Zen to come. It turned out that there was a human face on the wall looking at them. After observing carefully, Mr. Zen immediately told them to stand aside. Then he lifted the laser and pointed it straight towards the face of the demon. Mr. Zen lowered his voice. He began to mutter a strange spell. Unexpectedly, that face gradually faded and disappeared into the nothingness. Finally, it seemed like everything settled down. But the mother was still concerned that the hungry ghost might be tricking them. She asked Mr. Zen to talk to him. Mr. Zen went straight towards Kosho's body, telling him that he had banished that soul forever and that now he was able to go. Not only that, he also added that if he had any further requests, he will happily respond. The soul immediately sighed and replied, He's always starving. He had no worshipper. He just wanted to be full. Hearing that, the mother interjected, promising to prepare delicious food and wine every day. The kindness of the old mother and that of Mr. Zen left no reason for the soul to stay anymore. After thanking them, he disappeared. Kosho violently convulsed, then passed out. Kosho had been unconscious for two days. When he woke up, he couldn't remember what had happened to him. He only felt severe pain through his head. His stomach was very uncomfortable, as if he had just eaten three days worth of food. That year the drought was severe, so the place where I lived had lost the crop. 
Our family has moved to another place to live, hoping for it to be better. This is an old house, consisting of many rooms, all built in architecture. It looks slightly dusty and messy, but better than nothing. My father said to clean. The whole family can live here too because this is the house of a deceased friend left for his father. So the whole family cleaned up. More than half finished, the house was also a lot tidier. That night, the three of us slept together. My older sister was about 15 years old at that time, and I was my second sister. At that time, I was only 10 years old. Behind me was T, 6 years old. But for some reason, I was struggling and unable to sleep. I felt a sense of insecurity from the next room. The room is ancient. My family is not using it, so I haven't cleaned it up yet. That word kept emitting a creepy feeling. Losing sleep for a long time, I also gradually fell asleep. But not yet profound, I heard chuckles emanating from that room. Laughter growing louder. The door slowly opened. I began to panic, but still tried to stay silent in bed. And then, out of the room, suddenly came out two girls, white faces, white eyes, and a strange smile. What scared me the most was that their feet weren't touching the ground. They were floating with red shoes. I panicked, but still tried to close my eyes and pretend I was sleeping as they slowly approached my mirror. I felt cold, and their gaze were on my three sisters. I don't know what they're going to do to us. I just laid there without moving. They kept whispering and smiling horribly. It seemed like they were choosing something. I was too young to notice the problem. In the end, it seemed like they chose me. I could feel a terrible cold hand touching my body. I tried to open my eyes slowly to look at the two sleeping next to me, hoping they would wake up to save me. But they were almost in a deep sleep, not knowing what I was facing. I glanced at them, but what I saw was genuinely awful. They're just two dry bones with old clothes. They were standing right behind me and seemingly tried to pull me somewhere. I was so scared, I hurriedly pulled the covers over my body and then fell asleep without realizing it. In the morning, everything was still as usual. But I still do not dare to open the blanket. After a while, little Lily woke me up when she saw that I wouldn't wake up. I quickly woke up, got out of my bed and blanket and shouted about the two women who came out from that room last night. But my older sister may not believe what I said. She thought it was because I had a nightmare. No matter how I clung and cried, my sisters still doubted and didn't believe what I said. I recounted everything I experienced last night to her and hoped Nisan will come and take a look inside that room with a frightened expression. After hearing my mourning, Nisan reluctantly walked over to the room to examine the interior to reassure me that there was nothing inside. And indeed, Nisan opened the door of the room so I could come and see inside. Even though I was still terrified, I still walked over to her hands clasping on Nissan and looking around inside the room. This is an old room, messy and thick. As my older sister said, there's no one inside. Maybe I'm dreaming. Because he waited for us for so long, my dad came in and saw three sisters standing in front of the other room door. So he urged us to come out for breakfast and asked what was going on. The older sister told him what I told her, and also told my dad that we went to see the room, but it's completely normal with no one inside. After hearing that, my father scolded us because just because of a stupid dream and not going to breakfast, my parents had to go to the fields to work. After breakfast, my second sister and my parents went to the field to harvest potatoes. Baby Lily is young, so she cannot accompany us. But since this is a peaceful countryside, we were not afraid for Lily. After a while, rain started pouring down. 
We also drove the baskets of potatoes home. The cart got a lot heavier because this year the potatoes had a good harvest. We help each other, carry each basket of potatoes into the house. This year we'll make a lot of money. I also gradually forgot about yesterday's horror. The rain was getting heavier and heavier, so we quickly loaded the potatoes inside. Otherwise, they would be waterlogged. As soon as we opened the door and looked into the house, we saw little Lily playing in the yard, seemingly very happy. My mother was worried because of the heavy rain that little Lily could still play in front of the yard, but refused to go to the house to shelter from the rain. My mother was afraid she would fall sick. But little Lily seemed highly excited and told her mother that she was enjoying herself with her beautiful sisters. In response to my mother's question, I gradually realized what was unusual, and it seemed what little Lily said was true. There were lots of shoe marks on the ground. She was playing with someone in the yard of the house. That night, out of panic about the night before, I asked to let me sleep with my parents. Even though nothing strange had happened all night, I was apprehensive about some nervous feeling that I could not sleep. The following day, as well as every day, the whole family sat together for breakfast. But Lily didn't eat anything, even when my parents told her to. My parents asked that little Lily said that she would be taken away to eat well by some beautiful sisters. The carefree words of a child did not make my parents too concerned. That day we also needed to go to the fields. As usual, my mother was afraid that a stranger would come to seduce Lily, so she told her not to open the door for anyone to come in. At that time I was a child, so I didn't know what happened. I just felt a little insecure. So I asked my mother to bring Lily along with me that day. But my father seemed annoyed by it because little Lily often ran and jumped. It would take time to watch. The whole family would not be able to concentrate on farming. Everyone in the family was afraid of my father. So according to my father's instructions, it would not be a problem to lock the door carefully. My mother also thought so, so she obeyed my father. I'm alone in discomfort, but I'm too young to give my opinion. Before the door closed, I still remember clearly now, her white face, dark eyes and strange smile of Lily. She looked at me like a farewell. After that we got into the familiar cart and left the house. After the field work, we could not see Lily playing in the yard anymore. When we came back home, it was strange that my mother called Lily repeatedly. After entering the house to search, my mother frantically ran out to inform everyone. The whole family was shocked. We split up to look for Lily. The older sister and I were worried about her. We ran around the village to see if anyone knew anything. My father entered the other strange room to search for her. And I was hoping that Lily was just playing hide and seek. But to our dread, little Lily was truly missing. After that we stayed for a bit longer, then eventually decided to leave the heartbreaking place and move to a neighboring village. Years later when I was much older, I heard that people came to clean and break the house down for farmland. Suddenly while breaking down the fence, they accidentally bumped into something that seemed hard below the ground, so they decided to dig down to take a look below. After a while of digging, they discovered a big wooden coffin, which surprised everyone because ordinary coffins could not be that big. They opened the lid of the coffin to examine the interior and took the remains of the deceased so they could be buried somewhere else. All this so that the dead would have a proper place to rest. The coffin was indeed huge, holding at least three to four people. They also worked very hard to be able to open the lid to close the inside. But what was inside surprised them, and the story spread everywhere which led my family to learn the reason why little Lily disappeared so mysteriously. Inside the coffin were the corpses of two women and a child. They were placed very neatly inside of it, and just like the workers described, 
there was a little baby girl who fitted the exact same description as Lily. The two women had turned to white bones, but the child looked like she had died recently. At that time, as I was older, I could speak my mind and realized Lily should have never been the one to get caught because the one who should have gotten caught should have been me. Two years ago, for the convenience of work, I moved to live in an apartment near my company. That afternoon, after coming home from work, I sat on the living room sofa and watched TV, as usual. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. At that moment, I thought I heard wrong, or the people outside knocked on the wrong house, because I did not know anyone in this apartment complex. But then the knock on the door continued. The outsiders claimed they were the police. I was very confused. Why are the police looking for me? When I opened the door, it was true. There were two policemen standing in front of me. They said they wanted to get some information from me to assist with an investigation. Although I was surprised, I quickly regained my composure and agreed to the police's suggestion. Very quickly, the policeman pulled out a photo of this woman from his pocket. He asked if I had met this person. The woman in the photo also lived in this apartment and has been missing for many days. I told them I didn't know the woman. Then they told me the woman in the picture was missing. After that, they greeted me and continued to knock on each door to ask about the whereabouts of this woman. The police did not specify why she went missing and how long she had been missing for, but I didn't care much about this either. A few days later, I seemed to have forgotten this, until one night. That night, with overtime, I came home late and was about to get into the shower. It was 11pm. I know that taking a bath at night is not good, but if I don't take a bath, I can't sleep. This time of night is the most relaxing time for me. I let my hair down freely and bent over to wash it. The strands of hair flutter in front of my eyes, but enough for me to see the void ahead through my hair. And then suddenly, I saw a pair of bare feet standing in front of me. I am sure my heart stopped beating for a moment. Feeling scared, I immediately raised my head. I reached to close the running tap. Every hair on my body was standing up. Looking around once more, I gradually calmed down. I thought maybe I was seeing things. It was just an illusion. But then, a thought flashed in my mind. I gradually felt the surrounding air become dense and colder. To prove that what I was thinking was just bullshit, I decided to try it again. I slowly lowered my head and glanced over the hairs in front of me. This time, no longer barefoot, standing in front of me was a woman with shoulder-length hair and her hands hanging down. I panicked and shouted, then fell on the floor. The woman disappeared once again. I reached out for the towel and hurried to cover myself, then ran out of the bathroom fast. Until I lay on the bed, I was still trembling. That night, I couldn't sleep because I was still so scared. After that night, I no longer dared to bathe at home. I have a colleague who was single and she was very happy to help me with this. The strange thing was that while at her house, nothing happened to me. My colleague assured me that it was just the new apartment that made me feel this way. I also hoped that everything would be fine. After spending a few days with my colleagues settling down and feeling my mood regain balance, I returned home. At home, I rarely cook, but I had a habit of boiling water for myself with an electric kettle to drink, rather than ordering the water available in the apartment. Every night, before going to bed, 
I had a habit of drinking a glass of warm water. This made it easier for me to fall asleep. Indeed, after drinking water, I lay in bed and tried to fall asleep. But for a long while, I felt the air around me was extremely cold. The cold and floating feeling made me feel like I was being immersed in water. Suddenly, I felt short of breath and my chest felt heavy. Then, I saw a floating object in front of me. I was speechless, unable to realize what it was. As my eyes gradually adjusted, I realized it was the figure of the woman with long, loose hair. The woman was moving closer and closer to me. Right now, I couldn't help but just stare at her with wide eyes. As her face approached me, the feeling of fear grew larger. It was a swollen and slimy face, like a corpse that had been soaked in water for a long time. The patches of skin on her body peeling off and fell into the water disgustingly. The person moved closer, almost on top of me. I was too scared that my hands and feet were stiff, unable to move. I just gasped and stared forward. I shouted out in fear, giving all my strength to try and get out of the situation. When I sat up in the bed, I realized it was just a dream. Even so, until a while later, I still felt terrified, wondering who she was. Why did I see that woman so often? The nightmare made me so anxious the next morning, I dragged my heavy footsteps out of the house warily. Missing notices are posted everywhere in the apartment corridors and staircases. It was an image of a lost woman. I suddenly realized something. How did that monstrous spirit resemble her so much? As I was thinking this, I was about to raise my hand to take a photo to get a closer look, but I suddenly felt scared. Really not wanting to believe it was true, I tried to flip through it to stop thinking about it. When I stepped out of the gate of the apartment building, I saw a group of old women gathered and gossiping. I'd never communicated with them and neither did they. But it was strange, and when they saw me passing by, a woman took the initiative to call me back. She asked me if there were any strange smells in the drinking water, like a dead mouse. She then asked if I had sleep paralysis lately, or had dreamed of ghosts. Another woman also mentioned the woman who had been missing for many days, all of them seeing her ghost. I was startled to react at this time. It turned out that I was not alone with this problem, and all of these people were like me. All of them doubted that the polluted water had anything to do with her. They must report this to the police. A few hours later, the police arrived. Everyone living in the apartment building was making a fuss. The police were now checking the water tank on the top floor of the apartment building. Something must have happened with the communal pool on the rooftop, for sure. That explains the problems they'd had recently as well as the stench from the water. After watching the police pick up a body, everyone became extremely scared. After bringing a swollen, rotten body out of the water tank, they continued to use a fishing racket to remove something from the inside. It was scary, because the victim's whole body was decomposed in the water tank. What the police picked up might be the fat and rotting meat. When the police took the body out of the apartment building, Everyone could smell a terrible stench that followed. The police also arrested the missing girl's husband and escorted him to the station. A few days later, the case was made public in the newspapers. The real killer was the husband of the missing girl. He killed her and threw her body in the pool terrace on the roof of the building. After everything was cleared up, I was sick for a long time. Every time I think about drinking dead body water, I feel very nauseous. The 
story I'm about to tell happened to a young couple who had just moved into an old, cheap apartment in the city to start a new life. Ever since they moved into this new apartment, Umi was having the same nightmare every night. Higo was a hard-working man. He usually worked until 1-2 a.m. as he needed extra income to support his home. One night, as usual, Umi was having nightmares. She woke up in the middle of the night, screaming and panicking. Higo heard the screams and worried. He hurriedly left his work and ran to Umi. He could tell it must have been a terrible nightmare from the sweat rolling down her face. This happened a few more times until Umi decided to go to the hospital to get examined. But the doctors were unable to determine the cause of the nightmares. Higo had started to become anxious and stressed because of his wife's suffering. He needed to know what the nightmares were about. Seeing her husband distressed, Umi took a sip of water, regained her composure and began to talk. She went on to tell him she had dreamed that she was lost in a country. In that country, she met two people. The first one was a woman who looked a little over 40 years old. And the second person was a kid, about six or seven years old. They both had gloomy faces. She proceeded to tell him that she approached them regardless. It was in her nature to help, even in her dreams. The woman, crying, told Umi that she had been kicked out and chased away from their home by her husband's family. Umi's expression immediately changed. She was angry and upset. Before she could ask the reason, she heard footsteps coming from behind. Umi saw the mother and her child turn pale. The mother quickly grabbed her child and ran away. Before disappearing into the distance, the mother looked back at Umi with a desperate expression on her face. Umi was confused. She couldn't see them anymore and just as she tried to take a step, a group of people walked past her and in the dim light she saw their horrible faces. They were pale, with a skin filled with blisters and sores and maggots coming out of them, just like zombies. Her voice cracked and then stopped. Her husband stood there, feeling helpless and impotent. Umi had always been a delicate and sensitive person. Deep down inside, she knew this was not an ordinary nightmare. But because she had her husband to reassure her, she dismissed them and managed to find comfort. The next morning, Higo resigned from his job. He went out and bought some cakes and then went to see a friend of his who was a psychiatrist. When he arrived, Higo told the whole story to his friend. His friend listened in silence. After he finished talking, his friend seemed surprised. He knew there was more to the story. Despite him being a doctor, he had a hunch that what was happening had a supernatural underlying. Perhaps an omen from the underworld. These were just speculations from the doctor, but Higo was desperate to believe anything, and so he asked his friend for a solution. The psychiatrist pushed his glasses back in place and suggested they should both go to the place she saw in her dream. And so they did. Higo and his wife booked the first train to the countryside, to the place she had seen in her dreams. After traveling for two hours, they arrived in the countryside. They were lucky enough to meet a couple of friendly farmers who pointed them in the direction of the house from Umi's dreams. Once they arrived, they noticed how old the house was. Most of the paint on the door had peeled off. It looked like it had been abandoned for a year or two. The door was locked and the house seemed empty. Umi and Higo went back disappointed for not having found anything helpful, but still determined to solve the mystery. Higo kept on reassuring his wife that everything would be okay and that they would eventually figure it out. They were both walking home along the pier when suddenly Umi's eyes lit up. She had an idea. Umi suggested they should go talk to the neighbors to see what they could find out. Fortunately, the people in this place were welcoming and friendly so they took them into their home. Umi and Higo were offered some tea. They both sat down, a little more relaxed and glad to be around smiley faces. 
It did not take long until the neighbor told them to ask her what they had come there to ask. And so, Umi did not hesitate to ask about the mysterious house. As soon as the house was brought up, the neighbor's smiling faces suddenly changed. Noticing the change of expression, Umi and Higo guessed that it couldn't have been anything good. The kind neighbor hesitated at first, but after a moment of silence, she agreed to tell the whole story. She told them about the son from that family. Apparently, he was a womanizer who spent his days deceiving woman after woman. The son's name was Zen, and he, one day, broke up with a girl named Kara that he had been seeing when he found out she was pregnant. Desperate and heartbroken, Kara went to Zen's house, hoping that his parents would sympathize with her and talk some sense into their son. She was received with insults and curses. Zen's parents chased her away. Defeated and sad, she held her words back as tears poured down her eyes. But Zen's parents were unfazed. They pushed her and told her to leave. Thinking that there was just a misunderstanding, Kara tried to explain that the child in her womb was Zen's and asked them for support. But the more she talked, the angrier and more aggressive they became. They threatened her to leave, or else. Then, without a trace of shame, they pushed the pregnant woman out of the door. Despite receiving terrible curses and insults, Kara tried to stay strong. She had to be now. That night, Kara stood outside their house, banging and begging to Zen's parents for help. And yet, they did not care. To this day, the villagers remember vividly the cries of that woman. By midnight, the crying had stopped. Kara was exhausted. She left, walking disorientated. Kara walked for a while when it started to rain. The rain started to pour down hard. She had nowhere to stay and mad from the disappointment. She just kept on walking. She cried and cursed at the man that brought her such misfortune, but not without taking on the blame herself as well. How could she have been so naive to trust someone that much? Some say they saw her walk into the forest. For what reason? One can only guess. The next morning, the people from the village had gathered at the bottom of the cliff, Zen's parents included. That morning, someone had brought the news of a pregnant woman that was found dead by the cliff. To no one's surprise, it was Kara. She lay there, dead but with her eyes wide open and with an angry expression. The villagers didn't take long to come up with rumors about her death. And so, Zen's family buried her body deep into the forest and then fled from the countryside. Higo and Umi listened perplexed. What they had heard confirmed to them the cause of her nightmares. They said their goodbyes and went on to search for Kara's burial place. After a while of wandering in the forest, they stumbled upon a rising mass of ground. They figured this was the place, even if there wasn't a tombstone. The next day, the couple brought some monks to chant and bless the place to allow Kara to transcend to the next realm. They also carefully cleaned up the area and set up a tombstone for Kara. Once the rituals were completed, Higo and Umi felt at ease. They lingered for a while longer there taking their time to talk to Kara and her daughter, or at least what was left of them. After that day, Umi no longer had nightmares, but what transpired that one fine day never left her. This story is about a woman named Yi. After a divorce, she gained custody of her daughter, whose name was Nana. To start a new life, Yi moved into an old apartment building. For them, this was a new beginning, a new turning point in life. The new house was very warm inside, but still good enough. Nana seemed to be quite interested in this place as well. 
Yi thought that Nana would gradually get used to her new life here. While Yi was rearranging the furniture in the room, Nana surprisingly bought a doll for Yi to see. Nana found the doll under the bed in the bedroom. Yi thought that the previous owner had intentionally left the doll there, so she did not object to her daughter wanting to keep it. Nana was overjoyed because now she had a friend to play with. Because on Mondays Nana had to go to school, Yi had to coax her to go to bed early. Yi waited for her daughter to fall asleep before returning to her room and continuing to tidy up. Because Yi was afraid that her daughter would have trouble sleeping in a strange place, sometimes she silently went to her daughter's room to see if she was okay. Yi looked at her young daughter lovingly and then covered her daughter with a blanket. While covering her with the blanket, Yi coincidentally glanced at the doll beside Nana. When Yi looked down again, she saw the doll with wide eyes and a wide mouth staring at her, looking downright scary. Yi immediately picked up the doll to check it out and placed it in a corner. Now, she discovered the doll would close its eyes when it was sitting up and open its eyes when it was lying down. The following day when breakfast was ready, Yi called her daughter to the table. As soon as she walked to the door of Nana's room, Yi overheard two people talking to each other. Listening for a while, Yi clearly knew that one was her child Nana, but she didn't know who the other one was. There were only two of them in the house, which made Yi feel nervous. Yi quickly opened the door to the room but only saw her daughter talking to the doll. Seeing Yi, Nana eagerly introduced her new friend and told Yi that the doll could talk to anyone. Yi didn't know why her daughter said that. She didn't believe the doll could speak so she assumed her daughter had misheard or imagined this. When Yi thought about it, she suddenly saw the doll staring at her. Yi thought that she might have been under a lot of stress lately, so she quickly left the room to avoid affecting her daughter negatively. When it came to meals, her daughter even brought the doll with her and fed the doll as if taking care of a baby. After breakfast, Yi drove Nana to school and then returned back home. While busy arranging things, Yi suddenly heard the call, Mom? coming from Nana's bedroom. Yi was very confused when she heard someone call her because her daughter went to school and she was alone at home. Yi immediately opened the door to her daughter's room to see what was going on. When she looked into the room, Yi didn't see anyone else aside from the doll sitting on her daughter's bed. At this point, she still didn't believe the doll could talk. However, no matter how she looked at it, she still found this doll to be very out of the ordinary. Yi looked at the doll for a moment. The more she looked at the doll, the more strange and fearful she felt. It was a mother's premonition that made her feel insecure about the doll. When Yi went downstairs to buy some things, she conveniently threw the doll in a nearby trash can. Later, with Nana home, when she was calling her daughter out to eat dinner, Yi suddenly saw Nana sitting on the bed crying. Her daughter constantly and repeatedly were asking why Yi had abandoned her. Yi thought that maybe the daughter was missing her father, so she decided to approach and comfort Nana. At this moment, the little girl suddenly turned her head while shouting and blaming Yi for abandoning her. Nana's strange and angry expression made Yi feel terrified. Then, when Yi was about to comfort her daughter, Nana stood up from the bed and repeated her words. At this time, a scary thing happened. Yi suddenly discovered that Nana was almost floating above the bed, her feet not touching the bed. Although her daughter's expression scared Yi, she still managed to ask what had happened. 
before she could get close to Nana. Her daughter once again screamed loudly. Her appearance this time was very frightening. Her eyes were big, her face full of indignation. Nana's screams were so loud that Yi couldn't bear it without covering her ears. It was even more terrifying to witness a photo of them in a glass frame shatter from the sound. After Nana's screaming stopped, she collapsed on the bed before fainting. Yi appeared bewildered, immediately picking up her daughter while trying to wake her up. After a while, seeing that her daughter was awake, Yi did not dare to stay at home anymore and immediately took Nana to her parents' house. After listening to the strange things that had happened, Yi's parents immediately advised her to find an exorcist to solve it because they thought that the house might have been a haunted case. After all the strange things, Yi also felt the apartment was the problem. In order not to be disturbed by demons, Yi immediately followed her parents' advice and found an exorcist named Chu to help. Looking through the house, the exorcist could see that it had been vacant for a long time. As Yi heard this news from him, she immediately believed the cause because she was renting this house for a low price. If it weren't for it being close to her daughter's school, she wouldn't have rented it anyway. Mr. Chu said, This house is haunted. I can help you to solve this problem. Yi suddenly remembered the details of the doll and told the exorcist about it. However, he explained that the doll was just a vessel for the spirit or demon to live in. It was okay to throw it away, but the entity was still remaining within the house. Mr. Chu immediately showed Yi a solution about how to use firecrackers in every corner of the house. The loud explosion of firecrackers would alarm the children's soul and would drive the ghosts out of their house. Then, she should hang an extra bagu mirror on the doorframe to prevent ghosts and demons from entering. With no other choice, Yi immediately did everything that Mr. Chu told her to do. All of the mentioned methods worked surprisingly well. Nana finally returned to normal and stopped behaving strange, without even mentioning the doll anymore. The mother and daughter were able to go back to a normal life as before. Yi clearly felt the change in her daughter. Nana was much happier and even ate more food than before. Her happiest thought was seeing her daughter live safely. However, a scary truth still prevailed. After every meal, Nana would stealthily place food under the table. It seemed that this entity did not disappear. It was able to exist in the house without needing to be in the doll anymore. Nana happily told her mother that she had a new friend and she was no longer sad. The mother and daughter were not at all aware that for them, the real nightmare had just started. The story tells us about a guy named Lou. He was a construction worker who got married not too long ago. One day, while Lou was working at the construction site, he suddenly received a call. Picking up the phone urgently, the co-workers didn't know what Lou heard, but his face immediately changed. Not only that, but he also quit his job and ran away in panic. Certainly something bad had happened. Seeing Lou's reaction, his concerned colleague at the construction site was extremely worried for him. He promised to do the rest of Lou's work until he could return. 
The place where Liu rushed to was none other than the hospital. His wife Yin had a stroke because of overworking herself. Before Liu reached his wife, Yin already closed her eyes for the last time without any last words for or from him. Tears were rolling down his cheeks. For a while, Liu was able to calm down. He stopped crying for a while in order to comfort his parents-in-law, who were just as heartbroken as he was. They then had to call the funeral service to take his wife's body home. It was the most painful trip of Liu's life. Yin's body, after returning home two days later, was buried and a funeral was held. This loss was too great for Liu. Loving Liu's kindness and honesty, many villagers came to burn incense and share his sadness at the funeral. Since the day of his wife's death, Liu hasn't been able to get over his deep depression. He was only working at the construction site and hanging around his house all the time in repetition. One day, while he was sweeping his backyard, suddenly the neighbor's boy ran in with a shocked face. He brought Liu shocking news. He said Yin's grave has been dug up and her body has also mysteriously disappeared. The boy had not finished all the news when Liu's face immediately turned white. He threw the broom aside and ran off to see for himself. What the boy said was totally true. The mass of the top soil had been dug up by someone while the lid of the coffin has also been removed. Witnessing the scene in front of him, Liu's entire body became limp. He fell to his knees hopelessly and without strength. In his mind there was a mix of different emotions which were both painful and confusing. Seeing Liu's state the boy just looked on silently without uttering a sound, but still silently stood beside him to express his sympathy with Liu's loss. Besides worrying about Liu's feelings, People were also concerned about where Yin's body mysteriously disappeared to. The strange story quickly spread throughout the small village as the police also came to investigate the scene. At this time, Lu seemed to have calmed down. The policemen also began to collect the testimonies of onlookers. Not only the police, but all the villagers also gathered at Yin's grave. They all gossiped noisily about it. Amongst them, there was a very strange old woman talking out loud. Perhaps Yin was revived to live again and climbed out of her grave herself? The old woman's words immediately received the attention of everyone around. Everyone knew and argued what she said was nonsense and insensitive. However, some people supported the old woman and said that what she said could be a possibility. Another young man also expressed his strange views. He thought that perhaps he had died without a reason, so her soul was left restless and couldn't enter heaven. Multiple people came with different points of views and quarreled and debated without end. But who was right and who was wrong, nobody knew as it was all one big mystery. The investigation didn't seem to have any unusual factors or helpful leads, and the testimonies of people didn't help too much either. So the case went into deadlock. As one day, two days and a week have passed, Yin's body was not found yet, and Lu's mood had gotten worse. Thinking of his wife, he couldn't sleep, so he drank alcohol. He drank so much until he passed out. But his sleep only lasted a few minutes, since his body started making strange impulses and movements. Lu was dreaming of his wife. How strange! In this dream, she was wearing a white dress and wedding accessories. With a trembling voice, Yin kept calling for help. Without considering the reality of the matter, Lu rushed over to hug Yin without listening to the words she was saying. While he was running to her, Yin suddenly disappeared. Then, in a flash, she appeared behind him to Lu's surprise. When Lu even didn't understand what was going on, he heard a voice calling for help once again. After that, she turned away. Lu stood alone in the dark space to look for Yin. He called his wife's name hoarsely, but to no avail. When he woke up, 
Lou's mouth kept calling out his wife's name. He painfully realized that it was just a dream. Lou couldn't stop thinking about it though. He really couldn't remember what his wife said before leaving. With a confused mood, Lou went to the other village to visit a friend. This was his friend from the construction site. Lou didn't hide anything. He told his friend everything from the wife's missing body to the dream he had last night. Hearing Lou's story, his face immediately changed. He replied to Lou that maybe he developed mental health problems and thus started hallucinating. Lou felt his friend wasn't believed. The friend even concluded that Lou was not mentally healthy and therefore Lou was quite upset and responded a bit aggressively towards his friend. With a serious face and a sharp voice, Lou confirmed that his wife was definitely trying to tell him something. But no matter how serious Lou appeared to be, his friend could not believe such devilish stories. To help his friend overcome his sadness, he took Lou to go around the market. But it seemed that the bustle of the countryside market could not improve Lou's mood. After walking for a while, his friend suddenly stopped. He looked so surprised. He saw a wedding clothing stall. He couldn't imagine that wedding dresses could even be sold at this market. Because of the friend's interest, he asked Lou to take a look at the stall. Because of the enthusiasm of the friend, Lou agreed to have a look. Then, as soon as he took a glance at something, his face immediately changed. Inside the clothing stall, there was an outfit that looked exactly the same as the one Yin wore in his dream last night. Of course, Lu couldn't just leave. He rushed inside to ask the seller about it. He pointed at the outfit and asked her, Excuse me, has anyone bought this outfit in recent days? She answered that this was the newest outfit in the store, and the first one was sold on the same date that Yin's body disappeared. She added that the person who bought it was the man who had just left her stall. He also bought hair clips. Saying nothing, Lou immediately chased after the man despite the advice to stop from his friend. Although everything was still not really clear, Lou also had a hunch that he would find his wife's body. Because the friend couldn't leave Lou alone, he also followed shortly behind Lou. The longer they followed the man, the more they felt like there was something odd about him, as the man showed unusual behavior which made him seem psychopathic by nature. After a long time following the strange man, they stopped in front of a house. Despite being a bit hesitant, they finally decided to open the gate and go inside the house. It was a big house like no other normal ones. They took notice of the Chinese symbol word for happy on the door. Lu didn't want to leave. The friend kept trying to convince Lu to leave because it was very embarrassing and impolite to break in someone's house without permission. But no matter what the friend said, Lu insisted on his intentions and walked silently over to the window and looked inside. Moments later, his face looked extremely angry. Lou kicked the door very hard. The friend who was discouraging Lou could not utter a word when the door opened. The scene in front of them was really terrible. The body in wedding clothes lying on the bed was Yin's, and the psychopath appearing to be a necrophiliac who was guilty of removing Yin's body was standing right there. After witnessing the scene, Lou immediately leaped towards the psychopath to beat him up, which he did. After all that transpired, the culprit was apprehended and arrested, all thanks to the strange dream Lou had. It would seem that Yin's soul indeed communicated with him in his dreams. Yin's body was returned to its resting place, but the pain in Lou's heart still wouldn't fade away easily. This story is about Jiro's family, who just moved into a new house. 
The couple also had a lovely and obedient little daughter named Anna. While her mother was busy moving stuff, little Anna enjoyed jumping and running around. Then she opened the window to see what was outside. It seemed that the scenery outside did not disappoint Anna. A cool and gentle breeze blew in. It excited her, so she called her mother. Hearing her call, Yuki ran to her. The scenery behind was beautiful, just like what the family desired for so long. The pond behind the house refreshed the air. Jiro's family even planned to breed some fish in that pond. However, Anna was curious and asked her mother why no creature existed in that pond. Yuki couldn't really explain. She pulled Anna inside to help tidy things up in time for dinner. But it didn't stop there. An incident happened to their family on the first night in their new home. At midnight, Anna started twitching. She had a pale face and was sweating profusely. The little girl suddenly had a high fever. Seeing Anna's appearance, Yuri was extremely worried. Anna's condition became worse and worse. She began to tremble and breathe strenuously. Seeing this, Jiro and Yuri hurried to get a thick blanket to cover her body, but it didn't get any better. Yuri was so worried that she could not sit still. Looking at her child with such a high fever, it creeped her out. Suddenly, Anna woke up, but her condition was still very bad. Not only that, she also seemed very panicked. Anna, after waking up, got into Yuri's lap and hugged her tight. Her small arms clutched her mother's shoulders fearfully. After a while, when she was more settled, Anna stammered out a few words. But Yuri didn't really know what her fear was. She then gently reassured her child's safety. The little girl was in her mother's arms, taking a deep breath and then pointed at the wall. According to Anna, she saw a man and a woman standing just next to the closet. Their faces were swollen and disfigured, as if they had been immersed in water for a long time. Their looks were terrifying. Jiro and Yuri looked towards the closet, but did not see a single figure. Anna was hallucinating, wasn't she? Although they could not see anything, both Jiro and his wife had a bad feeling about this. Feeling like something was wrong, Jiro then told his wife to take care of his daughter and he would go outside to get something. After saying this, Jiro rushed outside with some kind of plan. Just a few minutes later, he came back and in his hand was a large knife and a wooden cutting board. According to Jiro, when he was a child in the neighborhood, there were many children like Anna, who always said that they could see ghosts. And the grandparents would use a large knife and a cutting board to make noise. This would drive away those souls every time. While making noise, Jiro also shouted loudly, asking the ghosts to leave his house and let go of their daughter. Yuri watched her husband's actions, hoping everything would be fine. Thinking that this new house had a problem, the next morning Yuri called her mother to help. Anna's grandmother saw her current condition and was also very surprised. However, before coming here, she also invited a feng shui master to help. The feng shui master looked around the house. He said the house currently had a strong miasmatic atmosphere and that the lake behind the house was the most serious problem. Anna's grandmother also told him in more detail about the two ghosts that Anna saw last night. Listening to the appearance of the ghosts soaked in water, his gut told him to ask everyone to go to the back of the lake. Arriving at the lake, they did not see what the master was looking at, but his face immediately went sharp, frowning and looking panicked. It seemed like he saw what Anna saw last night. On the pond surface now floated two extremely scary ghosts. 
Because he was used to seeing ghosts, the feng shui master could still remain calm. He just slowly turned his back and walked like nothing happened. Anna's grandma and Yuri saw the expression of the master and were very curious. But when they tried to ask, he just kept silent and said nothing. After coming back in the house, the master still refused to say a word, only carefully inspecting the wall next to the closet. Even the mold on the wall was very carefully examined by him. Jiro and Yuri also saw these stains when they moved in. Finally, after a long silence, the master said that he saw a man and a woman above the lake earlier. After listening, Yuri and her mother-in-law immediately panicked. They did not expect that about the water pond in the backyard. Also, they did not expect their long-time dream home to have such a terrifying secret. Not only did the two souls still live there, but they also wanted a child. And Anna was the one that the other two spirits were aiming for. According to the master, the only way to now help Anna is to get out of their sight. He advised them to make a paper dummy to deceive the two spirits. That night, following his instructions, Yuri bought a dummy that looked exactly like her daughter to the edge of the pond. First, she burned some votive papers. She silently pleaded to beg the two souls to liberate and spare her family. When the flame got bigger, Yuri threw the prepared paper dummy in. Then she began to beg, hoping that the two spirits would accept the child she had sent to them and let go of Anna. Yuri's request just stopped. The fire instantly grew louder, burning the dummy. It seemed the devotion of the mother had been accepted by the two souls. After doing exactly what the feng shui master told her, Yuri got up and went back to the house. The fire was still burning, but it was getting smaller. Beside the fire was water, and it suddenly moved in a vortex that grew bigger and bigger. Yuri could hear the water, but she just glanced without daring to turn back. On the pond surface were the two spirits. They were holding the hand of a little girl and walking away. In front of the window where the pond can be seen, now stood a mirror. And because of the mirror, Anna had not seen the two spirits again. A few days later, after hearing the news about Yuri's family, all the neighbors came over to visit. Just like what the feng shui master said, the two souls were a couple, but their families forbade they be together. So they committed suicide. There were many people who moved in here, but all of them had to move out within three days because of their harassment. To be sure, Yuri sewed a curtain placed in the window where the pond could be seen. And since then, nothing weird happened to their family anymore. This terrifying story happened to a man named Goro. Goro hurriedly arranged work that day because he needed to get home quickly to take his mother to surgery for a tumor. Because it was the last flight of the day, Goro arrived late and the airport was also less crowded than usual. Nonetheless, there were many decoys competing to sell black market tickets. They sold everything from hotel rooms to bus tickets. Because it was dark and there were no taxi in the countryside, he randomly chose a decoy to take a bus home. The bus owner who had just met him was rambling and advertising a service, which was to bring guests door to door and drive extremely safe. Based on Goro's observations, it was a seven seat bus that was a little old but still comfortable and clean. However, the car would not leave right away because two passengers were still missing. Everyone was nervous because it was late at night, but the driver didn't seem to mind. He still calmly enticed a few more guests. After half an hour, 
Goro couldn't take it any longer and howled angrily for the driver to leave. Following Goro, all of the passengers expressed their dissatisfaction. The driver had no choice but to get into the bus and start the engine. It was a long distance from the airport to Goro's house. It could take more than two hours if you drive at an average speed. While Goro was sleeping, the bus abruptly came to a halt and his head was smacked on the front seat in inertia. Not only him, but also the other passengers were irritated by his driving style. Strangely, the bus was in the middle of the road with no obstacles around. Why did the driver stop so suddenly? In this situation, the driver was confused too, but still reassured the passengers that the bus was okay. But after a while, he returned and asked everyone to assist him in pushing the bus. Despite his distress and desire to return home as soon as possible, Garo and another young man exited the bus. Fortunately, the bus was not badly damaged. The engine started after the two young men pushed for a few moments. Garo and the young man were able to return to their seats as well. What irritated Garo the most was that the driver didn't even say a word of thanks. The bus continued to move, but the atmosphere had changed slightly. Goro took a look at the back seat and noticed a strange man. According to his memory, there were only four passengers on the bus when he left the airport, with only one in the back row. So when did the man board the bus? Anyways, Goro did not doubt or be curious because he believed that the driver had picked up more passengers while he was pushing the bus. Then he slept again to regain his strength secretly hoping that nothing bad would happen the rest of the way. In contrary of what Goro had expected, the bus had only been on the road for 15 minutes before abruptly stopping, causing his head to collide with the front seat again. The driver was in panic. Goro and everyone else on the bus had no idea what was going on. It turned out that right in front of the bus, there were two people standing across the road. Through the lights, both of them looked quite monstrous in black clothes with dark faces. At the same time, the man sitting behind Goro had a strange expression on his face. For some reason, he shrank back as soon as he saw the other two men. His entire body began to tremble. Despite the driver's stop, one of the two men approached the bus and opened the door. Seeing their appearances, all of the passengers in the car were terrified, but no one dared to say anything. Could they be road robbers? Following the over two meter tall guy was a guy with an extremely bulky body who appeared to be as frightening as the other guy. But they did nothing, neither threatened nor robbed. But all they did was walk to the last row of seats, grab the collar of the man sitting behind Goro and drag them away. Goro happened to glance at him as he passed by, but the tall guy's gloomy thin face and soulless eyes scared him to death. The two strangers kept escorting that little man away. They looked very monstrous. Then they disappeared at the end of the road. When their figures were gone, everyone breathed a sigh of relief, but they all didn't know who they were and when did the other man get in the bus. The driver insisted that he would never let anyone into the bus again on the way from the airport to here. Even the young man in the back seat was surprised when the man in the seat next to him appeared. The driver suspected that these men were creditors and just wanted to arrest him. Despite the fact that it was a little confusing because of what had just happened, the driver had to let the bus continue because it was already dark. It was a good thing they weren't street bandits because it could have been very dangerous. Goro on the other hand couldn't stop thinking about that man. He kept his gaze fixed on the window for the rest of the journey. He was perplexed as to why the three of them and him were on the same road. There was no other path here and they were even walking but he hadn't seen them again. Assuming the trouble would end there but after a few more miles, the driver abruptly slowed down. It turned out to be an accident ahead. A wrecked car and a large truck faced each other. This appeared to be a serious accident. At this point, the passenger bus could no longer move and had to come to a halt. The passengers on the bus had heard about an accident ahead 
and were immediately agitated. It appeared that these two cars collided very hard due to being out of sight. If so, the people in the cars would have been seriously injured. Garo immediately glanced at the car and only a few seconds later his face turned pale. The person inside the car was none other than the man who had previously sat behind him. Despite being scratched and partially covered in bloodstains, the face was unmistakable. That was the man who was kidnapped by those two strange men. Garo's limbs seemed to soften as he sat on the chair without saying anything while everyone else was talking. It turned out that the person sitting behind Garo was a ghost who had recently died, and the other two were underworld henchmen who specialize in capturing souls and transporting them to hell. Garo had heard many stories about emissaries, one of which was white impermanent with a long tongue and the other was black impermanent with a chain in his hands. As usual, Captain Chow and Boss Lu Feng discussed the cases at the 703 branch that morning. Captain Chow was informed by Boss Lu Feng of the recent crop situation in the area and the fruit was always stolen or damaged. Boss Lu Feng was concerned that there were specialized thieves in the city. Captain Chow had also heard the news and intended to investigate on his own. Boss Lu Feng and Captain Chao were still discussing which case should be handled first, as there have been a number of strange incidents in the city recently. However, before they could have a long discussion, they heard from afar that their subordinates were rushing to report. The boss, Lu Feng, inquired what had occurred and why the subordinates were so concerned. However, the subordinate just stated that it was preferable for Boss Lu Feng to hear from the victim because this was a strange story. Boss Lu Feng directed that the victim was allowed into his room, that hot tea was prepared to calm the victim and that he would be present. The victim was a middle-aged man who appeared terrified and panicked. The man was now calm and told his boss Lu Feng everything that had happened the day before. The man said that he and his two friends went to the forest on the mountain yesterday morning to gather medicine because it was rumored that deep within the mountain was a very rare medicinal herb. The three departed early in the morning with great enthusiasm. The man believed that with their many years of jungle experience, they would quickly find valuable medicinal plants. They went to the forest for a moment but the large and dense forest ahead piqued their interest. As they stood on the cliff, looked down at the forest, they all thought that this trip would require them to spend the night in the forest. One of the group members appeared concerned, claiming that there were rumors of wild animals in the forest. But the man remained adamant, claiming that he had experience with the jungle and would lead everyone. So they kept walking, and after many hours of walking through the deep forest, they had to climb over steep rocky cliffs. The road was extremely difficult. As you climb higher, the fog became denser. They eventually arrived at the forest which was rumored to precious medicinal plants. In front of them was a large forest with very large trees that appeared to have lived for many years. As they walked through the overgrown grass, luck smiled on them. Rare medicinal plants appeared in front of them. They were overjoyed and were discussing how to bring it home to grow so that they could have more trees. A strange sound was heard in the distance deep within the forest. All three people were thinking, not knowing if it was a wild animal or what, but they were also calm because of their experience in the jungle. But all their calm and fortitude vanished in an instant when they realized the creature in front of them was not what they thought. They panicked and trembled because there was a dragon in front of their eyes. It was unbelievable to make sense of this. 
it flew towards them, causing them to panic and flee, abandoning the medicinal plant, but they were unable to keep up with its excessive speed. These two friends were too terrified to run. They just stood there with their hands over their heads. But it was this that caused them harm. The dragon swung its tail, tightened its grip on one of them which forced the others to climb. When viewed from above, the dragon appeared both majestic and terrifying. Like a god, it hovered and curled up in the sky. After only a few minutes, their friends stopped hearing the sound and dropped down from above the remnants of his shirt. They were terrified and scared. It was as if it was a warning to them that if they bothered it, they would die. The shirt was torn, bitten and stained with the friend's blood and flesh. They immediately ran away from the forest to the side of the cliff. But it did not give them a chance to survive. With just one kick, they fell off the cliff. Another friend died after hitting his head on a rock and dying on the spot. Only the last man escaped death and came to the investigation team to report. He cried because he was still terrified. After hearing the victim's story clearly, Captain Chao was immediately ordered by boss Liu Feng to accompany him to the mountain area to investigate everything. In a short time, the squad led by boss Liu Feng left near the murder scene. Along the way, Captain Chao wondered whether dragons existed or not, and why there was such a strange case. Boss Liu Feng was a person with a lot of experience. He didn't confirm the existence of dragons in this world, but strange things happened every day in this world. According to the victim's story, the investigation team arrived at the scene quickly with modern facilities and specialized equipment. Boss Liu Feng ordered everyone to take a few steps forward in the review, but with extreme caution. After looking around for a while, the team found no unusual clues. Captain Chao and his boss also readied their guns and entered the murky forest. A shrill hiss rang out from the deep forest, getting closer and louder. They took a defensive stance and prepared to fight because they didn't know what kind of animal it was. From a distance, suddenly something strange beyond imagination appeared, surprising the team as they immediately attacked it with guns. Both Captain Chao and boss Lu Feng were so surprised they couldn't believe their eyes. In front of them was indeed a dragon. It was large, hovering in the sky and extremely ferocious. The whole squad joined forces to attack, firing many shots at it continuously, but it was not injured at all. It began to swoop low, move towards the ambush team. Its body was made of sharp iron blades and it only needed to fly past the police officers' bodies. Before it could react, the flesh was shattered and the blood began to flow uncontrollably. <laughs> Boss Liu Feng directed the injured policeman to move back in order to stop the bleeding. He appeared to have discovered something strange for a brief moment. There were numerous grasshoppers with large sizes and unusual colors on the ground. Finally, he almost discovered the mystery of this ferocious dragon. He shouted loudly to get everyone prepared to fight it. He quickly ordered Captain Chao to change his fighting style because he realized why guns couldn't hurt it. He quickly pulled out a flamethrower, seemed very certain of his thoughts. Because the entire squad only had a few flamethrowers, everyone was focused on fighting it. And as Boss Liu Feng had predicted, the flamethrower worked. Its body started to burn. Strangely, all bullets couldn't hurt it, but just a small amount of fire could cause it to burn, just like that. It fled into the forest, but its body was falling apart one by one. We were still unsure what kind of creature it was. The entire squad couldn't hide their puzzlement. There were too many confusing and strange things in this case. Finally, the dragon vanished in the air, and every piece of it fell to the ground, bloodless and fleshless. Boss Liu Feng was still skeptical of his thoughts, whether correct or incorrect. 
before they could state their guesses clearly to Captain Chow. A swarm of burnt locusts descended from the sky in front of their eyes. Those locusts must have fallen from the dragon, or there would have been no dragon at all. When they looked closer, they noticed that these grasshoppers were huge, each larger than a human hand with strange colors and sharp serrated legs. Having witnessed everything, Boss Lu Feng confirmed all of his speculations. He ordered that the area be sealed off and no one be allowed to enter because no one knows if there was anything more dangerous than this dragon. They returned to the branch after completing the task to summarize everything. According to forensic testing, the herb had the ability to mutate insects, made them larger and smarter. As a result, the insects in that forest most likely ate that herb. Captain Chow was astounded when he saw the dragon made of grasshoppers, so he ordered the return of that valuable plant because he didn't want other insects to mutate in the same way. Captain Chow's decisions have pleased Captain Liu Feng. He believed that everything should be resolved at the source, rather than leaving consequences to be dealt with later. And the dragon murder case was finally closed.